Volume 1, Chapter 19 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 19 The Fawn's Transformation. The door of the courtyard swung slowly and closed itself of its own accord. Mariam and Donatello were now alone there. She clasped her hands and looked wildly at the young man, whose form seemed to have dilated and whose eyes blazed with the fierce energy that had suddenly inspired him. It had kindled him into a man. It had developed within him an intelligence which was no native characteristic of the Donatello whom we had heretofore known but that simple and joyous creature was gone for ever what have you done said miriam in a horror-stricken whisper the glow of rage was still lurid on donatello's face and now flashed out again from his eyes i did what ought to be done to a traitor he replied i did what your eyes bade me to do when i asked them with mine as i held the wretch over the precipice these last words struck miriam like a bullet could it be so had her eyes provoked or assented to this deed she had not known it but alas looking back into the frenzy and turmoil of the scene just acted she could not deny she was not sure whether it might be so or no what a wild joy had flamed up in her heart when she beheld her persecutor in his mortal peril was it horror or ecstasy or both in one be the emotion what it might it had blazed up more madly when donatello flung his victim off the cliff and more and more while a shriek went quivering downward with a dead thump upon the stones below had come an unutterable horror and my eyes bade you to do it she repeated they both leaned over the parapet and gazed downward as earnestly as if some inestimable treasure had fallen over and were yet recoverable on the pavement below was a dark mass lying in a heap with little or nothing human in its appearance except that the hands were stretched out as if they might have clutched for a moment at the small square stones but there was no motion in them now miriam watched the heap of mortality while she could count a hundred which she took pains to do no stir not a finger moved you have killed him donatello he's quite dead said she stone dead would i were so too did you not mean that he should die sternly asked donatello still in the glow of that intelligence which passion had developed in him there was short time to weigh the matter but he had his trial in that breath or two while i held him over the cliff and a sentence in that one glance when your eyes responded to mine say that i have slain him against your will say that he died without your whole consent and in another breath you shall see me lying beside him oh never cried miriam my one own friend never 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 she turned to him the guilty blood-stained lonely woman she turned to her fellow criminal the youth so lately innocent whom she had drawn into her doom she pressed him close close to her bosom with a clinging embrace that brought their two hearts together to the horror and agony of each was combined into one motion and that a kind of rapture tell you speak the truth said she my heart consented to what you did we two slew yonder wretch the deed knots us together for time and eternity like the coil of a serpent they threw one other glance at the heap of death below to assure themselves that it was there so like a dream was the whole thing then they turned from that fatal precipice and came out of the courtyard arm in arm heart in heart instinctively they were heedful not to sever themselves so much as a pace or two from one another for fear of the terror and deadly chill that would thenceforth wait for them in solitude their deed the crime which donatello wrought and miriam accepted on the instant had wreathed itself as she said like a serpent in inextricable links about both their souls and drew them into one by its terrible contractile power it was closer than a marriage bond so intimate in those first moments was the union that it seemed as if their new sympathy annihilated all other ties and that they were released from the chain of humanity a new sphere a special law had been created for them alone the world could not come near them they were safe when they reached the flight of steps leading downward from the capital there was a far-off noise of singing and laughter swift indeed had been the rush of the crisis that was come and gone this was still the merriment of the party that had so recently been their companions they recognized the voices which a little while ago had accorded and sung in cadence with their own but they were familiar voices no more they sounded strangely and as it were out of the depths of space so remote was all that pertained to the past life of these guilty ones in the moral seclusion that had suddenly extended itself around them but how close and ever closer did the breath of the immeasurable waste that lay between them and all brotherhood or sisterhood now press them one within the other oh friend cried miriam so putting her soul into the word that it took the heavy richness of meaning and seemed never to have been spoken before o oh, friend are you conscious as i am of this companionship that knits our heart strings together 
"'I feel it, Miriam,' said Donatello. "'We draw one breath. We live one life.' "'Only yesterday,' continued Miriam, "'nay, only a short half-hour ago, I shivered in an icy solitude. No friendship, no sisterhood, could come near enough to keep the warmth within my heart. In an instant all is changed. There can be no more loneliness.' "'None, Miriam,' said Donatello. "'None, my beautiful one,' responded Miriam, gazing at his face, which had taken a higher, almost a heroic aspect from the strength of passion. "'None, my innocent one. Surely it is no crime that we have committed. One wretched and worthless life has been sacrificed to cement two other lives for evermore.' forevermore miriam said donatello cemented with his blood the young man started at the word which he had himself spoken it may be that it brought home to the simplicity of his imagination what he had not before dreamed of the ever-increasing loathsomeness of a union that consists in gulf cemented with blood which were corrupt and grow more noisome for ever and for ever but bind them none the less strictly for that forget it cast it all behind you said miriam detecting by her sympathy the pang that was in his heart the deed has done its office and has no existence any more they flung the past behind them as she counselled or else distilled from it a fiery intoxication which sufficed to carry them triumphantly through those first moments of their doom for guilt has its moments of rapture too the foremost result of a broken law is ever an ecstatic sense of freedom and thus there exhaled upward out of their dark sympathy at the base of which lay a human corpse a bliss or an insanity which the unhappy pair imagined to be well worth the sleepy innocence that was forever lost to them as their spirits rose to the solemn madness of the occasion they went onward not stealthily not fearfully but with a stately gait and aspect passion lent them as it does to meaner shapes its brief nobility of carriage they trod through the streets of rome as if they too were among the majestic and guilty shadows that from ages long gone by have haunted the blood-stained city and at miriam's suggestion they turned aside for the sake of treading loftily past the old site of pompey's forum for there was a great deed done here she said a deed of blood like ours who knows but we may meet the high and ever sad fraternity of caesar's murderers and exchange a salutation are they our brethren now asked donatello yes all of them said miriam and many another whom the world little dreams of has been made our brother or our sister by what we have done within this hour and at the thought she shivered where then was the seclusion the remoteness the strange lonesome paradise into which she and her one companion had been transported by their crime was there indeed no such refuge but only a crowded thoroughfare and jostling throng of criminals and was it true that whatever hand had a blood stain on it or had poured out poison or strangled a babe at its birth or clutched a grandsire's throat he sleeping and robbed him of his few last breaths had now the right to offer itself in fellowship with their two hands too certainly that right existed it is a terrible thought that an individual wrong-doing melts into the great mass of human crime and makes us who dreamed only of our own little separate sin makes us guilty of the whole and thus miriam and her lover were not an insulated pair but members of an innumerable confraternity of guilty ones all shuddering at each other but not now not yet she murmured to herself to-night at least there shall be no remorse wandering without a purpose it so chanced that they turned into a street at one extremity of which stood hilda's tower there was a light in her high chamber a light too at the virgin shrine and the glimmer of these two was the loftiest light beneath the stars miriam drew donatello's arm to make him stop and while they stood at some distance looking at hilda's window they beheld her approach and throw it open she leaned far forth and extended her clasped hands towards the sky the good pure child she is praying donatello said miriam with a kind of simple joy at witnessing the devoutness of her friend then her own sin rushed upon her and she shouted with the rich strength of her voice pray for us hilda we need it whether hilda heard and recognized the voice we cannot tell the window was immediately closed and her form disappeared from behind the snowy curtain miriam felt this to be a token that the cry of her condemned spirit was shut out of heaven end of chapter nineteen of volume one Volume One, Chapter Twenty of the Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Volume One, Chapter Twenty, The Burial Chant. The Church of the Capuchins, where, as the reader may remember, some of our acquaintances had made an engagement to meet, stands a little aside from the Piazza Barberini 
thither at the hour agreed upon on the morning after the scenes last described miriam and donatello directed their steps at no time are people so sedulously careful to keep their trifling appointments attend to their ordinary occupations and thus put a commonplace aspect on life as when conscious of some secret that if suspected would make them look monstrous in the general eye yet how tame and wearisome is the impression of all ordinary things in the contrast of such a fact how sick and tremulous the next morning is the spirit that has dared so much only the night before how icy cold is the heart when the fervour the wild ecstasy of passion has faded away and sunk down among the dead ashes of the fire that blazed so fiercely and was fed by the very substance of its life how faintly does the criminal stagger onward lacking the impulse of that strong madness that hurried him into guilt and treacherously deserts him in the midst of it when miriam and donatello drew near the church they found only kenyon awaiting them on the steps hilda had likewise promised to be of the party but had not yet appeared meeting the sculptor miriam put a force upon herself and succeeded in creating an artificial flow of spirits which to any but the nicest observation was quite as effective as a natural one she spoke sympathizingly to the sculptor on the subject of hilda's absence and somewhat annoyed him by alluding in donatello's hearing to the attachment which had never been openly avowed though perhaps plainly enough betrayed he fancied that miriam did not quite recognize the limits of the strictest delicacy he even went so far as to generalize and conclude within himself that this deficiency is a more general failing in woman than in man the highest refinement being a masculine attribute but the idea was unjust to the sex at large and especially so to this poor miriam who was hardly responsible for her frantic efforts to be gay possibly moreover the nice action of the mind is set ajar by any violent shock as of great misfortune or great crime so that the finer perceptions may be blurred thenceforth and the effect be traceable in all the minutest conduct of life did you see anything of the dear child after you left us asked miriam still keeping hilda as her topic of conversation i missed her sadly on my way homeward for nothing ensures me such delightful and innocent dreams i have experienced it twenty times as the talk late in the evening with hilda so i should imagine said the sculptor gravely but it is an advantage that i have little or no opportunity of enjoying i know not what became of hilda after my parting from you she was not especially my companion in any part of our walk the last i saw of her she was hastening back to rejoin you in the courtyard of the palazzo caffarelli impossible cried miriam starting then did you not see her again inquired kenyon in some alarm not there answered miriam quietly indeed i followed pretty closely on the heels of the rest of the party but do not be alarmed on hilda's account the virgin is bound to watch over the good child for the sake of the piety with which she keeps a lamp alight at her shrine and besides i have always felt that hilda is just as safe in these evil streets of rome as her white doves when they fly downwards from the tower top and run to and fro among the horses feet there is certainly a providence on purpose for hilda if for no other human creature i religiously believe it rejoined the sculptor and yet my mind would be the easier if i knew that she had returned safely to her tower then make yourself quite easy answered miriam i saw her and it is this last sweet sight that i remember leaning from a window midway between earth and sky kenyon now looked at donatello you seem out of spirits my dear friend he observed this languid roman atmosphere is not the airy wine that you were accustomed to breathe at home i have not forgotten your hospitable invitation to meet you this summer at your castle among the apennines it is my fixed purpose to come i assure you we shall both be the better for some deep draughts of the mountain breezes it may be said donatello with unwonted sombreness the old house seemed joyous when i was a child but as i remember it now it was a grim place too the sculptor looked more attentively at the young man and was surprised and alarmed to observe how entirely the fine fresh glow of animal spirits had departed out of his face hitherto moreover even while he was standing perfectly still there had been a kind of possible gambol indicated in his aspect it was quite gone now all his youthful gaiety and with it his simplicity of manner was eclipsed if not utterly extinct you are surely ill my dear fellow exclaimed kenyon am i perhaps so said donatello indifferently i never have been ill and know not what it may be do not make the poor lad fancy sink whispered miriam pulling the sculptor's sleeve he is of a nature to lie down and die at once if he finds himself drawing such melancholy breaths as we ordinary people are enforced to burden our lungs withal but we must get him away from this old dreamy and dreary rome where nobody but himself ever thought of being gay its influences are too heavy to sustain the life of such a creature the above conversation had passed chiefly on the steps of the capuccini 
and having said so much miriam lifted the leathern curtain that hangs before all church doors in italy hilda has forgotten her appointment she observed or else her maiden slumbers are very sound this morning we will wait for her no longer they entered the nave the interior of the church was of moderate compass but of good architecture with vaulted roof over the nave and a row of dusky chapels on either side of it instead of the customary side aisles each chapel had its saintly shrine hung round with offerings its picture above the altar although closely veiled if by any painter of renown and its hallowed tapers burning continually to set alight the devotion of the worshippers the pavement of the nave was chiefly of marble and looked old and broken and was shabbily patched here and there with tiles of brick it was inlaid moreover with tombstones of the medieval taste on which were quaintly sculptured borders figures and portraits in bas-relief and latin epitaphs now grown illegible by the tread of footsteps over them the church appertains to a convent of capuchin monks and as usually happens when a reverend brotherhood have such an edifice in charge the floor seemed never to have been scrubbed or swept and had as little the aspect of sanctity as a kennel whereas in all churches of nunneries the maiden sisterhood invariably show the purity of their own hearts by the virgin cleanliness and visible consecration of the walls and pavement as our friends entered the church their eyes rested at once on a remarkable object in the centre of the nave it was either the actual body or as might rather have been supposed at first glance the cunningly wrought waxen face and suitably draped figure of a dead monk this image of wax or clay cold reality whichever it might be lay on a slightly elevated bier with three tall candles burning on each side another tall candle at the head and another at the foot there was music too in harmony with so funereal a spectacle from beneath the pavement of the church came the deep lugubrious strain of a del profundis which sounded like an utterance of the tomb itself so dismally did it rumble through the burial vaults and ooze up among the flat gravestones and sad epitaphs filling the church as with a gloomy mist i must look more closely at that dead monk before we leave the church remarked the sculptor in the study of my art i have gained many a hint from the dead which the living could never have given me i can well imagine it answered miriam one clay image is readily copied from another but let us first see guido's picture the light is favourable now accordingly they turned into the first chapel on the right hand as you entered the nave and there they beheld not the picture indeed but a closely drawn curtain the churchmen of italy make no scruple of sacrificing the very purpose for which a work of sacred art has been created that of opening the way for religious sentiment through the quick medium of sight by bringing angels saints and martyrs down visible upon earth of sacrificing this high purpose and for aught they know the welfare of many souls along with it to the hope of a paltry fee every work by an artist of celebrity is hidden behind a veil and seldom revealed except to protestants who scorn it as an object of devotion and value it only for its artistic merit the sacristan was quickly found however and lost no time in disclosing the youthful archangel setting his divine foot on the head of his fallen adversary it was an image of that greatest of future events which we hope for so ardently at least while we are young but find so very long in coming the triumph of goodness over the evil principle where can hilda be exclaimed kenyon it is not her custom ever to fail in an engagement and the present one was made entirely on her account except her you know we were all agreed in our recollection of the picture but we were wrong and held a right you perceive said miriam directing his attention to the point on which the dispute of the night before had arisen it is not easy to detect her astray as regards any picture on which those clear soft eyes of hers have ever rested and she has studied and admired few pictures so much as this observed the sculptor no wonder for there is hardly another so beautiful in the world what an expression of heavenly severity in the archangel's face there is a degree of pain trouble and disgust at being brought in contact with sin even for the purpose of quelling and punishing it and yet a celestial tranquillity pervades his whole being i have never been able said miriam to admire this picture nearly so much as hilda does in its moral and intellectual aspect if it cost her more trouble to be good if her soul were less white and pure she would be a more competent critic of this picture and would estimate it not half so high i see its defects to-day more clearly than ever before what are some of them asked kenyon the archangel now miriam continued how fair he looks with his unruffled wings with his unhacked sword and clad in his bright armour and that exquisitely fitting sky-blue tunic cut in the latest paradisiacal mode 
what a dainty air of the first celestial society with what half scornful delicacy he sets his prettily sandaled foot on the head of his prostrate foe but is it thus that virtue looks the moment after its death struggle with evil no no i could have told guido better a full third of the archangel's feathers should have been torn from his wings the rest all ruffled till they looked like satan's own his sword should be streaming with blood and perhaps broken halfway to the hilt his armor crushed his robes rent his breast gory a breeding gash on his brow cutting right across the stern scowl of battle he should press his foot hard down upon the old serpent as if his very soul depended upon it feeling him squirm mightily and doubting whether the fight were half over yet and how the victory might turn and with all this fierceness this grimness this unutterable horror that should still be something high tender and holy in michael's eyes and around his mouth but the battle never was such a child's play as guido's dapper archangel seems to have found it for heaven's sakes miriam said kenyon astonished at the wild energy of her talk paint the picture of man's struggle against sin according to your own idea i think it will be a masterpiece the picture would have its share of truth i assure you she answered but i am sadly afraid the victory would fail on the wrong side just fancy a smoke-blackened fiery-eyed demon bestriding that nice young angel clutching his white throat with one of his hinder claws and giving a triumphant whisk of his scaly tail with a poisonous dart at the end of it that is what they risk poor souls who do battle with michael's enemy if now perhaps struck miriam that her mental disquietude was impelling her to an undue vivacity for she paused and turned away from the picture without saying a word more about it all this while moreover donatello had been very ill at ease casting awe-stricken and inquiring glances at the dead monk as if he could look nowhere but at the ghastly object merely because it shocked him death is probably a peculiar horror and ugliness when forced upon the contemplation of a person so naturally joyous as donatello who lived with completeness in the present moment and was able to form but vague images of the future what is the matter donatello whispered miriam soothingly you are quite in a tremble my poor friend what is it this awful chant from beneath the church answered donatello it oppresses me the air is so heavy with it that i can scarcely draw my breath and yonder dead monk i feel as if he were lying right across my heart take courage whispered she again come we will approach close to the dead monk the only way in such cases is to stare the ugly horror right in the face never a sidelong glance nor half look for those are what show a frightful thing in its frightfulest aspect lean on me dearest friend my heart is very strong for both of us be brave and all is well donatello hung back for a moment but then pressed close to miriam's side and suffered her to lead him up to the buyer the sculptor followed a number of persons chiefly women with several children among them were standing about the corpse and as our three friends drew nigh a mother knelt down and caused her little boy to kneel both kissing the beads and crucifix that hung from the monk's girdle possibly he had died in the odor of sanctity or at all events death in his brown frock and cowl made a sacred image of this reverend father end of chapter twenty of volume one volume one chapter twenty one of the marble fawn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by lars rolander the marble fawn by nathaniel hawthorne volume one chapter twenty one the dead capuchin the dead monk was clad as when alive in the brown woolen frock of the capuchins with the hood drawn over his head but so as to leave the features and a portion of the beard uncovered his rosary and cross hung at his side his hands were folded over his breast his feet he was of a barefooted order in his lifetime and continued so in death protruded from beneath his habit stiff and stark with a more waxen look than even his face they were tied together at the ankles with a black ribbon the countenance as we have already said was fully displayed it had a purplish hue upon it unlike the paleness of an ordinary corpse but as little resembling the flush of natural life the eyelids were but partially drawn down and showed the eyeballs beneath as if the deceased friar were stealing a glimpse at the bystanders to watch whether they were duly impressed with the solemnity of his obsequies the shaggy eyebrows gave sternness to the look 
Miriam passed between two of the lighted candles and stood close beside the bier. "'My God!' murmured she. "'What is this?' She grasped Donatello's hand, and at the same instant felt him give a convulsive shudder, which she knew to have been caused by a sudden and terrible throb of the heart. His hand, by an instantaneous change, became like ice within hers, which likewise grew so icy that their insensible fingers might have rattled one against the other. No wonder that their blood curdled, no wonder that their hearts leaped and paused. The dead face of the monk, gazing at them beneath its half-closed eyelids, was the same visage that had glared upon their naked souls the past midnight as donatello flung him over the precipice the sculptor was standing at the foot of the bier and had not yet seen the monk's features those naked feet said he i know not why but they affect me strangely they have walked to and fro over the hard pavements of rome and through a hundred other rough ways of his life where the monk went begging for his brotherhood along the cloisters and dreary corridors of his convent too from his youth upward it is a suggestive idea to track those worn feet backward through all the paths they have trodden ever since they were the tender and rosy little feet of a baby and cold as they now are were kept warm in his mother's hand as his companions whom the sculptor supposed to be close by him made no response to his fanciful musing he looked up and saw them at the head of the bier he advanced thither himself ha exclaimed he he cast a horror-stricken and bewildered glance at miriam but withdrew it immediately not that he had any definite suspicion or it may be even a remote idea that she could be held responsible in the least degree for this man's sudden death in truth it seemed too wild a thought to connect in reality miriam's persecutor of many past months and the vagabond of the preceding night with the dead capuchin of to-day it resembled one of those unaccountable changes and interminglings of identity which so often occur among the personages of a dream but kenyon as befitted the professor of an imaginative art was endowed with an exceedingly quick sensibility which was apt to give him intimations of the true state of matters that lay beyond his actual vision there was a whisper in his ear it said hush without asking himself wherefore he resolved to be silent as regarded the mysterious discovery which he had made and to leave any remark or exclamation to be voluntarily offered by miriam if she never spoke then let the riddle be unsolved and now occurred a circumstance that would seem too fantastic to be told if it had not actually happened precisely as we set it down as the three friends stood by the bier, they saw that a little stream of blood had begun to ooze from the dead monk's nostrils. It crept slowly towards the thicket of his beard, where, in the course of a moment or two, it hid itself. "'How strange!' ejaculated Kenyon. "'The monk died of apoplexy, I suppose, or by some sudden accident, and the blood has not yet congealed.' do you consider that a sufficient explanation asked miriam with a smile from which the sculptor involuntarily turned away his eyes does it satisfy you and why not he inquired of course you know the old superstition about this phenomenon of blood flowing from a dead body she rejoined how can we tell but that the murderer of this monk or possibly it may only be that privileged murderer his physician may have just entered the church i cannot jest about it said kenyon it is an ugly sight true true horrible to see or dream of she replied with one of those long tremulous sighs which so often betray a sick heart by escaping unexpectedly we will not look at it any more come away donatello let us escape from this dismal church the sunshine will do you good when had ever a woman such a trial to sustain as this by no possible supposition could miriam explain the identity of the dead capuchin 
quietly and decorously laid out in the nave of his convent church with that of her murdered prosecutor flung heedlessly at the foot of the precipice the effect upon her imagination was as if a strange and unknown corpse had miraculously while she was gazing at it assumed the likeness of that face so terrible henceforth in her remembrance it was a symbol perhaps of the deadly iteration with which she had doomed to behold the image of her crime reflected back upon her in a thousand ways and converting the great calm face of nature in the whole and in its innumerable details into a manifold reminiscence of that one dead visage no sooner had miriam turned away from the bier and gone a few steps then she fancied the likeness altogether an illusion which would vanish at a closer and colder view she must look at it again therefore and at once or else the grave would close over the face and leave the awful fantasy that had connected itself therewith fixed ineffaceably in her brain wait for me one moment she said to her companions only a moment so she went back and gazed once more at the corpse yes these were the features that miriam had known so well this was the visage that she remembered from a far longer date than the most intimate of her friends suspected this form of clay had held the evil spirit which blasted her sweet youth and compelled her as it were to stain her womanhood with crime but whether it were the majesty of death or something originally noble and lofty in the character of the dead which the soul had stamped upon the features as it left them so it was that miriam now quailed and shook not for the vulgar horror of the spectacle but for the severe reproachful glance that seemed to come from between those half-closed lids true there had been nothing in his lifetime viler than this man she knew it there was no other fact within her consciousness that she felt to be so certain and yet because her persecutor found himself safe and irrefutable in death he frowned upon his victim and threw back the blame on her is it thou indeed she murmured under her breath then thou hast no right to scowl upon me so but art thou real or a vision she bent down over the dead monk till one of her rich curls brushed against his forehead she touched one of his folded hands with her finger it is he said miriam there is the scar that i know so well on his brow and it is no vision he is palpable to my touch i will question the fact no longer but deal with it as i best can it was wonderful to see how the crisis developed in miriam its own proper strength and the faculty of sustaining the demands which it made upon her fortitude she ceased to tremble the beautiful woman gazed sternly at her dead enemy endeavouring to meet and quell the look of accusation that he threw from between his half-closed eyelids no thou shalt not scowl me down said she neither now nor when we stand together at the judgment seat i fear not to meet thee there farewell till that next encounter haughtily waving her hand miriam rejoined her friends who were awaiting her at the door of the church as they went out the sacristan stopped them and proposed to show the cemetery of the convent where the deceased members of the fraternity are laid to rest in sacred earth brought long ago from jerusalem and will yonder monk be buried there she asked brother antonio exclaimed the sacristan surely our good brother will be put to bed there his grave is already dug and the last occupant has made room for him will you look at it signorina i will said miriam then excuse me observed kenyon for i shall leave you one dead monk has more than sufficed me and i am not bold enough to face the whole mortality of the convent it was easy to see by donatello's looks that he as well as the sculptor would gladly have escaped a visit to the famous cemetery of the cappuccini 
but miriam's nerves were strained to such a pitch that she anticipated a certain solace and absolute relief in passing from one ghastly spectacle to another of long accumulated ugliness and there was besides a singular sense of duty which impelled her to look at the final resting-place of the being whose fate had been so disastrously involved with her own she therefore followed the sacristan's guidance and drew her companion along with her whispering encouragement as they went the cemetery is beneath the church but entirely above ground and lighted by a row of iron grated windows without glass a corridor runs along beside these windows and gives access to three or four vaulted recesses or chapels of considerable breadth and height the floor of which consists of the consecrated earth of jerusalem it is smoothed decorously over the deceased brethren of the convent and is kept quite free from grass or weeds such as would grow even in these gloomy recesses if pains were not bestowed to root them up but as the cemetery is small and it is a precious privilege to sleep in holy ground the brotherhood are immemorially accustomed when one of their numbers dies to take the longest buried skeleton out of the oldest grave and lay the new slumberer there instead thus each of the good friars in his turn enjoys the luxury of a consecrated bed attended with a slight drawback of being forced to get up long before daybreak as it were and make room for another lodger the arrangement of the unearthed skeletons is what makes the special interest of the cemetery the arched and vaulted walls of the burial recesses are supported by massive pillars and pilasters made of thigh bones and skulls the whole material of the structure appears to be of a similar kind and the knobs and embossed ornaments of this strange architecture are represented by the joints of the spine and the more delicate tracery by the smaller bones of the human frame the summits of the arches are adorned with entire skeletons looking as if they were wrought most skilfully in bas-relief there is no possibility of describing how ugly and grotesque is the effect combined with a certain artistic merit nor how much perverted ingenuity has been shown in this queer way nor what a multitude of dead monks through how many hundred years must have contributed their bony framework to build up these great arches of mortality on some of the skulls there are inscriptions purporting that such a monk who formerly made use of that particular headpiece died on such a day and year but vastly the greater number are piled up indistinguishably into the architectural design like the many deaths that make up the one glory of a victory in the side walls of the vaults are niches where skeleton monks sit or stand clad in the brown habits that they wore in life and labelled with their names and the dates of their decease their skulls some quite bare and others still covered with yellow skin and hair that has known the earth damps look out from beneath their hoods grinning hideously repulsive one reverend father has his mouth wide open as if he had died in the midst of a howl of terror and remorse which perhaps is even now screeching through eternity as a general thing however these frocked and hooded skeletons seem to take a more cheerful view of their position and try with ghastly smiles to turn it into a jest but the cemetery of the capuchins is no place to nourish celestial hopes the soul sinks forlorn and wretched under all this burden of dusty death the holy earth from jerusalem so imbued is it with mortality has grown as barren of the flowers of paradise as it is of earthly weeds and grass thank heaven for its blue sky it needs a long upward gaze to give us back our faith not here can we feel ourselves immortal where the very altars in these chapels of horrible consecration are heaps of human bones yet let us give the cemetery the praise that it deserves 
there is no disagreeable scent such as might have been expected from the decay of so many holy persons in whatever odour of sanctity they may have taken their departure the same number of living monks would not smell half so unexceptionably miriam went gloomily along the corridor from one vaulted golgotha to another until in the farthest recess she beheld an open grave is that for him who lies yonder in the nave she asked yes signorina this is to be the resting-place of brother antonio who came to his death last night answered the sacristan and in yonder niche you see sits a brother who was buried thirty years ago and has risen to give him place it is not a satisfactory idea observed miriam that you poor friars cannot call even your graves permanently your own you must lie down in them methinks with a nervous anticipation of being disturbed like weary men who know that they shall be summoned out of bed at midnight is it not possible if money were to be paid for the privilege to leave brother antonio if that be his name in the occupancy of that narrow grave till the last trumpet sounds by no means signorina neither is it needful or desirable answered the sacristan a quarter of a century sleep in the sweet earth of jerusalem is better than a thousand years in any other soil our brethren find good rest there no ghost was ever known to steal out of this blessed cemetery that is well responded miriam may he whom you now lay to sleep prove no exception to the rule as they left the cemetery she put money into the sacristan's hand to an amount that made his eyes open wide and glisten and requested that it might be expended in masses for the repose of father antonio's soul end of chapter twenty one volume one read by lars rolander volume one chapter twenty two of the marble fawn this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Morant The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 22 The Medici Gardens Donatello, said Miriam anxiously, as they came through the piazza barberini what can i do for you my beloved friend you are shaking as with the cold fit of the roman fever yes said donatello my heart shivers as soon as she could collect her thoughts miriam led the young man to the gardens of the villa medici hoping that the quiet shade and sunshine of that delightful retreat would a little revive his spirits the grounds are there laid out in the old fashion of straight paths, with borders of box, which form hedges of great height and density, and are shorn and trimmed to the evenness of a wall of stone at the top and sides. There are green alleys, with long vistas overshadowed by ilex trees, and at each intersection of the paths, the visitor finds seats of lichen-covered stone to repose upon, and marble statues that look forlornly at him, regretful of their lost noses. In the more open portions of the garden, before the sculptured front of the villa, you see fountains and flower-beds, and in their season a profusion of roses, from which the genial sun of Italy distills a fragrance, to be scattered abroad by the no less genial breeze. But Donatello drew no delight from these things. He walked onward in silent apathy, and looked at Miriam with strangely half-awakened and bewildered eyes, when she sought to bring his mind into sympathy with hers, and so relieve his heart, 
of the burden that lay lumpishly upon it. She made him sit down on a stone bench, where two embowered alleys crossed each other, so that they could discern the approach of any casual intruder a long way down the path. "'My sweet friend,' she said, taking one of his passive hands in both of hers, "'what can I say to comfort you?' "'Nothing,' replied Donatello, with somber reserve. "'Nothing will ever comfort me.' "'I accept my own misery,' continued Miriam, "'my own guilt, if guilt it be. "'And whether guilt or misery, "'I shall know how to deal with it. "'But you, dearest friend, "'that were the rarest creature in all this world, "'and seemed a being to whom sorrow could not cling, "'you, whom I half fancied to belong to a race "'that had vanished forever, "'you only surviving to show mankind how genial and how joyous life used to be in some long-ago age. What had you to do with grief or crime? They came to me as to other men, said Donatello, broodingly. Doubtless I was born to them. No, no, they came with me, replied Miriam. Mine is the responsibility, alas! Wherefore was I born? Why did we ever meet? Why did I not drive you from me, knowing from my heart foreboded it, that the cloud in which I walked would likewise envelop you? Donatello stirred uneasily, with the irritable impatience that is often combined with a mood of leaden despondency. A brown lizard with two tails, a monster often engendered by the Roman sunshine, ran across his foot and made him start. Then he sat silent a while, and so did Miriam, trying to dissolve her whole heart into sympathy and lavish it all upon him, were it only for a moment's cordial. The young man lifted his hand to his breast, and unintentionally, as Miriam's hand was within his, he lifted that along with it. "'I have a great weight here,' said he. The fancy struck Miriam, but she drove it resolutely down. The Donatello almost imperceptibly shuddered, while, in pressing his own hand against his heart, he pressed hers there, too. "'Rest your heart on me, dearest one,' she resumed. "'Let me bear all its weight. I am well able to bear it, for I am a woman.' and I love you. I love you, Donatello. Is there no comfort for you in this avowal? Look at me. Heretofore you have found me pleasant to your sight. Gaze into my eyes. Gaze into my soul. Search as deeply as you may. You can never see half the tenderness and devotion that I henceforth cherish for you. All that I ask is your acceptance of the utter self-sacrifice. But it shall be no sacrifice to my great love, with which I seek to remedy the evil you have incurred for my sake. All this fervor on Miriam's part, on Donatello's a heavy silence. Oh, speak to me, she exclaimed. Only promise me to be by and by a little happy. Happy, murmured Donatello. Ah, never again. Never again. Never. Ah, that is a terrible word to say to me, answered Miriam. A terrible word to let fall upon a woman's heart when she loves you and is conscious of having caused your misery. If you love me, Donatello, speak it not again. "'And surely you did love me?' "'I did,' replied Donatello, gloomily and absently. Miriam released the young man's hand, but suffered one of her own to be close to his, and waited a moment to see whether he would make any effort to retain it. 
there was much depending upon that simple experiment. With a deep sigh, as when sometimes a slumberer turns over in a troubled dream, Donatello changed his position, and clasped both his hands over his forehead. The genial warmth of a Roman April kindling into May was in the atmosphere around them. But when Miriam saw that involuntary movement and heard that sigh of relief, for so she interpreted it, a shiver ran through her frame, as if the iciest wind of the Apennines were blowing over her. He has done himself a greater wrong than I dreamed of, thought she, with unutterable compassion. Alas, it was a sad mistake. He might have had a kind of bliss in the consequences of this deed, had he been impelled to it by a love vital enough to survive the frenzy of that terrible moment, mighty enough to make its own law, and justify itself against the natural remorse. But to have perpetrated a dreadful murder, and such was his crime, and less love, annihilating moral distinctions, made it otherwise, on no better warrant than a boy's idle fantasy. I pity him from the very depths of my soul. As for myself, I am past my own or other's pity. She arose from the young man's side and stood before him with a sad, commiserating aspect. It was the look of a ruined soul, bewailing in him a grief less than what her profounder sympathies imposed upon herself. Donatello, we must part, she said, with melancholy firmness. Yes, leave me. Go back to your old tower, which overlooks the green valley you have told me of among the Apennines. Then all that is past will be recognized as but an ugly dream. For in dreams the conscience sleeps, and we often stain ourselves with guilt of which we should be incapable in our waking moments. The deed you seemed to do last night was no more than such a dream. There was as little substance in what you fancied yourself doing. Go, and forget it all. Ah, that terrible face, said Donatello, pressing his hands over his eyes. Do you call that unreal? Yes, for you beheld it with dreaming eyes, replied Miriam. It was unreal, and that you may feel it so, it is requisite that you see this face of mine no more. Once you may have thought it beautiful. Now it has lost its charm. Yet it would still retain a miserable potency to bring back the past illusion. And in its train the remorse and anguish that would darken all your life. Leave me, therefore, and forget me. Forget you, Miriam, said Donatello, roused somewhat from his apathy of despair. If I could remember you, and behold you, apart from that frightful visage which stares at me over your shoulder, that were a consolation, at least, if not a joy. "'But since that visage haunts you along with mine,' rejoined Miriam, glancing behind her, "'we needs must part. "'Farewell, then. "'But if ever, in distress, peril, shame, poverty, "'or whatever anguish is most poignant, "'whatever burden heaviest, "'you should require a life to be given wholly, "'only to make your own a little easier, "'then summon me.' As the case now stands between us, you have bought me dear, and find me of little worth. Fling me away, therefore. May you never need me more. But if otherwise, a wish, almost an unuttered wish, will bring me to you. She stood a moment, expecting a reply. But Donatello's eyes had again fallen on the ground, and he had not, in his bewildered mind and overburdened heart, a word to respond. That hour I speak of may never come, said Miriam. So farewell. Farewell forever. Farewell, said Donatello, 
his voice hardly made its way through the environment of unaccustomed thoughts and emotions which had settled over him like a dense and dark cloud. Not improbably, he beheld Miriam through so dim a medium that she looked visionary, heard her speak only in a faint, thin echo. She turned from the young man, and, much as her heart yearned towards him, she would not profane that heavy parting by an embrace, or even a pressure of the hand. So soon after the semblance of such mighty love, and after it had been the impulse to so terrible a deed, they parted, in all outward show, as coldly as people part, whose whole mutual intercourse has been encircled within a single hour. And Donatello, when Miriam had departed, stretched himself at full length on the stone bench, and drew his hat over his eyes, as the idle and light-hearted youths of dreamy Italy are accustomed to do, when they lie down in the first convenient shade, and snatch a noonday slumber. A stupor was upon him, which he mistook for such drowsiness as he had known in his innocent past life. But, by and by, he raised himself slowly and left the garden. Sometimes poor Donatello started, as if he heard a shriek. Sometimes he shrank back, as if a face, fearful to behold, were thrust close to his own. In this dismal mood, bewildered with the novelty of sin and grief, he had little left of that singular resemblance, on account of which, and for their sport, his three friends had fantastically recognized him as the veritable fawn of Praxiteles. End of chapter 22 of volume 1volume one chapter twenty three of the marble fawn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elizabeth morant the marble fawn by nathaniel hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 23, Miriam and Hilda On leaving the Medici Gardens, Miriam felt herself astray in the world, and having no special reason to seek one place more than another, she suffered chance to direct her steps as it would. Thus it happened that, involving herself in the crookedness of Rome, she saw Hilda's tower rising before her, and was put in mind to climb to the young girl's eyrie, and ask why she had broken her engagement at the Church of the Capuchins. People often do the idlest acts of their lifetime in their heaviest and most anxious moments, so that it would have been no wonder had Miriam been impelled only by so slight a motive of curiosity as we have indicated. But she remembered, too, and with a quaking heart, what the sculptor had mentioned of Hilda's retracing her steps towards the courtyard of the Palazzo Caffarelli, in quest of Miriam herself. Had she been compelled to choose between infamy in the eyes of the whole world in Hilda's eyes alone, she would unhesitatingly have accepted the former, on condition of remaining spotless in the estimation of her white-souled friend. This possibility, therefore, that Hilda had witnessed the scene of the past night, was unquestionably the cause that drew Miriam to the tower, and made her linger and falter as she approached it. As she drew near, there were tokens to which her disturbed mind gave a sinister interpretation. Some of her friend's airy family, the doves, with their heads embedded disconsolately in their bosoms, were huddled in a corner of the piazza. 
Others had alighted on the heads, wings, shoulders, and trumpets of the marble angels which adorned the façade of the neighboring church. Two or three had betaken themselves to the Virgin's shrine, and as many as could find room were sitting on Hilda's window sill. But all of them, so Miriam fancied, had a look of weary expectation and disappointment. No flights, no flutterings, no cooing murmur. Something that ought to have made their day glad and bright was evidently left out of this day's history. And, furthermore, Hilda's white window curtain was closely drawn, with only that one little aperture at the side, which Miriam remembered noticing the night before. Be quiet, said Miriam to her own heart, pressing her hand upon it. Why shouldst thou throb now? Hast thou not endured more terrible things than this? Whatever were her apprehensions, she would not turn back. It might be, and the solace would be worth a world, that Hilda, knowing nothing of the past night's calamity, would greet her friend with a sunny smile, and so restore a portion of the vital warmth, for lack of which her soul was frozen. But could Miriam, guilty as she was, permit Hilda to kiss her cheek, to clasp her hand, and thus be no longer so unspotted from the world as heretofore? I will never permit her sweet touch again, said Miriam, toiling up the staircase, if I can find strength of heart to forbid it. But, oh, it would be so soothing in this wintry fever fit of my heart, there can be no harm to my white Hilda in one parting kiss. That shall be all. But on reaching the upper landing place, Miriam paused and stirred not again till she brought herself to an immobile resolve. My lips, my hand, shall never meet Hilda's more, said she. Meanwhile, Hilda sat listlessly in her painting-room. Had you looked into the little adjoining chamber, you might have seen the slight imprint of her figure on the bed, but would also have detected at once that the white counterpane had not been turned down. The pillow was more disturbed. She had turned her face upon it, the poor child, and bedewed it with some of those tears among the most chill and forlorn that gush from human sorrow, which the innocent heart pours forth at its first actual discovery that sin is in the world. The young and pure are not apt to find out that miserable truth until it is brought home to them by the guiltiness of some trusted friend. They may have heard much of the evil of the world, and seem to know it, but only as an palpable theory. In due time, some mortal, whom they reverence too highly, is commissioned by Providence to teach them this direful lesson. He perpetrates a sin, and Adam falls anew, and Paradise, heretofore in unfaded bloom, is lost again, and dosed forever with the fiery swords gleaming at its gates. The chair in which Hilda sat was near the portrait of Beatrice Cenci, which had not yet been taken from the easel. It is a peculiarity of this picture that its profoundest expression eludes a straightforward glance, and can only be caught by side glimpses, or when the eye falls casually upon it even as if the painted face had a life and consciousness of its own, and, resolving not to betray its secret of grief or guilt, 
permitted the true tokens to come forth only when it imagined itself unseen. No other such magical effect has ever been wrought by pencil. Now, opposite the easel hung a looking-glass, in which Beatrice's face and Hilda's were both reflected. In one of her weary, nerveless changes of position, Hilda happened to throw her eyes on the glass, and took in both these images at once unpremeditated glance. She fancied, nor was it without horror, that Beatrice's expression, seen aside and vanishing in a moment, had been depicted in her own face likewise, and flitted from it as timorously. Am I, too, stained with guilt? thought the poor girl, hiding her face in her hands. Not so, thank heaven. But as regards Beatrice's picture, the incident suggests a theory which may account for its unutterable grief and mysterious shadow of guilt, without detracting from the purity which we love to attribute to that ill-fated girl. Who, indeed, can look at that mouth, with its lips half apart, as innocent as a babe's that has been crying, and not pronounce Beatrice sinless? It was the intimate consciousness of her father's sin that threw its shadow over her, and frightened her into a remote and inaccessible region where no sympathy could come. It was the knowledge of Miriam's guilt that lent the same expression to Hilda's face. But Hilda nervously moved her chair so that the images in the glass should no longer be visible. She now watched a speck of sunshine that came through a shuttered window and crept from object to object, indicating each with the touch of its bright finger and then letting them all vanish successively. In like manner her mind, so like sunlight in its natural cheerfulness, went from thought to thought, but found nothing that it could dwell upon for comfort. Never before had this young, energetic, active spirit known what it is to be despondent. It was the unreality of the world that made her so, her dearest friend, whose heart seemed the most solid and richest of Hilda's possessions, had no existence for her any more. And in that dreary void, out of which Miriam had disappeared, the substance, the truth, the integrity of life, the motives of effort, the joy of success, had departed along with her. It was long past noon when a step came up the staircase. It had passed beyond the limits where there was communication with the lower regions of the palace and was mounting the successive flights which led only to Hilda's precincts. Faint as the tread was, she heard and recognized it. It startled her into sudden life. Her first impulse was to spring to the door of the studio and fasten it with lock and bolt but a second thought made her feel that this would be an unworthy cowardice on her own part, and also that Miriam, only yesterday her closest friend, had a right to be told, face to face, that thenceforth they must be forever strangers. She heard Miriam pause outside of the door. We have already seen what was the latter's resolve with respect to any kiss or pressure of the hand between Hilda and herself. We know not what became of the resolution. As Miriam was of a highly impulsive character, it may have vanished at the first sight of Hilda. But, at all events, she appeared to have dressed herself up in a garb of sunshine, and was disclosed, as the door swung open, in all the glow of her remarkable beauty. The truth was, her heart leaped conclusively towards the only refuge that it had, or hoped. She forgot, just one instant, all cause for holding herself aloof. 
Ordinarily, there was a certain reserve in Miriam's demonstrations of affection, in consonance with the delicacy of her friend. Today, she opened her arms to take Hilda in. Dearest, darling Hilda, she exclaimed, it gives me new life to see you. Hilda was standing in the middle of the room. When her friend made a step or two from the door, she put forth her hands with an involuntary repellent gesture, so expressive that Miriam at once felt a great chasm opening itself between them two. They might gaze at one another from the opposite side, but without the possibility of ever meeting more, or, at least, since the chasm could never be bridged over, they must tread the whole round of eternity to meet on the other side. There was even a terror in the thought of their meeting again. It was as if Hilda or Miriam were dead, and could no longer hold intercourse without violating a spiritual law. Yet in the wantonness of her despair, Miriam made one more step towards the friend whom she had lost. "'Do not come nearer, Miriam,' said Hilda. Her look and tone were those of sorrowful entreaty, and yet they expressed a kind of confidence, as if the girl were conscious of a safeguard that could not be violated. "'What has happened between us, Hilda?' asked Miriam. "'Are we not friends?' "'No, no,' said Hilda, shuddering. "'At least we have been friends,' continued Miriam. "'I loved you dearly. I love you still. "'You are to me as a younger sister, "'yes, dearer than sisters of the same blood. "'For you and I were so lonely, Hilda, "'that the whole world pressed us together "'by its solitude and strangeness. "'Then will you not touch my hand?' Am I not the same as yesterday? Alas, no, Miriam, said Hilda. Yes, the same, the same for you, Hilda, rejoined her lost friend. For you to touch my hand, you would find it as warm to your grasp as ever. If you were sick or suffering, I would watch night and day for you. It is in such simple offices that true affection shows itself, and so I speak of them. Yet now, Hilda, your very look seems to put me beyond the limits of human kind. It is not I, Miriam, said Hilda, not I that have done this. You and you only, Hilda, replied Miriam, stirred up to make her own cause good by the repellent force which her friend opposed to her. I am a woman as I was yesterday, endowed with the same truth of nature, the same warmth of heart, the same genuine and earnest love which you have always known in me. In any regard that concerns yourself, I am not changed. And believe me, Hilda, when a human being has chosen a friend out of all the world, it is only some faithlessness between themselves rendering true intercourse impossible, that can justify either friend in severing the bond. Have I deceived you? Then cast me off. Have I wronged you personally? Then forgive me, if you can. But have I sinned against God and man, and deeply sinned? Then be more my friend than ever, for I need you more. Do not bewilder me thus, Miriam exclaimed Hilda, who had not forborne to express, by look and gesture, the anguish which this interview inflicted on her. If I were one of God's angels, with a nature incapable of sin, and garments that never could be spotted, I would keep ever at your side, and try to lead you upward. But I am a poor, lonely girl, whom God has set here in an evil world, and given her only a white robe, and bid her wear it back to him as white as when she put it on. Your powerful magnetism would be too much for me. The pure white atmosphere in which I try to discern what things are good and true would be discolored. And therefore, Miriam, 
before it is too late, I mean to put faith in this awful heartquake which warns me henceforth to avoid you. Ah, this is hard. Ah, this is terrible, murmured Miriam, dropping her forehead in her hands. In a moment or two she looked up again, as pale as death, but with a composed countenance. I always said, Hilda, that you were merciless, for I had a perception of it, even while you loved me best. You have no sin, nor any conception of what it is, and therefore you are so terribly severe. As an angel, you are not amiss, but as a human creature, and a woman among earthly men and women, you need a sin to soften you. God forgive me, said Hilda, if I have said a needlessly cruel word. Let it pass, answered Miriam. I, whose heart it has smitten upon, forgive you. And tell me, before we part forever, what have you seen or known of me since last we met? A terrible thing, Miriam, said Hilda, growing paler than before. Do you see it written in my face, or painted in my eyes? inquired Miriam, her trouble seeking relief in a half-frenzied raillery. I would fain know how it is that providence, or freight, brings eyewitnesses to watch us when we fancy ourselves acting in the remotest privacy. Did all Rome see it, then? or at least our merry company of artists? Or is it some blood stain on me, or death scent in my garments? They say that monstrous deformities sprout out of fiends, who once were lovely angels. Did you perceive such in me already? Tell me, by our past friendship, Hilda, all you know. Thus adjured and frightened, by the wild emotion which Miriam could not suppress, Hilda strove to tell what she had witnessed. After the rest of the party had passed on, I went back to speak to you, she said, for there seemed to be a trouble on your mind, and I wished to share it with you, if you could permit me. The door of the little courtyard was partly shut but I pushed it open, and saw you within, and Donatello, and a third person, whom I had before noticed in the shadow of a niche. He approached you, Miriam. You knelt to him. I saw Donatello spring upon him. I would have shrieked, but my throat was dry. I would have rushed forward, but my limbs seemed rooted to the earth. It was like a flash of lightning. A look passed from your eyes to Donatello's. A look. Yes, Hilda, yes, exclaimed Miriam with intense eagerness. Do not pause now. That look. It revealed all your heart, Miriam, continued Hilda, covering her eyes as if to shut out the recollection. A look of hatred, triumph, vengeance, and as it were, joy at some unhoped-for relief. Ah, Donatello was right then, murmured Miriam, who shook throughout all her frame. My eyes bade him do it. Go on, Hilda. It all passed so quickly, all like a glare of lightning, said Hilda, and yet it seemed to me that Donatello had paused, while one might draw a breath, and that look. Ah, Miriam, spare me, need I tell more? No more. There needs no more, Hilda, replied Miriam, bowing her head, as if listening to a sentence of condemnation from a supreme tribunal. It is enough. You have satisfied my mind on a point where it was greatly disturbed. Henceforward I shall be quiet. Thank you, Hilda. She was on the point of departing, but turned back again from the threshold. This is a terrible secret to be kept in a young girl's bosom, she observed. 
What will you do with it, my poor child? Heaven help and guide me, answered Hilda, bursting into tears, for the burden of it crushes me to the earth. It seems a crime to know of such a thing, and to keep it to myself. It knocks within my heart continually, threatening, imploring, insisting to be let out. Oh, my mother, my mother, were she yet living, I would travel over land and sea to tell her this dark secret as I told all the little troubles of my infancy. But I am alone, alone. Miriam, you are my dearest, only friend. Advise me what to do. This was a singular appeal, no doubt, from the stainless maiden to the guilty woman, whom she had just banished from her heart forever. But it bore striking testimony to the impression which Miriam's natural uprightness and impulsive generosity had made on the friend who knew her best, and it deeply comforted the poor criminal by proving to her that the bond between Hilda and herself was vital yet. As far as she was able, Miriam at once responded to the girl's cry for help. If I deemed it good, for your peace of mind, she said, to bear testimony against me for this deed in the face of all the world. No consideration of myself should weigh with me an instant. But I believe that you would find no relief in such a course. What men call justice lies chiefly in outward formalities and has never the close application and fitness that would be satisfactory to a soul like yours. I cannot be fairly tried and judged before an earthly tribunal, and of this, Hilda, you would perhaps become fatally conscious when it was too late. Roman justice, above all things, is a byword. What have you to do with it? Leave all such thoughts aside. Yet, Hilda, I would not have you keep my secret imprisoned in your heart if it tries to leap out and stings you like a wild, venomous thing when you thrust it back again. Have you no other friend now that you have been forced to give me up? No other, answered Hilda sadly. Yes, Kenyon, rejoined Miriam. He cannot be my friend, said Hilda, because because I have fancied that he sought to be something more. Fear nothing, replied Miriam, shaking her head with a strange smile. This story will frighten his newborn love out of its little life, if that be what you wish. Tell him the secret, then, and take his wise and honorable counsel as to what should next be done. I know not what else to say. I never dreamed, said Hilda. How could you think it of betraying you to justice? But I see how it is, Miriam. I must keep your secret and die of it, unless God sends me some relief by methods which are now beyond my power to imagine. It is very dreadful. Ah, now I understand how the sins of generations past have created an atmosphere of sin for those that follow, while there is a single guilty person in the universe. Each innocent one must feel his innocence tortured by that guilt. Your deed, Miriam, has darkened the whole sky. Poor Hilda turned from her unhappy friend, and, sinking on her knees in a corner of the chamber, could not be prevailed upon to utter another word, and Miriam, with a long regard from the threshold, bade farewell to this dove's nest, this one little nook of pure thoughts and innocent enthusiasms, into which she had brought such trouble. Every crime destroys more Edens than our own. End of chapter 23
of Volume 1. Volume 2, Chapter 24 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are available in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Morant. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2. Chapter 24 The Tower Among the Apennines It was in June that the sculptor Kenyon arrived on horseback at the gate of an ancient country house, which, from some of its features, might almost be called a castle, situated in a part of Tuscany somewhat remote from the ordinary track of tourists. Thither we must now accompany him, and endeavor to make our story flow onward like a streamlet, past a grey tower that rises on the hillside, overlooking a spacious valley, which is set in the grand framework of the Apennines. The sculptor had left Rome with the retreating tide of foreign residents, for as summer approaches, the Niobe of nations is made to bewail anew, and doubtless with sincerity, the loss of that large part of her population which she derives from other lands, and on whom depends much of whatever remnant of prosperity she still enjoys. Rome, at this season, is pervaded and overhung with atmospheric terrors, and insulated within a charmed and deadly circle. The crowd of wandering tourists betake themselves to Switzerland, to the Rhine, or from this central home of the world to their native homes in England or America, which they are apt thenceforward to look upon as provincial, after once having yielded to the spell of the eternal city. The artist, who contemplates an indefinite succession of winters in this home of art, though his first thought was merely to improve himself by a brief visit, goes forth in the summer time to sketch scenery and costume among the Tuscan hills, and pour, if he can, the purple air of Italy over his canvas. He studies the old schools of art in the mountain towns where they were born, and where they are still to be seen in the faded frescoes of Giotto and Simabu, on the walls of many a church, or in the dark chapels in which the sacristan draws aside the veil from a treasured picture of Perugino. Thence the happy painter goes to walk the long, bright galleries of Florence, or to steal glowing colors from the miraculous works, which he finds in a score of Venetian palaces. Such summers as these, spent amid whatever is exquisite in art, or wild and picturesque in nature, may not inadequately repay him for the chill neglect and disappointment through which he has probably languished in his Roman winter. This sunny, shadowy, breezy, wandering life, in which he seeks for beauty as his treasure, and gathers for his winter's honey what is but a passing fragrance to all other men, is worth living for, come afterwards what may. Even if he die unrecognized, the artist has had his share of enjoyment and success. Kenyon had seen, at a distance of many miles, the old villa or castle towards which his journey lay, looking from its height over a broad expanse of valley. As he drew nearer, however, it had been hidden among the inequalities of the hillside until the winding road brought him almost to the iron gateway. The sculptor found this substantial barrier fastened with lock and bolt. There was no bell nor other instrument of sound, and, after summoning the invisible garrison with his voice instead of a trumpet, he had leisure to take a glance at the exterior of the fortress. 
About thirty yards within the gateway rose a square tower, lofty enough to be a very prominent object in the landscape, and more than sufficiently massive in proportion to its height. Its antiquity was evidently such that, in a climate of more abundant moisture, the ivy would have mantled it from head to foot in a garment that might, by this time, have been centuries old, though ever new. In the dry Italian air, however, nature had only so far adopted this old pile of stonework as to cover almost every hand's breadth of it with close-clinging lichens and yellow moss and the immemorial growth of these kindly productions rendered the general hue of the tower soft and venerable, and took away the aspect of nakedness which would have made its age drearier than now. Up and down the height of the tower were scattered three or four windows, the lower ones grated with iron bars, the upper ones vacant both of window frames and glass. Besides these larger openings, there were several loopholes and little square apertures which might be supposed to light the staircase that doubtless climbed the interior toward the battlemented and machicolated summit. With this last-mentioned warlike garniture upon its stern old head and brow, the tower seemed evidently a stronghold of times long past. Many a crossbowman, had shot his shafts from those windows and loopholes, and from the vantage height of those grey battlements. Many a flight of arrows, too, had hit all around about the embrasure above, or the apertures below, where the helmet of a defender had momentarily glimmered. On festal nights, moreover, a hundred lamps had often gleamed afar over the valley, suspended from the iron hooks that were ranged for the purpose beneath the battlements and every window. Connected with the tower, and extending behind it, there seemed to be a very spacious residence, chiefly of more modern date. It perhaps owed much of its fresher appearance, however, to a coat of stucco and yellow wash which is a sort of renovation very much in vogue with the Italians. Kenyon noticed over a doorway, in the portion of the edifice immediately adjacent to the tower, a cross which, with a bell suspended above the roof, indicated that this was a consecrated precinct, and the chapel of the mansion. Meanwhile, the hot sun so incommoded the unsheltered traveller that he shouted forth another impatient summons. Happening, at the same moment, to look upward, he saw a figure leaning from an embrasure of the battlements and gazing down at him. "'Ho, Signore Count!' cried the sculptor, waving his straw hat, for he recognized the face, after a moment's doubt. "'This is a warm reception, truly!' Pray, bid your porter let me in before the sun shrivels me quite into a cinder. I will come myself, responded Donatello, flinging down his voice out of the clouds, as it were. Old Tommaso and old Stella are both asleep, no doubt, and the rest of the people are in the vineyard. But I have expected you, and you are welcome. The young Count, as perhaps we had better designate him in his ancestral tower, vanished from the battlements, and Kenyon saw his figure appear successively at each of the windows, as he descended. On every rear appearance, he turned his face towards the sculptor and gave a nod and smile, for a kindly impulse prompted him thus to assure his visitor of a welcome, after keeping him so long at an inhospitable threshold. Kenyon, however, naturally and professionally expert at reading the expression of the human countenance, had a vague sense that this was not the young friend whom he had known so familiarly in Rome, not the sylvan and untutored youth whom Miriam, Hilda, and himself had liked, laughed at, and sported with, not the Donatello whose identity they had so playfully mixed up 
with that of the fawn of Praxiteles. Finally, when his host had emerged from a side portal of the mansion, and approached the gateway, the traveller still felt that there was something lost, or something gained, he hardly knew which, that set the Donatello of to-day irreconcilably at odds with him of yesterday. His very gait showed it, in a certain gravity, a weight and measure of step, that had nothing in common with the irregular buoyancy which used to distinguish him. His face was paler and thinner, and the lips less full and less apart. "'I have looked for you a long while,' said Donatello, and, though his voice sounded differently, and cut out its words more sharply than had been its wont, still there was a smile shining on his face that, for the moment, quite brought back the fawn. "'I shall be more cheerful,' perhaps, now that you have come. It is very solitary here. I have come slowly along, often lingering, often turning aside, replied Kenyon, for I found a great deal to interest me in the medieval sculptures hidden away in the church churches hereabouts. An artist, whether painter or sculptor, may be pardoned for loitering through such a region. But what a fine old tower! Its tall front is like a page of black letter, taken from the history of the Italian republics. "'I know little or nothing of its history,' said the Count, glancing upward at the battlements, where he had just been standing. "'But I thank my forefathers for building it so high. I like the windy summit better than the world below, and spend much of my time there, nowadays. "'It is a pity you are not a stargazer.' observed Kenyon, also looking up. It is higher than Galileo's tower, which I saw a week or two ago, outside of the walls of Florence. A stargazer? I am one, replied Donatello. I sleep in the tower, and often watch very late on the battlements. There is a dismal old staircase to climb, however, before reaching the top and a succession of dismal chambers, from story to story. Some of them were prison chambers in times past, as old Tommaso will tell you. The repugnance intimated in his tone at the idea of this gloomy staircase and these ghostly, dimly lighted rooms reminded Kenyon of the original Donatello much more than his present custom of midnight vigils on the battlements. "'I shall be glad to share your watch,' said the guest, "'especially by moonlight. The prospect of this broad valley must be very fine. But I was not aware, my friend, that these were your country habits. I have fancied you in a sort of Arcadian life, tasting rich figs.' and squeezing the juice out of the sunniest grapes, and sleeping soundly all night, after a day of simple pleasures. "'I may have known such a life when I was younger,' answered the Count gravely. "'I am not a boy now. Time flies over us, but leaves its shadow behind.' The sculptor could not but smile at the triteness of the remark, which, nevertheless, had a kind of originality as coming from Donatello. He had thought it out from his own experience, and perhaps considered himself as communicating a new truth to mankind. They were now advancing up the courtyard, and the long extent of the villa, with its iron-barred lower windows and balconied upper ones, became visible, stretching back towards a grove of trees. At some period of your family history, observed Kenyon, the Counts of Monte Beni must have led a patriarchal life in this vast house. A great grandsire and all his descendants might find ample verge here, and with space, too, for each separate brood of little ones to play within its own precincts. Is your present household a large one? Only myself, answered Donatello, and Tommaso who has been butler since my grandfather's time, 
and old Stella, who goes sweeping and dusting about the chambers, and Girolamo, the cook, who has but an idle life of it, he shall send you up a chicken forthwith. But first of all, I must summon one of the contadini from the farmhouse yonder to take your horse to the stable. Accordingly, the young count shouted again, and with such effect that, after several repetitions of the outcry, an old grey woman protruded her head and a broom handle from a chamber window. The venerable butler emerged from a recess in the side of the house, where was a well, or reservoir, in which he had been cleansing a small wine cask, and a sunburnt contadino in his shirt sleeves showed himself on the outskirts of the vineyard with some kind of a farming tool in his hand donatello found employment for all these retainers in providing accommodation for his guest and steed and then ushered the sculptor into the vestibule of the house it was a square and lofty entrance room which by the solidity of its construction might have been an etruscan tomb being paved and walled with heavy blocks of stone and vaulted almost as massively overhead on two sides there were doors opening into long suites of anterooms and saloons on the third side a stone staircase of spacious breadth ascending by dignified degrees and with wide resting places to another floor of similar extent through one of the doors which was ajar kenyon beheld an almost interminable vista of apartments opening one beyond the other and reminding him of the hundred rooms in bluebeard's castle or the countless halls in some palace of the arabian nights it must have been a numerous family indeed that could ever have sufficed to people with human life so large an abode as this, and impart social warmth to such a wide world within doors. The sculptor confessed to himself that Donatello could allege reason enough for growing melancholy, having only his own personality to vivify it all. How a woman's face would brighten it up, he ejaculated, not intending to be overheard but glancing at donatello he saw a stern and sorrowful look in his eyes which altered his youthful face as if it had seen thirty years of trouble and at the same moment old stella showed herself through one of the doorways as the only representative of her sex at monte Benni. End of chapter 24 of volume 2. Recording by Elizabeth Morant, Port Ritchie, lizmorant at gmail.com. Volume 2, chapter 25. The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Morant. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2, Chapter 25 Sunshine Come, said the Count. I see you already find the old place dismal. So do I, indeed. And yet it was a cheerful place in my boyhood. But, you see, in my father's days. And the same was true of all my endless line of grandfathers as i have heard there used to be uncles aunts and all manner of kindred 
dwelling together as one family. They were a merry and kindly race of people, for the most part, and kept one another's hearts warm. Two hearts might be enough for warmth, observed the sculptor, even in so large a house as this. One solitary heart, it is true, may be apt to shiver a little. But I trust, my friend, that the genial blood of your race still flows in many veins besides your own. I am the last, said Donatello gloomily. They have all vanished from me since my childhood. Old Tommaso will tell you that the heir of Monte Beni is not so favorable to length of days as it used to be. But that is not the secret of the quick extinction of my kindred. Then you are aware of a more satisfactory reason, suggested Kenyon. I thought of one the other night while I was gazing at the stars answered Donatello. But, pardon me, I do not mean to tell it. Uh, one cause, however, of the longer and healthier life of my forefathers was that they had many pleasant customs and means of making themselves glad, and their guests and friends along with them. Nowadays we have but one. And what is that? asked the sculptor. You shall see, said his host. By this time he had ushered the sculptor into one of the numberless saloons, and, calling for refreshment, old Stella placed a cold fowl upon the table, and quickly followed it with a savory omelette, which Girolamo had lost no time in preparing. She also brought some cherries, plums, and apricots, and a plate full of particularly delicate figs of last year's growth. The butler, showing his white head at the door, his master beckoned to him. Tommaso, bring some sunshine, said he. The readiest method of obeying this order, one might suppose, would have been to fling wide the green window blinds and let the glow of the summer noon into the carefully shaded room. But at Monte Beni, with provident caution against the wintry days, when there is little sunshine, and the rainy ones, when there is none, it was the hereditary custom to keep their sunshine stored away in the cellar. Old Tommaso, quickly produced some of it in a small, straw-covered flask, out of which he extracted the cork and inserted a little cotton wool to absorb the olive oil that kept the precious liquid from the air. This is a wine, observed the Count, the secret of making which has been kept in our family for centuries upon centuries nor would it avail any man to steal the secret, unless he could also steal the vineyard, in which alone the Monte Beni grape can be produced. There is little else left me, save that patch of vines. Taste some of their juice, and tell me whether it is worthy to be called sunshine, for that is its name. A glorious name, too, cried the sculptor. Taste it, said Donatello, filling his friend's glass and pouring likewise a little into his own. But first smell its fragrance, for the wine is very lavish of it and will scatter it all abroad. Ah, how exquisite, said Kenyon. No other wine has a bouquet like this. The flavor must be rare indeed if it fulfill the promise of this fragrance which is like the airy sweetness of youthful hopes that no realities will ever satisfy 
this invaluable liqueur was of a pale golden hue like other of the rarest italian wines and if carelessly and irreligiously quaffed might have been mistaken for a very fine sort of champagne it was not however an effervescing wine although its delicate piquancy produced a somewhat similar effect upon the palate sipping the guest longed to sip again but the wine demanded so deliberate a pause in order to detect the hidden peculiarities and subtle exquisiteness of its flavor that to drink it was really more a moral than a physical enjoyment there was a deliciousness in it that eluded analysis and like whatever else is superlatively good was perhaps better appreciated in the memory than by present consciousness one of its most ethereal charms lay in the transitory life of the wine's richest qualities for while it required a certain leisure and delay yet if you lingered too long upon the draught it became disenchanted both of its fragrance and its flavor the luster should not be forgotten among the other admirable endowments of the monte venni wine for as it stood in kenyon's glass a little circle of light glowed on the table round about it as if it were really so much golden sunshine i feel myself a better man for that ethereal potation observed the sculptor the finest orvieto or that famous wine the est 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 of monte fiascone is vulgar in comparison this is surely the wine of the golden age such as bacchus himself first taught mankind to press from the choicest of his grapes my dear count why is it not illustrious the pale liquid gold in every such flask as that might be solidified into golden scudi and would quickly make you a millionaire <laughs> tommaso the old butler who was standing by the table and enjoying the praises of the wine quite as much as if bestowed upon himself made answer we have a tradition signore said he that this rare wine of our vineyard would lose all its wonderful qualities if any of it were sent to market the counts of montebeni have never parted with a single flask of it for gold at their banquets in the olden time they have entertained princes cardinals and once an emperor and once a pope with this delicious wine and always even to this day it has been their custom to let it flow freely when those whom they love and honor sit at the board but the grand duke himself could not drink that wine except it were under this very roof what do you tell me my good friend replied kenyon makes me venerate the sunshine of monte beni even more abundantly than before as i understand you it is a sort of consecrated juice and symbolizes the holy virtues of hospitality and social kindness why partly so signore said the old butler with a shrewd twinkle in his eye but to speak out all the truth there is another excellent reason why neither a cask nor a flask of our precious vintage should ever be sent to market the wine signore is so fond of its native home 
that a transportation of even a few miles turns it quite sour and yet it is a wine that keeps well in the cellar underneath this floor and gathers fragrance flavor and brightness in its dark dungeon that very flask of sunshine now has kept itself for you sir guest as a maid reserves her sweetness till her lover comes for it ever since a merry vintage time when the signore count here was a boy you must not wait for tommaso to end his discourse about the wine before drinking off your glass observed donatello when once the flask is uncorked its finest qualities lose little time in making their escape i doubt whether your last sip will be quite so delicious as you found the first and in truth the sculptor fancied that the sunshine became almost imperceptibly clouded as he approached the bottom of the flask the effect of the wine however was a gentle exhilaration which did not so speedily pass away being thus refreshed kenyon looked around him at the antique saloon in which they sat it was constructed in a most ponderous style with a stone floor on which heavy pilasters were planted against the wall supporting arches that crossed one another in the vaulted ceiling the upright walls as well as the compartments of the roof were completely covered with frescoes which doubtless had been brilliant when first executed and perhaps for generations afterwards the designs were of a festive and joyous character representing arcadian scenes where nymphs fauns and satyrs disported themselves among mortal youths and maidens and pan and the god of wine and he of sunshine and music disdained not to brighten some sylvan merry-making with the scarcely veiled glory of their presence a wreath of dancing figures in admirable variety of shape and motion was festooned quite round the cornice of the room in its first splendor the saloon must have presented an aspect both gorgeous and enlivening for it invested some of the cheerfulest ideas and emotions of which the human mind is susceptible with the external reality of beautiful form and rich harmonious glow and variety of color but the frescoes were now very ancient they had been rubbed and scrubbed by old stein and many a predecessor and had been defaced in one spot and retouched in another and had peeled from the wall in patches and had hidden some of their brightest portions under dreary dust till the joyousness had quite vanished out of them all it was often difficult to puzzle out the design and even where it was more readily intelligible the figures showed like the ghosts of dead and buried joys the closer their resemblance to the happy past the gloomier now for it is thus that with only an inconsiderable change the gladdest object and existences become the saddest hope fading into disappointment joy darkening into grief and festal splendor into funereal duskiness and all evolving as their moral a grim identity between gay things and sorrowful ones only give them a little time and they turn out to be just alike. 
there has been much festivity in the saloon if i may judge by the character of its frescoes remarked kenyon whose spirits were still upheld by the mild potency of the monte benny wine your forefathers my dear count must have been joyous fellows keeping up the vintage merriment throughout the year it does me good to think of them gladdening the hearts of men and women with their wine of sunshine even in the iron age as pan and bacchus whom we see yonder did in the golden one yes there have been merry times in the banquet hall of monte Beni, even within my own remembrance replied donatello looking gravely at the painted walls it was meant for mirth as you see and when i brought my own cheerfulness into the saloon these frescoes looked cheerful too but methinks they have all faded since i saw them last it would be a good idea said the sculptor falling into his companion's vein and helping him out with an illustration which donatello himself could not have put into shape to convert this saloon into a chapel and when the priest tells his hearers of the instability of earthly joys and would show how drearily they vanish he may point to these pictures that were so joyous and are so dismal he could not illustrate his theme so aptly in any other way true indeed answered the count his former simplicity strangely mixing itself up with an experience that had changed him and yonder where the minstrels used to stand the altar shall be placed a sinful man might do all the more effective penance in this old banquet hall but i should regret to have suggested so ungenial a transformation in your hospitable saloon continued kenyon duly noting the change in donatello's characteristics you startle me my friend by so ascetic a design it would hardly have entered your head when we first met pray do not if i may take the freedom of a somewhat elder man to advise you added he smiling pray do not under a notion of improvement take upon yourself to be sombre thoughtful and penitential like all the rest of us donatello made no answer but sat a while appearing to follow with his eyes one of the figures which was repeated many times over in the groups upon the walls and ceiling it formed the principal link of an allegory by which as is often the case in such pictorial designs the whole series of frescoes were bound together but which it would be impossible or at least very wearisome to unravel the sculptor's eyes took a similar direction and soon began to trace through the vicissitudes once gay now somber in which the old artist had involved it the same individual figure he fancied a resemblance in it to donatello himself and it put him in mind of one of the purposes with which he had come to monte Beni. my dear count said he i have a proposal to make you must let me employ a little of my leisure in modeling your bust you remember what a striking resemblance we all of us hilda miriam and i found between your features and those of the fawn of praxiteles then it seemed an identity but now that i know your face better the likeness is far less apparent your head in marble would be a treasure to me shall i have it 
I have a weakness which I fear I cannot overcome, replied the Count, turning away his face. It troubles me to be looked at steadfastly. I have observed it since we have been sitting here, though never before, rejoined the sculptor. It is a kind of nervousness, I apprehend, which you caught in the Roman air, and which grows upon you in your solitary life. It need be no hindrance to my taking your bust, for I will catch the likeness and expression by side glimpses, which, if portrait painters and bust makers did but know it, always bring home richer results than a broad stare. You may take me if you have the power, said Donatello. But, even as he spoke, he turned away his face. And if you can see what makes me shrink from you, you are welcome to put it in the bust. It is not my will, but my necessity to avoid men's eyes. Only, he added, with a smile which made Kenyon doubt whether he might not as well copy the fawn as model a new bust. Only, you know, you must not insist on my uncovering these ears of mine. Nay, I never should dream of such a thing, answered the sculptor, laughing, as the young count shook his clustering curls. I could not hope to persuade you, remembering how Miriam once failed. Nothing is more unaccountable than the spell that often lurks in a spoken word. A thought may be present to the mind so distinctly that no utterance could make it more so. And two minds may be conscious of the same thought, in which one or both take the profoundest interest. But as long as it remains unspoken, the familiar talk flows quietly over the hidden idea, as a rivulet may sparkle and dimple over something sunken in its bed. But speak the word, and it is like bringing up a drowned body out of the deepest pool of the rivulet, which has been aware of the horrible secret all along, in spite of its smiling surface. And even so, when Kenyon chanced to make a distinct reference to Donatello's relations with Miriam, though the subject was already in both their minds, ghastly emotion rose up out of the depths of the young count's heart. He trembled either with anger or terror, and glared at the sculptor with wild eyes, like a wolf that meets you in the forest, and hesitates whether to flee or turn to bay. But, as Kenyon still looked calmly at him, his aspect gradually became less disturbed, though far from resuming its former quietude. "'You have spoken her name,' said he, at last, in an altered and tremulous tone. "'Tell me, now, all that you know of her. "'I scarcely think that I have any later intelligence than yourself,' answered Kenyon. "'Miriam left Rome at about the time of your own departure.' within a day or two after our last meeting at the Church of the Capuchins. I called at her studio and found it vacant. Whither she has gone, I cannot tell. Donatello asked no further questions. They rose from table and strolled together about the premises, whiling away the afternoon with brief intervals of unsatisfactory conversation and many shadowy silences. The sculptor had a perception of change in his companion, possibly of growth and development, but certainly of change, which saddened him, because it took away 
much of this simple grace that was the best of Donatello's peculiarities. Kenyon betook himself to repose that night in a grim, old, vaulted apartment which, in a lapse of five or six centuries, had probably been the birth, bridal, and death chamber of a great many generations of the Monte Beni family. He was aroused, soon after daylight, by the clamor of a tribe of beggars who had taken their stand in a little rustic lane that crept beside that portion of the villa, and were addressing their petitions to the open windows. By and by they appeared to have received alms and took their departure. Some charitable Christian has sent these vagabonds away, thought the sculptor, as he resumed his interrupted nap. Who could it be? Donatello has his own rooms in the tower. Stella, Tommaso, and the cook are a world's width off. And I fancied myself the only inhabitant in this part of the house. In the breadth and space which so delightfully characterize an Italian villa, a dozen guests might have had each his suite of apartments without infringing upon one another's ample precincts. But, so far as Kenyon knew, he was the only visitor beneath Donatello's widely extended roof. Chapter 25, Volume 2, The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Read by Elizabeth Morant Volume 2, Chapter 26 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore in Aroostook County, Maine. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 2, Chapter 26 The Pedigree of Montebeni. From the old butler, whom he found to be a very gracious and affable personage, Kenyon soon learned many curious particulars about the family history and hereditary peculiarities of the Counts of Montebeni. There was a pedigree, the later portion of which, that is to say, for a little more than a thousand years, a genealogist would have found delight in tracing out link by link and authenticating by records and documentary evidences. It would have been as difficult, however, to follow up the stream of Donatello's ancestry to its dim source as travellers have found it to reach the mysterious fountains of the Nile, and far beyond the region of definite and demonstrable fact, a romancer might have strayed into a region of old poetry, where the rich soil, so long uncultivated and untrodden, had lapsed into nearly its primeval state of wilderness. Among those antique paths, now overgrown with tangled and riotous vegetation, the wanderer must needs follow his own guidance, and arrive no whither at last. The race of Montebeni, beyond a doubt, was one of the oldest in Italy, where families appear to survive at least, if not to flourish, on their half-decayed roots, oftener than in England or France. It came down in a broad track from the Middle Ages, but at epochs anterior to those, it was distinctly visible, in the gloom of the period, before chivalry put forth its flower, and further still, we are almost afraid to say, it was seen, though with a fainter and wavering course, in the early morn of Christendom, when the Roman Empire had hardly begun to show symptoms of decline. At that venerable distance, the heralds gave up the lineage in despair. But where written record left the genealogy of Mount Beni, tradition took it up, and carried it, without dread or shame, beyond the imperial ages, into the times of the Roman Republic, beyond those again, into the epoch of kingly rule. Nor even so remotely among the mossy centuries did it pause, but strayed onward into that grey antiquity of which there is no token left, save its cavernous tombs and a few bronzes, and some quaintly wrought ornaments of gold, and gems with mystic figures and inscriptions. There or thereabouts, the line was supposed to have had its origin in the sylvan life, of Etruria, where Italy was yet guiltless of Rome. 
Of course, as we regret to say, the earlier and very much the larger portion of this respectable descent, and the same is true of many briefer pedigrees, must be looked upon as altogether mythical. Still, it threw a romantic interest around the unquestionable antiquity of the Montebeni family, and over that tract of their own vines and fig trees, beneath the shade of which they had unquestionably dwelt for immemorial ages. And there they had laid the foundations of their tower, so long ago that one half of its height was said to be sunken under the surface, and to hide subterranean chambers, which once were cheerful with the olden sunshine. One story, or myth, that had mixed itself up with their mouldy genealogy, interested the sculptor by its wild, and perhaps grotesque, yet not unfascinating peculiarity. He caught at it the more eagerly, as it afforded a shadowy and whimsical semblance of explanation for the likeness which he, with Miriam and Hilda, had seen or fancied, between Donatello and the fawn of Praxiteles. The Montebeni family, as this legend averred, drew their origin from the Pelasgic race, who peopled Italy in times that may be called prehistoric. It was the same noble breed of men, of Asiatic birth, that settled in Greece, the same happy and poetic kindred who dwelt in Arcadia, and whether they ever lived such life or not, enriched the world with dreams, at least, and fables, lovely, if unsubstantial, of a golden age. In those delicious times, when deities and demigods appeared familiarly on earth, mingling with its inhabitants as friend with friend, when nymphs, satyrs, and the whole train of classic faith or fable hardly took pains to hide themselves in the primeval woods, at that auspicious period the lineage of Montebeni had its rise. Its progenitor was a being not altogether human, yet partaking so largely of the gentlest human qualities as to be neither awful nor shocking to the imagination. A sylvan creature, native among the woods, had loved a mortal maiden, and, perhaps by kindness and the subtle courtesies which love might teach to his simplicity, or possibly by a ruder wooing, had won her to his haunts. In due time he gained her womanly affection, and making their bridal bower, for aught we know, in the hollow of a great tree, the pair spent a happy wedded life in that ancient neighborhood where now stood Donatello's tower. From this union sprang a vigorous progeny that took its place unquestioned among human families. In that age, however, and long afterwards, it showed the ineffaceable lineaments of its wild paternity. It was a pleasant and kindly race of men, but capable of savage fierceness, and never quite restrainable within the trammels of social law. They were strong, active, genial, cheerful as the sunshine, passionate as the tornado. Their lives were rendered blissful by an unsought harmony with nature. But as centuries passed away, the fawn's wild blood had necessarily been attempered with constant intermixtures from the more ordinary streams of human life. It lost many of its original qualities, and served, for the most part, only to bestow an unconquerable vigor, which kept the family from extinction, and enabled them to make their own part good, throughout the perils and rude emergencies of their interminable descent. In the constant wars with which Italy was plagued, by the dissensions of her petty states and republics, there was a demand for native hardihood. The successive members of the Montebeni family showed valor and policy enough, at all events, to keep their hereditary possessions out of the clutch of grasping neighbors, and probably differed very little from the other feudal barons with whom they fought and feasted. Such a degree of conformity with the manners of the generations through which it survived must have been essential to the prolonged continuance of the race. It is well known, however, that any hereditary peculiarity, as a supernumerary finger, or an anomalous shape of feature like the Austrian lip, is wont to show itself in a family after a very wayward fashion. It skips at its own pleasure along the line, and latent for half a century or so, crops out again in a great-grandson. And thus it was said, from a period beyond memory or record, there had ever and anon been a descendant of the Montebenis, bearing nearly all the characteristics that were attributed to the original founder of the race. Some traditions even went so far as to enumerate the ears, covered with a delicate fur, 
and shaped like a pointed leaf among the proofs of authentic descent which were seen in these favoured individuals we appreciate the beauty of such tokens of a nearer kindred to the great family of nature than other mortals bear but it would be idle to ask credit for a statement which might be deemed to partake so largely of the grotesque but it was indisputable that once in a century or oftener a son of mount Abeni gathered into himself the scattered qualities of his race and reproduced the character that had been assigned to it from immemorial times beautiful strong brave kindly sincere of honest impulses and endowed with simple tastes in the love of homely pleasures he was believed to possess gifts by which he could associate himself with the wild things of the forests and with the fowls of the air and could feel a sympathy even with the trees among which it was his joy to dwell on the other hand there were deficiencies both of intellect and heart and especially as it seemed in the development of the higher portion of man's nature these defects were less perceptible in early youth but showed themselves more strongly with advancing age when as the animal spirits settled down upon a lower level the representative of the montebenis was apt to become sensual addicted to gross pleasures heavy unsympathizing and insulated with the narrow limits of a surly selfishness a similar change indeed is no more than what we constantly observe to take place in persons who are not careful to substitute other graces for those which they inevitably lose along with the quick sensibility and joyous vivacity of youth at worst the reigning count of montebeni as his hair grew white was still a jolly old fellow over his flask of wine the wine that bacchus himself was fabled to have taught his sylvan ancestor how to express and from what choicest grapes which would ripen only in a certain divinely favoured portion of the montebeni vineyard the family be it observed were both proud and ashamed of these legends but whatever part of them they might consent to incorporate into their ancestral history they steadily repudiated all that referred to their one distinctive feature the pointed and furry ears in a great many years past no sober credence had been yielded to the mythical portion of the pedigree it might however be considered as typifying some such assemblage of qualities in this case chiefly remarkable for their simplicity and naturalness as when they reappear in successive generations constitute what we call family character the sculptor found moreover on the evidence of some old portraits that the physical features of the race had long been similar to what he now saw them in donatello with accumulating years it is true the montebeni face had a tendency to look grim and savage and in two or three instances the family pictures glared at the spectator in the eyes like some surly animal that had lost its good humour when it outlived its playfulness the young count accorded his guest full liberty to investigate the personal annals of these pictured worthies as well as all the rest of his progenitors and ample materials were at hand in many chests of worm-eaten papers and yellow parchments that had been gathering into larger and dustier piles ever since the dark ages but to confess the truth the information afforded by these musty documents was so much more prosaic than what kenyon acquired from tomaso's legends that even the superior authenticity of the former could not reconcile him to its dullness what especially delighted the sculptor was the analogy between donatello's character as he himself knew it and those peculiar traits which the old butler's narrative assumed to have been long hereditary in the race he was amused at finding too that not only tomaso but the peasantry of the estate in neighbouring village recognised his friend as a genuine montebeni of the original type they seemed to cherish a great affection for the young count and were full of stories about his sportive childhood how he had played among the little rustics and been at once the wildest and the sweetest of them all and how in his very infancy he had plunged into the deep pools of the streamlets and never been drowned and had clambered to the topmost branches of tall trees without ever breaking his neck no such mischance could happen to the sylvan child because handling all the elements of nature so fearlessly and freely nothing had either the power or the will to do him harm he grew up said these humble friends the playmate not only of all mortal kind but of creatures of the woods 
although when kenyon pressed them for some particulars of this latter mode of companionship they could remember little more than a few anecdotes of a pet fox which used to growl and snap at everybody save donatello himself but they enlarged and never were wary of the theme upon the blithesome effects of donatello's presence in his rosy childhood and budding youth their hovels had always glowed like sunshine when he entered them so that as the peasants expressed it their young master had never darkened a doorway in his life he was the soul of vintage festivals while he was a mere infant scarcely able to run alone it had been the custom to make him tread the wine-press with his tender little feet if it were only to crush one cluster of the grapes and the grape-juice that gushed beneath his childish tread be it ever so small in quantity sufficed to impart a pleasant flavour to a whole cask of wine the race of montebeni so these rustic chroniclers assured the sculptor had possessed the gift from the oldest of old times of expressing good wine from ordinary grapes and a ravishing liquor from the choice growth of their vineyard in a word as he listened to such tales as these kenyon could have imagined that the valleys and hillsides about him were a veritable arcadia and that donatello was not merely a sylvan faun but the genial wine-god in his very person making many allowances for the poetic fancies of italian peasants he set it down for fact that his friend in a simple way and among rustic folks had been an exceedingly delightful fellow in his younger days but the contadini sometimes added shaking their heads and sighing that the young count was sadly changed since he went to rome the village girls now missed the merry smile with which he used to greet them the sculptor inquired of his good friend tommaso whether he too had noticed the shadow which was said to have recently fallen over donatello's life ah yes signore answered the old butler it is even so since he came back from that wicked and miserable city the world has grown either too evil or else too wise and sad for such men as the old counts of montebene used to be his very first taste of it as you see has changed and spoilt my poor young lord there had not been a single count in the family these hundred years or more who was so true a montebene of the antique stamp as this poor signorino and now it brings the tears into my eyes to hear him sighing over a cup of sunshine ah it is a sad world now then you think there was a merrier world once asked kenyon surely signore said tommaso a merrier world and merrier counts of montebene to live in it such tales of them as i have heard when i was a child on my grandfather's knee the good old man remembered a lord of montebene at least he had heard of such a one though i will not make oath upon the holy crucifix that my grandsire lived in his time who used to go into the woods and call pretty damsels out of the fountains and out of the trunks of the old trees that merry lord was known to dance with them a whole long summer afternoon when shall we see such frolics in our days not soon i am afraid acquiesced the sculptor you are right excellent tommaso the world is sadder now and in truth while our friend smiled at these wild fables he sighed in the same breath to think how the once genial earth produces in every successive generation fewer flowers than used to gladden the preceding ones not that the modes and seeming possibilities of human enjoyment are rarer in our refined and softened era on the contrary they never before were nearly so abundant but that mankind are getting so far beyond the childhood of their race that they scorn to be happy any longer a simple and joyous character can find no place for itself among the sage and sombre figures that would put his unsophisticated cheerfulness to shame the entire system of man's affairs as at present established is built up purposely to exclude the careless and happy soul the very children would upbraid the wretched individual who should endeavour to take life and the world as what we might naturally suppose them meant for a place and opportunity for enjoyment it is the iron rule in our day to require an object and a purpose in life it makes us all parts of a complicated scheme of progress which can only result in our arrival at a colder and drearier region than we were born in it insists upon everybody's adding somewhat a mite perhaps but earned by incessant effort to an accumulated pile of usefulness of which the only use will be 
to burden our posterity with even heavier thoughts and more inordinate labor than our own. No life now wanders like an unfettered stream. There is a mill-wheel for the tiniest rivulet to turn. We go all wrong by too strenuous a resolution to go all right. Therefore it was. So at least the sculptor thought, although partly suspicious of Donatello's darker misfortune, that the young Count found it impossible nowadays to be what his forefathers had been. He could not live their healthy life of animal spirits, in their sympathy with nature, and brotherhood with all that breathed around them. Nature in beast, fowl, and tree, and earth, flood, and sky, is what it was of old, but sin, care, and self-consciousness have set the human portion of the world askew, and thus the simplest character is ever the soonest to go astray. At any rate, Tommaso, said Kenyon, doing his best to comfort the old man, let us hope that your young lord will still enjoy himself at vintage time. By the aspect of the vineyard, I judge that this will be a famous year for the golden wine of Montebene. As long as your grapes produce that admirable liquor, sad as you think the world, neither the Count nor his guests will quite forget to smile. Ah, signore, rejoined the butler with a sigh, but he scarcely wets his lips with the sunny juice. There is yet another hope, observed Kenyon. The young Count may fall in love, and bring home a fair and laughing wife, to chase the gloom out of yonder old frescoed saloon. Do you think he could do a better thing, my good Tommaso? Maybe not, signore, said the sage butler, looking earnestly at him. And maybe not a worse. The sculptor fancied that the good old man had it partly in his mind, to make some remark, or communicate some fact, which on second thoughts he resolved to keep concealed in his own breast. He now took his departure cellarward, shaking his white head and muttering to himself, and did not reappear till dinner-time, when he favoured Kenyon, whom he had taken far into his good graces, with a choicer flask of sunshine than had yet blessed his palate. To say the truth, this golden wine was no unnecessary ingredient towards making the life of Montebene palatable. It seemed a pity that Donatello did not drink a little more of it, and go jollily to bed at least, even if he should awake, with an accession of darker melancholy the next morning. Nevertheless, there was no lack of outward means for leading an agreeable life in the old villa. Wandering musicians haunted the precincts of Montebene, where they seemed to claim a prescriptive right. They made the lawn and shrubbery tuneful with the sound of fiddle, harp, and flute, and now and then with the tangled squeaking of a bagpipe. Improvisatory, Likewise came and told tales of recited verses to the contadini, among whom Kenyon was often an auditor, after their day's work in the vineyard. Jugglers, too, obtained permission to do feats of magic in the hall, where they set even the sage Tommaso and Stella, Girolamo and the peasant girls from the farmhouse, all of a broad grin, between merriment and wonder. These good people got food and lodging for their pleasant pains, and some of the small wine of Tuscany and a reasonable handful of the Grand Duke's copper coin, to keep up the hospitable renown of Montebene, but very seldom had they the young Count as a listener or a spectator. There were sometimes dances by moonlight on the lawn, but never since he came from Rome did Donatello's presence deepen the blushes of the pretty contadinas, or his footstep weary out the most agile partner or competitor, as once it was sure to do. Paupers, for this kind of vermin, infested the house of Montebene, worse than any other spot in beggar-haunted Italy, stood beneath all the windows, making loud supplication, or even establishing themselves on the marble steps of the grand entrance. They ate and drank and filled their bags and pocketed the little money that was given them, and went forth on their devious ways, showering blessings, innumerable on the mansion and its lord, and on the souls of his deceased forefathers, who had always been just such simpletons, as to be compassionate to beggary. But in spite of their favorable prayers, by which Italian philanthropists set great store, a cloud seemed to hang over these once Arcadian precincts, and to be darkest around the summit of the tower where Donatello was wont to sit and brood. End of chapter 26 of Volume 2《ハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッピーバースデートゥーハッ
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 2, Chapter 27, Myths After the sculptor's arrival, however, the young Count sometimes came down from his forlorn elevation and rambled with him among the neighboring woods and hills. He led his friend to many enchanting nooks, with which he himself had been familiar in his childhood. But of late, as he remarked to Kenyon, a sort of strangeness had overgrown them, like clusters of dark shrubbery, so that he hardly recognized the places which he had known and loved so well. To the sculptor's eye, nevertheless, they were still rich with beauty. They were picturesque in that sweetly impressive way where wildness, in a long lapse of years, has crept over scenes that have been once adorned with the careful art and toil of man. And when man could do no more for them, time and nature came, and wrought hand in hand to bring them to a soft and venerable perfection. There grew the fig tree that had run wild and taken to wife the vine, which likewise had gone rampant out of all human control, so that the two wild things had tangled and knotted themselves into a wild marriage bond, and hung their various progeny, the luscious figs, the grapes, oozy with the southern juice, and both endowed with a wild flavor that added the final charm, on the same bough together. In Kenyon's opinion, never was any other nook so lovely as a certain little dell which he and Donatello visited. It was hollowed in among the hills, and opened to a glimpse of the broad, fertile valley. A fountain had its birth here, and fell into a marble basin, which was all covered with moss and shaggy with water-weeds. Over the gush of the small stream, with an urn in her arms, stood a marble nymph, whose nakedness the moss had kindly clothed as with a garment, and the long trails and tresses of the maidenhair had done what they could in the poor thing's behalf by hanging themselves about her waist. In former days, it might be a remote antiquity, this lady of the fountain had first received the infant tied into her urn and poured it thence into the marble basin. But now the sculptured urn had a great crack from top to bottom, and the discontented nymph was compelled to see the basin fill itself through a channel which she could not control, although with water long ago consecrated to her. For this reason, or some other, she looked terribly forlorn, and you might have fancied that the whole fountain was but the overflow of her lonely tears. "'This was a place that I used greatly to delight in,' remarked Donatello, sighing. "'As a child and as a boy, I have been very happy here.' "'And as a man, I should ask no fitter place to be happy in,' answered Kenyon. "'But you, my friend, are of such a social nature, that I should hardly have thought these lonely haunts would take your fancy. It is a place for a poet to dream in and people it with the beings of his imagination. "'I am no poet that I know of,' said Donatello. "'But yet, as I tell you, I have been very happy here, in the company of this fountain and this nymph. It is said that a fawn, my oldest forefather, brought home hither to this very spot a human maiden, whom he loved and wedded. This spring of delicious water was their household well.' "'It is a most enchanting fable,' exclaimed Kenyon. "'That is, if it be not a fact.' "'And why not a fact?' said the simple Donatello. "'There is likewise another sweet old story connected with this spot. "'But now that I remember it, it seems to me more sad than sweet, "'though formerly the sorrow in which it closes did not so much impress me. "'If I had the gift of tale-telling, this one would be sure to interest you mightily.' "'Pray tell it,' said Kenyon. No matter whether well or ill, these legends have often the most powerful charm when least artfully told. So the young Count narrated a myth of one of his progenitors. He might have lived a century ago, or a thousand years, or before the Christian epoch, for anything that Donatello knew to the contrary, who had made acquaintance with a fair creature belonging to this fountain. Whether woman or sprite was a mystery, as was all else about her, except that her life and soul were somehow interfused throughout the gushing water. She was a fresh, cool, dewy thing, sunny and shadowy, full of pleasant little mischiefs, fitful and changeable with the whim of the moment, but yet as constant as her native stream, which kept the same gush and flow forever, while marble crumbled over and around it. The fountain woman loved the youth, a knight, as Donatello called him, for according to the legend, his race was akin to hers. At least, whether kin or no, 
there had been friendship and sympathy of old betwixt an ancestor of his with furry ears and the long-lived lady of the fountain and after all those ages she was still as young as a may morning and as frolicsome as a bird upon a tree or a breeze that makes merry with the leaves she taught him how to call her from her pebbly source and they spent many a happy hour together more especially in the fervour of the summer days for often as he sat waiting for her by the margin of the spring she would suddenly fall down around him in a shower of sunny raindrops with a rainbow glancing through them and forthwith gather herself up into the likeness of a beautiful girl laughing or was it the warble of the rill over the pebbles to see the youth's amazement thus kind maiden that she was the hot atmosphere became deliciously cool and fragrant for this favoured night and furthermore when he knelt down to drink out of the spring nothing was more common than for a pair of rosy lips to come up out of its little depths and touch his mouth with the thrill of a sweet cool dewy kiss it is a delightful story for the hot noon of our tuscan summer observed the sculptor at this point but the deportment of the watery lady must have had a most chilling influence in midwinter her lover would find it very literally a cold reception i suppose said donatello rather sulkily you are making fun of the story but i see nothing laughable in the thing itself nor in what you say about it he went on to relate that for a long while the knight found infinite pleasure and comfort in the friendship of the fountain nymph in his merriest hours she gladdened him with her sport of humour if ever he was annoyed with earthly trouble she laid her moist hand upon his brow and charmed the fret and fever quite away but one day one fatal noontide the young knight came rushing with hasty and irregular steps to the accustomed fountain he called the nymph but no doubt because there was something unusual and frightful in his tone she did not appear nor answer him he flung himself down and washed his hands and bathed his feverish brow in the cool pure water and then there was a sound of woe it might have been a woman's voice it might have been only the sighing of the brook over the pebbles the water shrank away from the youth's hands and left his brow as dry and feverish as before donatello here came to a dead pause why did the water shrink from this unhappy night inquired the sculptor because he had tried to wash off a blood-stain said the young count in a horror-stricken whisper the guilty man had polluted the pure water the nymph might have comforted him in sorrow but could not cleanse his conscience of a crime and did he never behold her more asked kenyon never but once replied his friend he never beheld her blessed face but once again and then there was a blood-stain on the poor nymph's brow it was the stain his guilt had left in the fountain where he tried to wash it off he mourned for her his whole life long and employed the best sculptor of the time to carve this statue of the nymph from his description of her aspect but though my ancestor would fain have had the image wear her happiest look the artist unlike yourself was so impressed with the mournfulness of the story that in spite of his best efforts he made her forlorn and forever weeping as you see kenyon found a certain charm in this simple legend whether so intended or not he understood it as an apologue typifying the soothing and genial effects of an habitual intercourse with nature in all ordinary cares and griefs while on the other hand her mild influences fall short in their effect upon the ruder passions and are altogether powerless in the dread fever fit or deadly chill of guilt do you say he asked that the nymph's face has never since been shown to any mortal methinks you by your native qualities are as well entitled to her favour as ever your progenitor could have been why have you not summoned her i called her often when i was a silly child answered donatello and he added in an inward voice thank heaven she did not come then you never saw her said the sculptor never in my life rejoined the count no my dear friend i have not seen the nymph although here by her fountain i used to make many strange acquaintances for from my earliest childhood i was familiar with whatever creatures haunt the woods you would have laughed to see the friends i had among them yes among the wild nimble things that reckon man their deadliest enemy how it was first taught me i cannot tell but there was a charm a voice a murmur a kind of chant by which i called the woodland inhabitants the furry people and the feathered people 
in a language that they seemed to understand. "'I have heard of such a gift,' responded the sculptor gravely, "'but never before met with a person endowed with it. "'Pray try the charm, and lest I should frighten your friends away, "'I will withdraw into this thicket and merely peep at them.' "'I doubt,' said Donatello, "'whether they will remember my voice now. "'It changes, you know, as the boy grows toward manhood.' Nevertheless, as the young Count's good nature and easy persuadability were among his best characteristics, he set about complying with Kenyon's request. The latter, in his concealment among the shrubberies, heard him send forth a sort of modulated breath, wild, rude, yet harmonious. It struck the auditor as at once the strangest and the most natural utterance that had ever reached his ears. Any idle boy, it should seem, singing to himself and setting his wordless song to no other or more definite tune than the play of his own pulses, might produce a sound almost identical with this. And yet it was as individual as a murmur of the breeze. Donatello tried it over and over again, with many breaks at first, and pauses of uncertainty, then with more confidence and a fuller swell, like a wayfarer, groping out of obscurity into the light and moving with freer footsteps as it brightens around him. Anon his voice appeared to fill the air, yet not with an obtrusive clangor. The sound was of a murmurous character, soft, attractive, persuasive, friendly. The sculptor fancied that such might have been the original voice and utterance of the natural man, before the sophistication of the human intellect formed what we now call language. In this broad dialect, broad as the sympathies of nature, the human brother might have spoken to his inarticulate brotherhood, that prowl the woods, or soar upon the wing, and have been intelligible to such extent as to win their confidence. The sound had its pathos, too. At some of its simple cadences, the tears came quietly into Kenyon's eyes. They welled up slowly from his heart, which was thrilling with an emotion more delightful than he had often felt before, but which he forbore to analyze, lest, if he seized it, it should at once perish in his grasp. Donatello paused two or three times, and seemed to listen. Then recommencing, he poured his spirit and life more earnestly into the strain. And finally, or else the sculptor's hope and imagination deceived him, soft treads were audible among the fallen leaves. There was a rustling among the shrubbery, a whir of wings, moreover, that hovered in the air. It may have been all an illusion, but Kenyon fancied that he could distinguish the stealthy, cat-like movement of some small forest citizen and that he could even see its doubtful shadow, if not really its substance. But all at once, whatever might be the reason, there ensued a hurried rush and scamper of little feet, and then the sculptor heard a wild, sorrowful cry, and through the crevices of the thicket beheld Donatello fling himself on the ground. Emerging from his hiding-place, he saw no living thing, save a brown lizard, it was of the tarantula species, rustling away through the sunshine. To all present appearance, this venomous reptile was the only creature that had responded to the young Count's efforts to renew his intercourse with the lower orders of nature. "'What has happened to you?' exclaimed Kenyon, stooping down over his friend and wondering at the anguish which he betrayed. "'Death! Death!' sobbed Donatello. "'They know it!' He growled beside the fountain, in a fit of such passionate sobbing and weeping, that it seemed as if his heart had broken and spilt its wild sorrows upon the ground. His unrestrained grief and childish tears made Kenyon sensible in how small a degree the customs and restraints of society had really acted upon this young man, in spite of the quietude of his ordinary deportment. In response to his friend's efforts to console him, he murmured words hardly more articulate than the strange chant which he had so recently been breathing into the air. "'They know it!' was all that Kenyon could yet distinguish. "'They know it!' "'Who know it?' asked the sculptor, and what is it they know? They know it, replied Donatello, trembling. They shun me. All nature shrinks from me and shudders at me. I live in the midst of a curse that hems me round with a circle of fire. No innocent thing can come near me. Be comforted, my dear friend, said Kenyon, kneeling beside him. You labor under some illusion, but no curse. As for this strange natural spell, which you have been exercising, and of which I have heard before, though I never believed in, nor expected to witness it. I am satisfied that you still possess it. It was my own half-concealed presence, no doubt, 
and some involuntary little movement of mine that scared away your forest friends. They are friends of mine no longer, answered Donatello. We all of us, as we grow older, rejoined Kenyon, lose somewhat of our proximity to nature. It is the price we pay for experience. A heavy price, then, said Donatello, rising from the ground. But we will speak no more of it. Forget this scene, my dear friend. In your eyes it must look very absurd. It is a grief, I presume, to all men, to find the pleasant privileges and properties of early life departing from them. That grief has now befallen me. Well, I shall waste no more tears for such a cause. Nothing else made Kenyon so sensible of a change in Donatello as his newly acquired power of dealing with his own emotions. And after a struggle, more or less fierce, thrusting them down into the prison cells, where he usually kept them confined. The restraint which he now put upon himself, and the mask of dull composure which he succeeded in clasping over his still beautiful and once fawn-like face, affected the sensitive sculptor more sadly than even the unrestrained passion of the preceding scene. It is a very miserable epoch, when the evil necessities of life in our torturous world first get the better of us so far as to compel us to attempt throwing a cloud over our transparency. Simplicity increases in value the longer we can keep it, and the further we carry it onward into life. The loss of a child's simplicity, in the inevitable lapse of years, causes but a natural sigh or two, because even his mother feared that he could not keep it always. But after a young man has brought it through his childhood, and has still worn it in his bosom, not as an early dewdrop, but as a diamond of pure white luster. It is a pity to lose it, then. And thus when Kenyon saw how much his friend had now to hide, and how well he hid it, he would have wept, although his tears would have been even idler than those which Donatello had just shed. They parted on the lawn before the house, the Count to climb his tower, and the sculptor to read the antique edition of Dante, which he had found among some old volumes of Catholic devotion in a seldom-visited room. Tommaso met him in the entrance hall, and showed a desire to speak. "'Our poor signorino looks very sad to-day,' he said. "'Even so, good Tommaso,' replied the sculptor. "'Would that we could raise his spirits a little.' "'There might be means, signore,' answered the old butler, "'if one might but be sure that they were the right ones. "'We men are but rough nurses for a sick body or a sick spirit.' "'Women, you would say, my good friend, are better.' said the sculptor, struck by an intelligence in the butler's face. That is possible, but it depends. Ah, we will wait a little longer, said Tommaso, with the customary shake of his head. End of chapter 27 of volume 2Please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2, Chapter 28, The Owl Tower. "'Will you not show me your tower?' said the sculptor one day to his friend. "'It is plainly enough to be seen, methinks,' answered the Count, with a kind of sulkiness that often appeared in him as one of the little symptoms of inward trouble. "'Yes, its exterior is visible far and wide,' said Kenyon. "'But such a grey, moss-grown tower as this—' however valuable as an object of scenery, will certainly be quite as interesting inside as out. It cannot be less than six hundred years old. The foundations and lower story are much older than that, I should judge, and traditions probably cling to the walls within quite as plentifully as the grey and yellow lichens cluster on its face without. No doubt, replied Donatello, but I know little of such things, and never could comprehend the interest which some of you forestieri take in them. A year or two ago, an English signore, with a venerable white beard, they say he was a magician, too, came hither from as far off as Florence, just to see my tower. "'Ah, I have seen him at Florence,' observed Kenyon. "'He is a necromancer, as you say, and dwells in an old mansion of the Knights Templars, close by the Ponte Vecchio, with a great many ghostly books, pictures, and antiquities, to make the house gloomy, and one bright-eyed little girl to keep it cheerful.' "'I know him only by his white beard,' said Donatello. "'But he could have told you a great deal about the tower, "'and the sieges which it has stood, "'and the prisoners who have been confined in it. "'And he gathered up all the traditions of the Montebene family, 
and among the rest the sad one which I told you at the fountain the other day. He had known mighty poets, he said, in his earlier life, and the most illustrious of them would have rejoiced to preserve such a legend in a mortal rhyme, especially if he could have had some of our wine of sunshine to help out his inspiration. Any man might be a poet, as well as Byron, with such wine and such a theme, rejoined the sculptor. But shall we climb your tower? The thunderstorm gathering yonder among the hills will be a spectacle worth witnessing. Come, then, said the Count, adding with a sigh, it has a weary staircase in dismal chambers, and it is very lonesome at the summit. Like a man's life when he has climbed to eminence, remarked the sculptor, or let us rather say, with its difficult steps and the dark prison cells you speak of, your tower resembles the spiritual experience of many a sinful soul, which nevertheless may struggle upward into the pure air and light of heaven at last. Donatello sighed again, and led the way up into the tower. Mounting the broad staircase that ascended from the entrance hall, they traversed the great wilderness of a house, through some obscure passages, and came to a low ancient doorway. It admitted them to a narrow turret stair, which zigzagged upward, lighted in its progress by loopholes and iron-barred windows. Reaching the top of the first flight, the Count threw open a door of worm-eaten oak, and disclosed a chamber that occupied the whole area of the tower. It was most pitiably forlorn of aspect, with a brick-paved floor, bare holes through the massive walls, grated with iron, instead of windows, and for furniture an old stool, which increased the dreariness of the place tenfold, by suggesting an idea of its having once been tenanted. "'This was a prisoner's cell in the old days,' said Donatello. "'The white-bearded necromancer, of whom I told you, found out that a certain famous monk was confined here about five hundred years ago. He was a very holy man, and was afterwards burned at the stake in the Grand Ducal Square at Firenze. There have always been stories, Tommaso says, of a hooded monk creeping up and down these stairs, or standing in the doorway of this chamber. It must needs be the ghost of the ancient prisoner. Do you believe in ghosts? I can hardly tell, replied Kenyon. On the whole, I think not. Neither do I, responded the Count. For if spirits ever come back, I should surely have met one within these two months past. Ghosts never rise. So much I know, and am glad to know it. Following the narrow staircase still higher, they came to another room of similar size, and equally forlorn, but inhabited by two personages of a race, which from time immemorial have held proprietorship and occupancy in ruined towers. These were a pair of owls, who, being doubtless acquainted with Donatello, showed little sign of alarm at the entrance of visitors. They gave a dismal croak or two, and hopped aside into the darkest corner, since it was not yet their hour to flap duskily abroad. "'They do not desert me, like my other feathered acquaintances,' observed the young Count, with a sad smile, alluding to the scene which Kenyon had witnessed at the fountain-side. "'When I was a wild, playful boy, the owls did not love me half so well.' He made no further pause here, but led his friend up another flight of steps, while at every stage the windows and narrow loopholes afforded Kenyon more extensive eye-shots over hill and valley and allowed him to taste the cool purity of mid-atmosphere. At length they reached the topmost chamber, directly beneath the roof of the tower. "'This is my own abode,' said Donatello, "'my own owl's nest.' In fact, the room was fitted up as a bedchamber, though in a style of the utmost simplicity. It likewise served as an oratory, there being a crucifix in one corner, and a multitude of holy emblems, such as Catholics judge it necessary to help their devotion withal. Several ugly little prints, representing the sufferings of the Saviour, and the martyrdoms of saints, hung on the wall, and behind the crucifix there was a good copy of Titian's Magdalene of the Pity Palace, clad only in the flow of her golden ringlets. She had a confident look, but it was Titian's fault, not the penitent woman's, as if expecting to win heaven by the free display of her earthly charms. Inside of a glass case appeared an image of the sacred bambino in the guise of a little waxen boy very prettily made up reclining among flowers like a cupid and holding up a heart that resembled a bit of red sealing wax a small vase of precious marble was full of holy water beneath the crucifix on a table lay a human skull which looked as if it might have been dug up out of some old grave but examining it more closely kenyon saw that it was carved in grey alabaster 
most skilfully done to the death, with accurate imitation of the teeth, the sutures, the empty eye-caverns, and the fragile little bones of the nose. This hideous emblem rested on a cushion of white marble, so nicely wrought that you seemed to see the impression of the heavy skull in a silken and downy substance. Donatello dipped his fingers into the holy water vase, and crossed himself. After doing so, he trembled. "'I have no right to make the sacred symbol on a sinful breast,' he said. "'On what mortal breast can it be made, then?' asked the sculptor. "'Is there one that hides no sin?' "'But these blessed emblems make you smile, I fear,' resumed the Count, looking askance at his friend. "'You heretics, I know, attempt to pray without even a crucifix to kneel at. "'I, at least, whom you call a heretic, reverence that holy symbol,' answered Kenyon. What I am most inclined to murmur at is this death's head. I could laugh, moreover, in its ugly face. It is absurdly monstrous, my dear friend, thus to fling the dead weight of our mortality upon our immortal hopes. While we live on earth, tis true we must needs carry our skeletons about with us. But for heaven's sake, do not let us burden our spirits with them, in our feeble efforts to soar upward. Believe me, it will change the whole aspect of death, if you can once disconnect it in your idea with that corruption from which it disengages our higher part. "'I do not well understand you,' said Donatello, and he took up the alabaster skull, shuddering and evidently feeling a kind of penance to touch it. "'I only know that this skull has been in my family for centuries. Old Tommaso has a story that it was copied by a famous sculptor from the skull of that same unhappy knight who loved the fountain lady and lost her by a bloodstain. He lived and died with a deep sense of sin upon him, and on his deathbed, he ordained that this token of him should go down to his posterity. And my forefathers, being a cheerful race of men in their natural disposition, found it needful to have the skull often before their eyes, because they dearly loved life and its enjoyments, and hated the very thought of death. I am afraid, said Kenyon, they liked it none the better, for seeing its face under this abominable mask. Without further discussion, the Count led the way up one more flight of stairs, at the end of which they emerged upon the summit of the tower. The sculptor felt as if his being were suddenly magnified a hundredfold. So wide was the Umbrian valley, that suddenly opened before him, set in its grand framework of nearer and more distant hills. It seemed as if all Italy lay under his eyes in that one picture, for there was the broad, sunny smile of God, which we fancy to be spread over that favoured land more abundantly than on other regions and beneath it glowed a most rich and varied fertility. The trim vineyards were there, and the fig-trees, and the mulberries, and the smoky-hued tracks of the olive-orchards. There, too, were fields of every kind of grain, among which waved the Indian corn, putting Kenyon in mind of the fondly remembered acres of his father's homestead. White villas, grey convents, church spires, villages, towns, each with its battlemented walls and towered gateway, were scattered upon this spacious map, a river gleamed across it, and lakes opened their blue eyes in its face, reflecting heaven, lest mortals should forget that better land when they beheld the earth so beautiful. What made the valley look still wider was the two or three varieties of weather that were visible on its surface, all at the same instant of time. Here lay the quiet sunshine, there fell the great black patches of ominous shadow from the clouds, and behind them, like a giant of league-long strides, came hurrying, the thunderstorm which had already swept midway across the plain. In the rear of the approaching tempest brightened forth again the sunny splendor, which its progress had darkened with so terrible a frown. All round this majestic landscape the bald peaked or forest-crowned mountains descended boldly upon the plain. On many of their spurs in midway declivities, and even on their summits, stood cities, some of them famous of old, for these had been the seats and nurseries of early art where the flower of beauty sprang out of a rocky soil, and in a high, keen atmosphere, when the richest and most sheltered gardens failed to nourish it. "'Thank God for letting me again behold this scene,' said the sculptor, a devout man in his way, reverently taking off his hat. "'I have viewed it from many points, and never without as full a sensation of gratitude as my heart seems capable of feeling, how it strengthens the poor human spirit in its reliance on his providence.' to ascend but this little way above the common level, and so attain a somewhat wider glimpse of his dealings with mankind. He doeth all things right. His will be done. You discern something that is hidden from me, observed Donatello, gloomily, yet striving with unwanted grasp, 
to catch the analogies which so cheered his friend. I see sunshine in one spot and cloud in another, and no reason for it in either case. The sun on you, the cloud on me. What comfort can I draw from this? Nay, I cannot preach, said Kenyon, with a page of heaven and a page of earth spread wide open before us. Only begin to read it, and you will find it interpreting itself without the aid of words. It is a great mistake to try to put our best thoughts into human language. When we ascend into the higher regions of emotion and spiritual enjoyment, they are only expressible by such grand hieroglyphics as these around us. They stood a while, contemplating the scene, but as inevitably happens after a spiritual flight, it was not long before the sculptor felt his wings flagging in the rarity of the upper atmosphere. He was glad to let himself quietly downward, out of the mid-sky, as it were, and alight on the solid platform of the battlemented tower. He looked about him, and beheld growing out of the stone pavement, which formed the roof, a little shrub with green and glossy leaves. It was the only green thing there, and heaven knows how its seeds had ever been planted at that airy height or how it had found nourishment for its small life in the chinks of the stones. For it had no earth, and nothing more like soil than the crumbling mortar, which had been crammed into the crevices in a long past age. Yet the plant seemed fond of its native site, and Donatello said it had always grown there, from his earliest remembrance, and never, he believed, any smaller or any larger than they saw it now. I wonder if the shrub teaches you any good lesson said he, observing the interest with which Kenyon examined it. If the wide valley has a great meaning, the plant ought to have at least a little one. And it has been growing on our tower long enough to have learned how to speak it. Oh, certainly, answered the sculptor. The shrub has its moral, or it would have perished long ago. And no doubt it is for your use and edification, since you have had it before your eyes all your lifetime. And now we're moved to ask what may be its lesson. It teaches me nothing said the simple Donatello, stooping over the plant, and perplexing himself with a minute scrutiny. But here was a worm that would have killed it, an ugly creature, which I will fling over the battlements. End of chapter 28 of Volume 2フォーモーインフォーメーションオーツォランティアプリスヴィシットリブリボックスドットオーグリーディングバイラシュ・ロランダー The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 2 Chapter 29 On the Battlements The sculptor now looked through art embrasure and threw down a bit of lime, watching its fall till it struck upon a stone bench at the rocky foundation of the tower and flew into many fragments. "'Pray pardon me for helping time to crumble away your ancestral walls,' said he. "'But I am one of those persons who have a natural tendency to climb heights, and to stand on the verge of them measuring the depth below. If I were to do just as I like at this moment, I should fling myself down after that bit of lime. It is a very singular temptation, and all but irresistible.' partly, I believe, because it might be so easily done, and partly because such momentous consequences would ensue without my being compelled to wait a moment for them. Have you never felt this strange impulse of an evil spirit at your back, showing you towards a precipice? Ah, no! cried Donatello, shrinking from the battlemented wall with a face of horror. I cling to life in a way which you cannot conceive. It has been so rich, so warm, so sunny, and beyond its verge nothing but the chilly dark. And then a fall from a precipice is such an awful death. Nay, if it be a great height, said Kenyon, a man would leave his life in the air, and never feel the hard shock at the bottom. That is not the way with this kind of death exclaimed Donatello in a low, horror-stricken voice, which grew higher and more full of emotion as he proceeded. Imagine a fellow creature, breathing now and looking you in the face, and now tumbling down, 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 with a long shriek wavering after him all the way. He does not leave his life in the air, no, but it keeps in him till he thumps against the stones 
a horrible long while then he lies there frightfully quiet a dead heap of bruised flesh and broken bones a quiver runs through the crushed mass and no more movement after that no not if you would give your soul to make him stir a finger ah terrible yes yes i would fain fling myself down for the very dread of it that i might endure it once for all and dream of it no more how forcibly how frightfully you conceive this said the sculptor aghast at the passionate horror which was betrayed in the count's words and still more in his wild gestures and ghastly look nay if the height of your tower affects your imagination thus you do wrong to trust yourself here in solitude and in the night-time and at all unguarded hours you are not safe in your chamber it is but a step or two and what if a vivid dream should lead you up hither at midnight and act itself out as a reality donatello had hidden his face in his hands and was leaning against the parapet no fear of that said he whatever the dream may be i am too genuine a coward to act out my own death in it the paroxysm passed away and the two friends continued their desultory talk very much as if no such interruption had occurred nevertheless it affected the sculptor with infinite pity to see this young man who had been born to gladness as an assured heritage now involved in a misty bewilderment of grievous thoughts amid which he seemed to go staggering blindfold kenyon not without an unshaped suspicion of the definite fact knew that his condition must have resulted from the weight and gloom of life now first through the agency of a secret trouble making themselves felt on a character that had heretofore breathed only an atmosphere of joy the effect of this hard lesson upon donatello's intellect and disposition was very striking it was perceptible that he had already had glimpses of strange and subtle matters in those dark caverns into which all men must descend if they would know anything beneath the surface and elusive pleasures of existence and when they emerge though dazzled and blinded by the first glare of daylight they take truer and sadder views of life for ever afterwards from some mysterious source as the sculptor felt assured a soul had been inspired into the young count's simplicity since their intercourse in rome he now showed a far deeper sense and an intelligence that began to deal with high subjects though in a feeble and childish way he evinced too a more definite and nobler individuality but developed out of grief and pain and fearfully conscious of the pangs that had given it birth every human life if it descends to truth or delves down to reality must undergo a similar change but sometimes perhaps the instruction comes without the sorrow and oftener the sorrow teaches no lesson that abides with us in donatello's case it was pitiful and almost ludicrous to observe the confused struggle that he made how completely he was taken by surprise how ill-prepared he stood on this old battlefield of the world to fight with such an inevitable foe as mortal calamity and sin for its stronger ally and yet thought kenyon the poor fellow bears himself like a hero too if he would only tell me his trouble or give me an opening to speak frankly about it i might help him but he finds it too horrible to be uttered and fancies himself the only mortal that ever felt the anguish of remorse yes he believes that nobody ever endured his agony before so that sharp enough in itself it has all the additional zest of a torture just invented to plague him individually the sculptor endeavoured to dismiss the painful subject from his mind and leaning against the battlements he turned his face southward and westward and gazed across the breadth of the valley his thoughts flew far beyond even those wide boundaries taking an airline from donatello's tower to
to another turret that ascended into the sky of the summer afternoon invisibly to him above the roofs of distant rome then rose tumultuously into his consciousness that strong love for hilda which it was his habit to confine in one of the heart's inner chambers because he had found no encouragement to bring it forward but now he felt a strange pull at his heart-strings it could not have been more perceptible if all the way between these battlements and hilda's dovecot had stretched an exquisitely sensitive cord which at the hither end was knotted with his aforesaid heart-strings and at the remoter one was grasped by a gentle hand his breath grew tremulous he put his hand to his breast so distinctly did he seem to feel that cord drawn once and again and again as if though still it was bashfully intimated there were an importunate demand for his presence oh for the white wings of hilda's doves that he might have flown thither and alighted at the virgin's shrine but lovers and kenyon knew it well projected so lifelike a copy of their mistresses out of their own imaginations that it can pull at the heart-strings almost as perceptibly as the genuine original no airy intimations are to be trusted no evidences of responsive affection less positive than whispered and broken words or tender pressures of the hand allowed and half returned or glances that distill many passionate avowals into one gleam of richly coloured light even those should be weighed rigorously at the instant for in another instant the imagination seizes on them as its property and stamps them with its own arbitrary value but hilda's maidenly reserve had given her lover no such tokens to be interpreted either by his hopes or fears yonder over mountain and valley lies rome said the sculptor shall you return thither in the autumn never i hate rome answered donatello and have good cause and yet it was a pleasant winter that we spent there observed kenyon and with pleasant friends about us you would meet them again there all of them all asked donatello all to the best of my belief said the sculptor but you need not go to rome to seek them if there were one of those friends whose lifetime was twisted with your own i am enough of a fatalist to feel assured that you will meet that one again wonder whither you may neither can we escape the companions whom providence assigns for us by climbing an old tower like this yet the stairs are steep and dark rejoined the count none but yourself would seek me here or find me if they sought as donatello did not take advantage of this opening which his friend had kindly afforded him to pour out his hidden troubles the latter again threw aside the subject and returned to the enjoyment of the scene before him the thunderstorm which he had beheld striding across the valley had passed to the left of monte beni and was continuing its march towards the hills that formed the boundary on the eastward above the whole valley indeed the sky was heavy with tumbling vapours interspersed with which were tracts of blue vividly brightened by the sun but in the east where the tempest was yet trailing its ragged skirts lay a dusky region of cloud and sullen mist in which some of the hills appeared of a dark purple hue others became so indistinct that the spectator could not tell rocky height from impalpable cloud far into this misty cloud region however within the domain of chaos as it were hilltops were seen brightening in the sunshine they looked like fragments of the world broken adrift and based on nothingness or like portions of a sphere destined to exist but not yet finally compacted the sculptor habitually drawing many of the images and illustrations of his thoughts from the plastic art fancied that the scene represented the process of the creator when he held the new imperfect earth in his hand and modelled it what a magic is in mist and vapour among the mountains he exclaimed 
with their help one single scene becomes a thousand the cloud scenery gives such variety to a hilly landscape that it would be worth while to journalize its aspect from hour to hour a cloud however as i have myself experienced is apt to grow solid and as heavy as a stone the instant that you take in hand to describe it but in my own heart i have found great use in clouds such silvery ones as those to the northward for example have often suggested sculpturesque groups figures and attitudes they are especially rich in attitudes of living repose which a sculptor only hits upon by the rarest good fortune when i go back to my dear native land the clouds along the horizon will be my only gallery of art i can see cloud shapes too said donatello yonder is one that shifts strangely it has been like people whom i knew and now if i watch it a little longer it will take the figure of a monk reclining with his cowl about his head and drawn partly over his face and well did i not tell you so i think remarked kenyon we can hardly be gazing at the same cloud what i behold is a reclining figure to be sure but feminine and with a despondent air wonderfully well expressed in the wavering outline from head to foot it moves my very heart by something indefinable that it suggests i see the figure and almost the face said the count adding in a lower voice it is miriam's no not miriam's answered the sculptor while the two gazers thus found their own reminiscences and presentiments floating among the clouds the day drew to its close and now showed them the fair spectacle of an italian sunset the sky was soft and bright but not so gorgeous as kenyon had seen it a thousand times in america for there the western sky is wont to be set aflame with breadths and depths of colour with which poets seek in vain to dye their verses and which painters never dare to copy as beheld from the tower of monte beni the scene was tenderly magnificent with mild gradations of hue and a lavish outpouring of gold but rather such gold as we see on the leaf of a bright flower than the burnished glow of metal from the mine or if metallic it looked airy and unsubstantial like the glorified dreams of an alchemist and speedily more speedily than in our own clime came the twilight and brightening through its great transparency the stars a swarm of minute insects that had been hovering all day round the battlements were now swept away by the freshness of a rising breeze the two owls in the chamber beneath donatello's uttered their soft melancholy cry which with national avoidance of harsh sounds italian owls substitute for the hoot of their kindred in other countries and flew darkling forth among the shrubbery a convent bell rang out near at hand and was not only echoed among the hills but answered by another bell and still another which doubtless had farther and farther responses at various distances along the valley for like the english drum beat around the globe there is a chain of convent bells from end to end and crosswise and in all possible directions over priest-ridden italy come said the sculptor the evening air grows cool it is time to descend time for you my friend replied the count and he hesitated a little before adding i must keep a vigil here for some hours longer it is my frequent custom to keep vigils and sometimes the thought occurs to me whether it were not better to keep them in yonder convent the bell of which just now seemed to summon me should i do wisely do you think to exchange this old tower for a cell what turn monk exclaimed his friend a horrible idea true said donatello sighing therefore if at all i purpose doing it then think of it no more for heaven's sake cried the sculptor there are a thousand better and more poignant methods of being miserable than that if to be miserable is what you wish 
nay i question whether a monk keeps himself up to the intellectual and spiritual height which misery implies a monk i judge from their sensual physiognomies which meet me at every turn is inevitably a beast their souls if they have any to begin with perish out of them before their sluggish swinish existence is half done better a million times to stand star-gazing on these airy battlements than to smother your new germ of a higher life in a monkish cell you make me tremble said donatello by your bold aspersion of men who have devoted themselves to god's service they serve neither god nor man and themselves least of all though their motives be utterly selfish replied kenyon avoid the convent my dear friend as you would shun the death of the soul but for my own part if i had an insupportable burden if for any case i were bent upon sacrificing every earthly hope as a peace offering towards heaven i would make the wide world my cell and good deeds to mankind my prayer many penitent men have done this and found peace in it ah but you are a heretic said the count yet his face brightened beneath the stars and looking at it through the twilight the sculptor's remembrance went back to that scene in the capitol where both in features and expression donatello had seemed identical with the form and still there was a resemblance for now when first the idea was suggested of living for the welfare of his fellow-creatures the original beauty which sorrow had partly effaced came back elevated and spiritualized in the black depths the fawn had found a soul and was struggling with it towards the light of heaven the illumination it is true soon faded out of donatello's face the idea of lifelong and unselfish effort was too high to be received by him with more than a momentary comprehension an italian indeed seldom dreams of being philanthropic except in bestowing alms among the paupers who appeal to his beneficence at every step nor does it occur to him that there are fitter modes of propitiating heaven than by penances pilgrimages and offerings at shrines perhaps too their system has its share of moral advantages they at all events cannot well pride themselves as our own more energetic benevolence is apt to do upon sharing in the counsels of providence and kindly helping out its otherwise impracticable designs and now the broad valley twinkled with lights that glimmered through its duskiness like the fireflies in the garden of a florentine palace a gleam of lightning from the rear of the tempest showed the circumference of hills and the great space between as the last cannon flash of a retreating army reddens across the field where it has fought the sculptor was on the point of descending the turret stair when somewhere in the darkness that lay beneath them a woman's voice was heard singing a low sad strain hark said he laying his hand on donatello's arm and donatello had said hark at the same instant the song if you song it could be called that had only a wild rhythm and flowed forth in the fitful measure of a wind harp did not clothe itself in the sharp brilliancy of the italian tongue the words so far as they could be distinguished were german and therefore unintelligible to the count and hardly less so to the sculptor being softened and molten as it were into the melancholy richness of the voice that sang them it was as the murmur of a soul bewildered amid the sinful gloom of earth and retaining only enough memory of a better state to make sad music of the wail which would else have been a despairing shriek never was there profounder pathos than breathed through that mysterious voice it brought the tears into the sculptor's eyes with remembrances and forebodings of whatever sorrow he had felt or apprehended it made donatello sob as chiming in with the anguish that he found unutterable and giving it the expression which he vaguely sought but when the emotion was at its profoundest depth 
the voice rose out of it yet so gradually that a gloom seemed to pervade it far upward from the abyss and not entirely to fall away as it ascended into a higher and purer region at last the auditors would have fancied that the melody with its rich sweetness all there and much of its sorrow gone was floating around the very summit of the tower donatello said the sculptor when there was silence again had that voice no message for your ear i dare not receive it said donatello the anguish of which it spoke abides with me the hope dies away with the breath that brought it hither it is not good for me to hear that voice the sculptor sighed and left the poor penitent keeping his vigil on the tower End of chapter 29, volume 2, read by Lars Rolander. Volume 2, chapter 30 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Volume Two, Chapter Thirty. Donatello's Bust. Kenyon, it will be remembered, had asked Donatello's permission to model his bust. The work had now made considerable progress and necessarily kept the sculptor's thoughts brooding much and often upon his host's personal characteristics these it was his difficult office to bring out from their depths and interpret them to all men showing them what they could not discern for themselves yet must be compelled to recognize at a glance on the surface of a block of marble he had never undertaken a portrait bust which gave him so much trouble as donatello's not that there was any special difficulty in hitting the likeness though even in this respect the grace and harmony of the features seemed inconsistent with the prominent expression of individuality but he was chiefly perplexed how to make this genial and kind type of countenance the index of the mind within his acuteness and his sympathies indeed were both somewhat at fault in their efforts to enlighten him as to the moral phase through which the count was now passing if at one sitting he caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a genuine and permanent trait it would probably be less perceptible on a second occasion and perhaps have vanished entirely at a third so evanescent a show of character threw the sculptor into despair not marble or clay but cloud and vapour was the material in which it ought to be represented even the ponderous depression which constantly weighed upon donatello's heart could not compel him into the kind of repose which the plastic art requires hopeless of a good result kenyon gave up all preconceptions about the character of his subject and let his hands work uncontrolled with the clay somewhat as a spiritual medium while holding a pen yields it to an unseen guidance other than that of her own will now and then he fancied that this plan was destined to be the successful one a skill and insight beyond his consciousness seemed occasionally to take up the task the mystery the miracle of imbuing an inanimate substance with thought feeling and all the intangible attributes of the soul appeared on the verge of being wrought and now as he flattered himself the true image of his friend was about to emerge from the facile material bringing with it more of donatello's character than the keenest observer could detect at any one moment in the face of the original vain expectation some touch whereby the artist thought to improve or hasten the result interfered with the design of his unseen spiritual assistant and spoilt the whole there was still the moist brown clay indeed and the features of donatello but without any semblance of intelligent and sympathetic life 
the difficulty will drive me mad i verily believe cried the sculptor nervously look at the wretched piece of work yourself my dear friend and tell me whether you recognize any manner of likeness to your inner man none replied donatello speaking the simple truth it is like looking a stranger in the face this frankly unfavorable testimony so wrought with the sensitive artist that he fell into a passion with the stubborn image and cared not what might happen to it thenceforward wielding that wonderful power which sculptors possess over moist clay however refractory it may show itself in certain respects he compressed elongated widened and otherwise altered the features of the bust in mere recklessness and at every change inquired of the count whether the expression became anywise more satisfactory stop cried donatello at last catching the sculptor's hand let it remain so by some accidental handling of the clay entirely independent of his own will kenyon had given the countenance a distorted and violent look combining animal fierceness with intelligent hatred had hilda or had miriam seen the bust with the expression which it had now assumed they might have recognized donatello's face as they beheld it at that terrible moment when he held his victim over the edge of the precipice what have i done said the sculptor shocked at his own casual production it were a sin to let the clay which bears your features harden into a look like that cain never wore an uglier one for that very reason let it remain answered the count who had grown pale as ashes at the aspect of his crime thus strangely presented to him in another of the many guises under which guilt stares the criminal in the face do not alter it chisel it rather in eternal marble i will set it up in my oratory and keep it continually before my eyes sadder and more horrible is a face like this alive with my own crime than the dead skull which my forefathers handed down to me but without in the least heeding donatello's remonstrances the sculptor again applied his artful fingers to the clay and compelled the bust to dismiss the expression that had so startled them both believe me said he turning his eyes upon his friend full of grave and tender sympathy you know not what is requisite for your spiritual growth seeking as you do to keep your soul perpetually in the unwholesome region of remorse it was needful for you to pass through that dark valley but it is infinitely dangerous to linger there too long there is poison in the atmosphere when we sit down and broad in it instead of girding up our loins to press onward not despondency not slothful anguish is what you now require but effort has there been an unalterable evil in your young life then crowd it out with good or it will lie corrupting there for ever and cause your capacity for better things to partake in noisome corruption you stir up many thoughts said donatello pressing his hand upon his brow but the multitude and the whirl of them make me dizzy they now left the sculptor's temporary studio without observing that his last accidental touches with which he hurriedly effaced the look of deadly rage had given the bust a higher and sweeter expression than it had hitherto worn it is to be regretted that kenyon had not seen it for only an artist perhaps can conceive the irksomeness the irritation of brain the depression of spirits that resulted from his failure to satisfy himself after so much toil and thought as he had bestowed on donatello's bust in case of success indeed all this thoughtful toil would have been reckoned not only as well bestowed but as among the happiest hours of his life whereas deeming himself to have failed it was just so much of life that had better never have been lived for thus does the good or ill result of his labor throw back sunshine or gloom upon the artist's mind the sculptor therefore would have done well to glance again at his work for here were still the features of the antique form 
but now illuminated with a higher meaning such as the old marble never bore donatello having quitted him kenyon spent the rest of the day strolling about the pleasant precincts of monte beni where the summer was now so far advanced that it began indeed to partake of the ripe wealth of autumn apricots had long been abundant and had passed away and plums and cherries along with them but now came great juicy pears melting and delicious and peaches of goodly size and tempting aspect though cold and watery to the palate compared with the sculptor's rich reminiscences of that fruit in america the purple figs had already enjoyed their day and the white ones were luscious now the contadini who by this time knew kenyon well found many clusters of ripe grapes for him in every little globe of which was included a fragrant draught of the sunny monte bene wine unexpectedly in a nook close by the farmhouse he happened upon a spot where the vintage had actually commenced a great heap of early ripened grapes had been gathered and thrown into a mighty tub in the middle of it stood a lusty and jolly contadino nor stood merely but stamped with all his might and danced amain while the red juice bathed his feet and threw its foam midway up his brown and shaggy legs here then was the very process that showed so picturesquely in scripture and in poetry of treading out the wine-press and dyeing the feet and garments with a crimson effusion as with the blood of a battlefield the memory of the process does not make the tuscan wine taste more deliciously the contadini hospitably offered kenyon a sample of the new liquor that had already stood fermenting for a day or two he had tried a similar draught however in a year past and was little inclined to make proof of it again for he knew that it would be a sour and bitter juice a wine of woe and tribulation and that the more a man drinks of such liquor the sorrier he is likely to be the scene reminded the sculptor of our new england vintages where the big piles of golden and rosy apples lie under the orchard trees in the mild autumn sunshine and the creaking cider mill set in motion by a circumgyratory horse is all a gush with the luscious use to speak frankly the cider making is the more picturesque sight of the two and the new sweet cider an infinitely better drink than the ordinary unripe tuscan wine such as it is however the latter fills thousands upon thousands of small flat barrels and still growing thinner and sharper loses the little life it had as wine and becomes apotheosized as a more praiseworthy vinegar yet all these vineyard scenes and the processes connected with the culture of the grape had a flavor of poetry about them the toil that produces those kindly gifts of nature which are not the substance of life but its luxury is unlike other toil we are inclined to fancy that it does not bend the sturdy frame and stiffen the overwrought muscles like the labor that is devoted in sad hard earnest to raise grain for sour bread certainly the sunburnt young men and dark-cheeked laughing girls who weeded the rich acres of monte beni might well enough have passed for inhabitants of an unsophisticated arcadia later in the season when the true vintage time should come and the wine of sunshine gush into the vats it was hardly too wild a dream that bacchus himself might revisit the haunts which he loved of old but alas where now would he find the faun with whom we see him consorting in so many an antique group donatello's remorseful anguish saddened this primitive and delightful life kenyon had a pain of his own moreover although not all a pain in the never quite never satisfied yearning of his heart towards hilda he was authorized to use little freedom towards that shy maiden even in his visions so that he almost reproached himself when sometimes his imagination pictured in detail the sweet years that they might spend together in a retreat like this 
it had just that rarest quality of remoteness from the actual and ordinary world a remoteness through which all delights might visit them freely sifted from all troubles which lovers so reasonably insist upon in their ideal arrangements for a happy union it is possible indeed that even donatello's grief and kenyon's pale sunless affection lent a charm to monte beni which it would not have retained amid a more abundant joyousness the sculptor strayed amid its vineyards and orchards its dells and tangled shrubberies with somewhat the sensations of an adventurer who should find his way to the site of ancient eden and behold its loveliness through the transparency of that gloom which has been brooding over those haunts of innocence ever since the fall adam saw it in a brighter sunshine but never knew the shade of pensive beauty which eden won from his expulsion it was in the decline of the afternoon that kenyon returned from his long musing ramble old tomaso between whom and himself for some time past there had been a mysterious understanding met him in the entrance hall and drew him a little aside the signorina would speak with you he whispered in the chapel asked the sculptor no in the saloon beyond it answered the butler the entrance you once saw the signorina appear through it is near the altar hidden behind the tapestry kenyon lost no time in obeying the summons End of chapter 30, volume 2, read by Lars Rolander. Volume 2, chapter 31 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2, chapter 31, The Marble Saloon. In an old Tuscan villa, a chapel ordinarily makes one among the numerous apartments. Though it often happens that the door is permanently closed, the key lost, and the place left to itself in dusty sanctity, like that chamber in man's heart where he hides his religious awe. This was very much the case with the chapel of Montebeni. One rainy day, however, in his wanderings through the great, intricate house, Kenyon had unexpectedly found his way into it, and been impressed by its solemn aspect. The arched windows, high upward in the wall, and darkened with dust and cobweb, threw down a dim light that showed the altar, with the picture of a martyrdom above, and some tall tapers ranged before it. They had apparently been lighted, and burned an hour or two, and been extinguished perhaps half a century before. The marble vase at the entrance held some hardened mud at the bottom, accruing from the dust that had settled in it during the gradual evaporation of the holy water, and a spider being an insect that delights in pointing the moral of desolation and neglect, had taken pains to weave a prodigiously thick tissue across the circular brim. An old family banner, tattered by the moths, drooped from the vaulted roof. In niches there were some medieval busts of Donatello's forgotten ancestry, and among them, it might be, the forlorn visage of that hapless knight between whom and the fountain nymph had occurred such tender love passages. Throughout all the jovial prosperity of Montebeni, this one spot within the domestic walls had kept itself silent, stern, and sad. When the individual or the family retired from song and mirth, they here sought those realities which men do not invite their festive associates to share. And here, on the occasion above referred to, the sculptor had discovered, accidentally, so far as he was concerned, though with a purpose on her part, that there was a guest under Donatello's roof whose presence the Count did not suspect. An interview had since taken place, and he was now summoned to another. He crossed the chapel, in compliance with Tommaso's instructions, and passing through the side entrance, found himself in a saloon of no great size, but more magnificent than he had supposed the villa to contain. As it was vacant, Kenyon had leisure to pace it once or twice, and examine it with a careless sort of scrutiny before any person appeared. This beautiful hall was floored with rich marbles, in artistically arranged figures and compartments. The walls, likewise, were almost entirely cased in marble of various kinds, the prevalent variety being giallo antico, 
intermixed with verd antique and other equally precious the splendor of the giallo antico however was what gave character to the saloon and the large and deep niches apparently intended for full-length statues along the walls were lined with the same costly material without visiting italy one can have no idea of the beauty and magnificence that are produced by these fittings up of polished marble without such experience indeed we do not even know what marble means in any sense save as the white limestone of which we carve our mantelpieces this rich hall of monte beni moreover was adorned at its upper end with two pillars that seemed to consist of oriental alabaster and wherever there was a space vacant of precious and variegated marble it was frescoed with ornaments and arabesque above there was a coved and vaulted ceiling glowing with pictured scenes which affected kenyon with a vague sense of splendor without his twisting his neck to gaze at them it is one of the special excellences of such a saloon of polished and richly colored marble that decay can never tarnish it until the house crumbles down upon it it shines indestructibly and with a little dusting looks just as brilliant in its three hundredth year as the day after the final slab of giallo antico was fitted into the wall to the sculptor at this first view of it it seemed a hall where the sun was magically imprisoned and must always shine he anticipated miriam's entrance arrayed in queenly robes and beaming with even more than the singular beauty that had heretofore distinguished her while this thought was passing through his mind the pillared door at the upper end of the saloon was partly opened and miriam appeared she was very pale and dressed in deep mourning as she advanced towards the sculptor the feebleness of her step was so apparent that he made haste to meet her apprehending that she might sink down on the marble floor without the instant support of his arm but with a gleam of her natural self-reliance she declined his aid and after touching her cold hand to his went and sat down on one of the cushioned divans that were ranged against the wall you are very ill miriam said kenyon much shocked at her appearance i had not thought of this no not so ill as i seem to you she answered adding despondently yet i am ill enough i believe to die unless some change speedily occurs what then is your disorder asked the sculptor and what the remedy the disorder repeated miriam there is none that i know of save too much life and strength without a purpose for one or the other it is my too redundant energy that is slowly or perhaps rapidly wearing me away because i can apply it to no use the object which i am bound to consider my only one on earth fails me utterly the sacrifice which i yearn to make of myself my hopes my everything is coldly put aside nothing is left for me but to brood 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 all day all night in unprofitable longings and repinings this is very sad miriam said kenyon ay indeed i fancy so she replied with a short unnatural laugh with all your activity of mind resumed he so fertile in plans as i have known you can you imagine no method of bringing your resources into play my mind is not active any longer answered miriam in a cold indifferent tone it deals with one thought and no more one recollection paralyzes it it is not remorse do not think it i put myself out of the question and feel neither regret nor penitence on my own behalf but what benumbs me what robs me of all power it is no secret for a woman to tell a man yet i care not though you know it is the certainty that i am and must ever be an object of horror in donatello's sight the sculptor a young man and cherishing a love which insulated him from the wild experiences which some men gather was startled to perceive how miriam's rich ill-regulated nature impelled her to fling herself conscience and all on one passion the object of which intellectually seemed far beneath her have you obtained the certainty of which you speak asked he after a pause oh by a sure token said miriam a gesture merely a shudder a cold shiver that ran through him one sunny morning when his hand happened to touch mine but it was enough i firmly believe miriam said the sculptor that he loves you still she started and a flush of color came tremulously over the paleness of her cheek yes repeated kenyon if my interest in donatello and in yourself miriam endows me with any true insight he not only loves you still but with a force and depth proportioned to the stronger grasp of his faculties in their new development do not deceive me said miriam growing pale again not for the world 
replied Kenyon. Here is what I take to be the truth. There was an interval, no doubt, when the horror of some calamity, which I need not shape out in my conjectures, threw Donatello into a stupor of misery. Connected with the first shock, there was an intolerable pain and shuddering repugnance attaching themselves to all the circumstances and surroundings of the event that so terribly affected him. Was his dearest friend involved within the horror of that moment? He would shrink from her, as he shrank most of all from himself. But as his mind roused itself, as it rose to a higher life than he had hitherto experienced, whatever had been true and permanent within him, revived by the self-same impulse, so has it been with his love. But surely, said Miriam, he knows that I am here. Why, then, except that I am odious to him, does he not bid me welcome? He is, I believe, aware of your presence here, answered the sculptor. Your song a night or two ago must have revealed it to him, and in truth I had fancied that there was already a consciousness of it in his mind. But the more passionately he longs for your society, the more religiously he deems himself bound to avoid it. The idea of a lifelong penance has taken strong possession of Donatello. He gropes blindly about him for some method of sharp self-torture, and finds, of course, no other so efficacious as this. "'But he loves me,' repeated Miriam in a low voice to herself. "'Yes, he loves me.' It was strange to observe the womanly softness that came over her as she admitted that comfort into her bosom. The cold, unnatural indifference of her manner, a kind of frozen, passionateness, which had shocked and chilled the sculptor, disappeared. She blushed and turned away her eyes, knowing that there was more surprise and joy in their dewy glances than any man save one ought to detect there. "'In other respects,' she inquired at length, "'is he much changed?' "'A wonderful process is going forward in Donatello's mind,' answered the sculptor. "'The germs of faculties that have heretofore slept are fast springing into activity. "'The world of thought is disclosing itself to his inward sight. "'He startles me at times, with his perception of deep truths, "'and quite as often it must be owned he compels me to smile "'by the intermixture of his former simplicity with a new intelligence.' but he is bewildered with the revelations that each day brings. Out of his bitter agony, a soul and intellect, I could almost say, have been inspired into him. "'Ah, I could help him here,' cried Miriam, clasping her hands. "'And how sweet a toil to bend and adapt my whole nature to do him good! To instruct, to elevate, to enrich his mind with the wealth that would flow in upon me, had I such a motive for acquiring it. Who else can perform the task? Who else has the tender sympathy which he requires?' Who else, save only me, a woman, a sharer in the same dread secret, a partaker in one identical guilt, could meet him on such terms of intimate equality as the case demands? With this object before me, I might feel a right to live. Without it, it is a shame for me to have lived so long. I fully agree with you, said Kenyon, that your true place is by his side. Surely it is, replied Miriam. If Donatello is entitled to aught on earth, it is to my complete self-sacrifice for his sake. It does not weaken his claim, methinks, that my only prospect of happiness, a fearful word, however, lies in the good that may accrue to him from our intercourse. But he rejects me. He will not listen to the whisper of his heart, telling him that she, most wretched, who beguiled him into evil, might guide him to a higher innocence than that from which he fell. How is this first great difficulty to be obviated? "'It lies at your own option, Miriam, to do away the obstacle at any moment,' remarked the sculptor. "'It is but to ascend Donatello's tower, and you will meet him there under the eye of God.' "'I dare not,' answered Miriam. "'No, I dare not.' "'Do you fear?' asked the sculptor, the dread eyewitness whom I have named. "'No, for as far as I can see into that cloudy and inscrutable thing, my heart, it has none but pure motives,' replied Miriam. "'But, my friend, you little know what a weak or what a strong creature a woman is. "'I fear not heaven in this case, at least, but, shall I confess it? "'I am greatly in dread of Donatello. "'Once he shuddered at my touch. "'If he shudder once again or frown, I die.' "'Kenyon could not but marvel at the subjection "'into which this proud and self-dependent woman "'had willfully flung herself, "'hanging her life upon the chance of an angry or favourable regard "'from a person who a little while before had seemed the plaything of a moment. But in Miriam's eyes Donatello was always thenceforth invested with the tragic dignity of their hour of crime, and furthermore the keen and deep insight with which her love endowed her 
enabled her to know him far better than he could be known by ordinary observation. Beyond all question, since she loved him so, there was a force in Donatello worthy of her respect and love. "'You see my weakness?' said Miriam, flinging out her hands, as a person does when a defect is acknowledged and beyond remedy. "'What I need now is an opportunity to show my strength.' "'It has occurred to me,' Kenyon remarked, "'that the time has come, when it may be desirable, to remove Donatello from the complete seclusion in which he buries himself. He has struggled long enough with one idea. He now needs a variety of thought, which cannot be otherwise so readily supplied to him as through the medium of a variety of scenes. His mind is awakened now. His heart, though full of pain, is no longer benumbed. They should have food and solace. If he linger here much longer, I fear that he may sink back into a lethargy. The extreme excitability which circumstances have imparted to his moral system has its dangers and its advantages, it being one of the dangers that an obdurate scar may supervene upon its very tenderness. Solitude has done what it could for him. Now for a while, let him be enticed into the outer world. "'What is your plan, then?' asked Miriam. "'Simply,' replied Kenyon, "'to persuade Donatello to be my companion in a ramble among these hills and valleys. The little adventures and vicissitudes of travel will do him infinite good. After his recent profound experience, he will recreate the world by the new eyes with which he will regard it. He will escape, I hope, out of a morbid life and find his way into a healthy one.' "'And what is to be my part in this process?' inquired Miriam, sadly, and not without jealousy. "'You are taking him from me and putting yourself, in all manner of living interests, into the place which I ought to fill.' "'It would rejoice me, Miriam, to yield the entire responsibility of this office to yourself,' answered the sculptor. "'I do not pretend to be the guide and counsellor whom Donatello needs. For to mention no other obstacle, I am a man, and between man and man there is always an insuperable gulf. They can never quite grasp each other's hands.' and therefore man never derives any intimate help, any heart sustenance, from his brother man, but from woman, his mother, his sister, or his wife. Be Donatello's friend at need, therefore, and most gladly will I resign him. It is not kind to taunt me thus, said Miriam. I have told you that I cannot do what you suggest, because I dare not. Well, then, rejoined the sculptor, see if there is any possibility of adapting yourself to my scheme. The incidents of a journey often fling people together in the oddest and therefore the most natural way. Supposing you were to find yourself on the same route, a reunion with Donatello might ensue, and Providence have a larger hand in it than either of us. It is not a hopeful plan, said Miriam, shaking her head after a moment's thought. Yet I will not reject it without a trial. Only in case it fail, here is a resolution to which I bind myself. Come what come may. You know the bronze statue of Pope Julius in the great square of Perugia? I remember standing in the shadow of that statue one sunny noontime, and being impressed by its paternal aspect, and fancying that a blessing fell upon me from its outstretched hand. Ever since I have had a superstition. You will call it foolish, but sad and ill-fated persons always dream such things. That if I waited long enough in that same spot, some good event would come to pass. Well, my friend— Precisely a fortnight after you begin your tour, unless we sooner meet, bring Donatello at noon to the base of the statue. You will find me there. Kenyon assented to the proposed arrangement, and after some conversation respecting his contemplated line of travel, prepared to take his leave. As he met Miriam's eyes in bidding farewell, he was surprised at the new tender gladness that beamed out of them, and at the appearance of health and bloom which in this little while had overspread her face. "'May I tell you, Miriam,' said he, smiling, "'that you are still as beautiful as ever?' "'You have a right to notice it,' she replied, "'for if it be so, my faded bloom has been revived by the hopes you give me. "'Do you then think me beautiful? "'I rejoice most truly. "'Beauty, if I possess it, shall be one of the instruments "'by which I will try to educate and elevate him, "'to whose good I solely dedicate myself.' "'The sculptor had nearly reached the door, "'when hearing her call him he turned back, and beheld Miriam still standing where he had left her, in the magnificent hall which seemed only a fit setting for her beauty. She beckoned him to return. "'You are a man of refined taste,' said she. "'More than that, a man of delicate sensibility. Now tell me frankly and on your honour. Have I not shocked you many times during this interview by my betrayal of woman's cause, my lack of feminine modesty, my reckless, passionate, most indecorous avowal, that I live only in the life of one?' 
who perhaps scorns and shudders at me thus adjured however difficult the point to which she brought him the sculptor was not a man to swerve aside from the simple truth miriam replied he you exaggerate the impression made upon my mind but it has been painful and somewhat of the character which you suppose i knew it said miriam mournfully and with no resentment what remains of my finer nature would have told me so even if it had not been perceptible in all your manner well my dear friend when you go back to rome tell hilda what her severity has done she was all womanhood to me and when she cast me off i had no longer any terms to keep with the reserves and decorums of my sex hilda has set me free pray tell her so from miriam and thank her i shall tell hilda nothing that will give her pain answered kenyon but miriam though i know not what passed between her and yourself i feel and let the noble frankness of your disposition forgive me if i say so i feel that she was right you have a thousand admirable qualities whatever mass of evil may have fallen into your life pardon me but your own words suggest it you are still as capable as ever of many high and heroic virtues but the white shining purity of hilda's nature is a thing apart and she is bound by the undefiled material of which god moulded her to keep that severity which i as well as you have recognized oh you are right said miriam i never questioned it though as i told you when she cast me off it severed some few remaining bonds between me and decorous womanhood but were there anything to forgive i do forgive her may you win her virgin heart for methinks there can be few men in this evil world who are not more unworthy of her than yourself End of chapter 31 of volume 2chapter thirty two of volume two of the marble fawn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by amy graymore in rustic county maine the marble fawn by nathaniel hawthorne volume two chapter thirty two scenes by the way when it came to the point of quitting the reposeful life of montebeni the sculptor was not without regrets and would willingly have dreamed a little longer of the sweet paradise on earth that hilda's presence there might make nevertheless amid all its repose he had begun to be sensible of a restless melancholy to which the cultivators of the ideal arts are more liable than sturdier men on his own part therefore in leaving donatello out of the case he would have judged it well to go he made parting visits to the legendary dell and to other delightful spots with which he had grown familiar he climbed the tower again and saw a sunset and a moonrise over the great valley he drank on the eve of his departure one flask and then another of the montebeni sunshine and stored up its flavor in his memory as the standard of what is exquisite in wine these things accomplished kenyon was ready for the journey donatello had not very easily been stirred out of the peculiar sluggishness which enthralls and bewitches melancholy people he had offered merely a passive resistance however not an active one to his friend's schemes and when the appointed hour came he yielded to the impulse which kenyon failed not to apply and was started upon the journey before he had made up his mind to undertake it they wandered forth at large like two knights errant among the valleys and the mountains and the old mountain towns of that picturesque and lovely region save to keep the appointment with miriam a fortnight thereafter in the great square of perugia there was nothing more definite in the sculptor's plan than that they should let themselves be blown hither and thither like winged seeds that bound upon each wandering breeze yet there was an idea of fatality implied in the simile of the winged seeds which did not altogether suit kenyon's fancy for if you look closely into the matter it will be seen that whatever appears most vagrant and utterly purposeless turns out in the end to have been impelled the most surely on a preordained and unswerving track chance and change love to deal with men's settled plans not with their idle vagaries if we desire unexpected and unimaginable events we should contrive an iron framework such as we fancy may compel the future to take one inevitable shape then comes in the unexpected and shatters our design in fragments 
the travellers set forth on horseback, and purposed to perform much of their aimless journeyings under the moon, and in the cool of the morning or evening twilight. The midday sun, while summer had hardly begun to trail its departing skirts over Tuscany, being still too fervid to allow of noontide exposure. For a while they wandered in that same broad valley which Kenyon had viewed with such delight from the Monte Beni Tower. The sculptor soon began to enjoy the idle activity of their new life, which the lapse of a day or two sufficed to establish as a kind of system. It is so natural for mankind to be nomadic that a very little taste of that primitive mode of existence subverts the settled habits of many preceding years. Kenyon's cares, and whatever gloomy ideas before possessed him, seemed to be left at Montebeni, and were scarcely remembered by the time that its grey tower grew undistinguishable on the brown hillside. His perceptive faculties, which had found little exercise of late amid so thoughtful a way of life, became keen and kept his eyes busy with a hundred agreeable scenes. He delighted in the picturesque bits of rustic character and manners, so little of which ever comes upon the surface of our life at home. There, for example, were the old women tending pigs or sheep by the wayside. As they followed the vagrant steps of their charge, these venerable ladies kept spinning yarn with that elsewhere forgotten contrivance, the distaff, and so wrinkled and stern-looking were they that you might have taken them for the parkai, spinning the threads of human destiny. In contrast with their great-grandmothers were the children, leading goats of shaggy beard, tied by the horns, and letting them browse on branch and shrub. It is the fashion of Italy to add the petty industry of age and childhood to the hum of human toil. To the eyes of an observer from the western world, it was a strange spectacle to see sturdy, sunburnt creatures in petticoats, but otherwise manlike, toiling side by side with male laborers in the rudest work of the fields. These sturdy women, if as such we must recognize them, wore the high-crowned, broad-brimmed hat of Tuscan straw, the customary female head apparel, and as every breeze blew back its breath of brim, the sunshine constantly added depth to the brown glow of their cheeks. The elder sisterhood, however, set off their witch-like ugliness to the worst advantage with black felt hats, bequeathed them, one would fancy, by their long-buried husbands. Another ordinary sight, as sylvan as the above, and more agreeable, was a girl bearing on her back a huge bundle of green twigs and shrubs, or grass, intermixed with scarlet poppies and blue flowers, the verdant burden being sometimes of such size as to hide the bearer's figure, and seem a self-moving mask of fragrant bloom and verdure. Oftener, however, the bundle reached only halfway down the back of the rustic nymph, leaving in sight her well-developed lower limbs, and the crooked knife hanging behind her, with which she had been reaping this strange harvest sheath. A pre-Raphaelite artist, he, for instance, who painted so marvellously a windswept heap of autumnal leaves, might find an admirable subject in one of these Tuscan girls, stepping with a free erect and graceful carriage. The miscellaneous herbage, and tangled twigs and blossoms of her bundle, crowning her head, while her ruddy, comely face looks out between the hanging side festoons like a larger flower, would give the painter boundless scope for the minute delineation which he loves. Though mixed up with what was rude and earth-like, there was still a remote, dreamlike, Arcadian charm, which is scarcely to be found in the daily toil of other lands. Among the pleasant features of the wayside were always the vines, clambering on fig trees or other sturdy trunks, they wreathed themselves in huge and rich festoons from one tree to another, suspending clusters of ripening grapes in the interval between. Under such careless mode of culture, the luxuriant vine is a lovelier spectacle than where it produces a more precious liquor, and is therefore more artificially restrained and trimmed. Nothing can be more picturesque than an old grapevine, with almost a trunk of its own, clinging fast around its supporting tree nor does the picture lack its moral. You might twist it to more than one grave purpose, as you saw how the knotted, serpentine growth imprisoned within its strong embrace the friend that had supported its tender infancy, and how, as seemingly flexible natures are prone to do, it converted the sturdier tree entirely to its own selfish ends, extending its innumerable arms on every bough, 
and permitting hardly a leaf to sprout except its own. It occurred to Kenyon that the enemies of the vine, in his native land, might here have seen an emblem of the remorseless grape, which the habit of vinous enjoyment lays upon its victim, possessing him wholly, and letting him live no life but such as it bestows. The scene was not less characteristic, when their path led the two wanderers through some small ancient town. There, besides the peculiarities of present life, they saw tokens of the life that had long ago been lived and flung aside. The little town, such as we see in our mind's eye, would have its gate and its surrounding walls, so ancient and massive that ages had not sufficed to crumble them away, but in the lofty upper portion of the gateway, still standing over the empty arch, where there was no longer a gate to shut, there would be a dovecote, and peaceful doves for the only warders. Pumpkins lay ripening in the open chambers of the structure. Then, as for the town wall on the outside, an orchard extends peacefully along its base, full not of apple trees, but of those old humorists, with gnarled trunks and twisted boughs, the olives. Houses have been built upon the ramparts, or burrowed out of their ponderous foundation. Even the grey martial towers, crowned with ruined turrets, have been converted into rustic habitations, from the windows of which hang ears of Indian corn. At a door, that has been broken through the massive stonework, where it was meant to be strongest, some contadini are winnowing grain. Small windows, too, are pierced through the whole line of ancient wall, so that it seems a row of dwellings, with one continuous front, built in a strange style of needless strength. But remnants of the old battlements and machicolations are interspersed with the homely chambers and earthen-tiled housetops, and all along its extent both grapevines and running flower shrubs are encouraged to clamber in sport over the roughness of its decay. Finally the long grass, intermixed with weeds and wild flowers, waves on the uppermost height of the shattered rampart. And it is exceedingly pleasant in the golden sunshine of the afternoon to behold the warlike precinct so friendly in its old days and so overgrown with rural peace. In its guard-rooms, its prison chambers and scooped out of its ponderous breath, there are dwellings nowadays where happy human lives are spent. Human parents and broods of children nestle in them, even as the swallows nestle in the little crevices along the broken summit of the wall. Passing through the gateway of this same little town, challenged only by those watchful sentinels, the pigeons, we find ourselves in a long narrow street, paved from side to side with flagstones in the old Roman fashion. Nothing can exceed the grim ugliness of the houses, most of which are three or four stories high, stone-built, grey, dilapidated, or half-covered with plaster and patches, and contiguous all along from end to end of the town. Nature in the shape of tree, shrub, or grassy sidewalk is as much shut out from the one street of the rustic village as from the heart of any swarming city. The dark and half-ruinous habitations, with their small windows, many of which are drearily closed with wooden shutters, are but magnified hovels, piled story upon story, and squalid with the grime that successive ages have left behind them. It would be a hideous scene to contemplate in a rainy day, or when no human life pervaded it. In the summer noon, however, it possesses vivacity enough to keep itself cheerful, for all the within doors of the village, then bubbles, over upon the flagstones, or looks out from the small windows, and from here and there a balcony. Some of the populace are at the butcher's shop, others are at the fountain, which gushes into a marble basin that resembles an antique sarcophagus. A tailor is sewing before his door with a young priest seated socially beside him. A burly friar goes by with an empty wine-barrel on his head. Children are at play. Women, at their own doorsteps, mend clothes, embroider, weave hats of Tuscan straw, or twirl the distaff. Many idlers, meanwhile, strolling from one group to another, let the warm day slide by in the sweet, interminable task of doing nothing. From all these people there comes a babblement that seems quite disproportioned to the number of tongues that make it. So many words are not uttered in a New England village throughout the year, except it be at a political canvas or town meeting as are spoken here, with no especial purpose, in a single day. Neither so many words, nor so much laughter. For people talk about nothing as if they were terribly in earnest, and make merry at nothing, 
as if it were the best of all possible jokes. In so long a time as they have existed, and within such narrow precincts, these little walled towns are brought into a closeness of society that makes them but a larger household. All the inhabitants are akin to each other, and each to all. They assemble in the street as their common saloon, and thus live and die in a familiarity of intercourse such as never can be known where a village is open at either end, and all round about, and has ample room within itself. Stuck up beside the door of one house, in this village street, is a withered bough, and on a stone seat just under the shadow of the bough sits a party of jolly drinkers, making proof of the new wine, or quaffing the old, as their often tried and comfortable friend. Kenyon draws bridle here, for the bough or bush is a symbol of the wine-shop at this day in Italy, as it was three hundred years ago in England, and calls for a goblet of the deep, mild, purple juice, well diluted with water from the fountain. The sunshine of Montebeni would be welcome now. Meanwhile Donatello has ridden onward, but alights where a shrine, with a burning lamp before it, is built into the wall of an inn-stable. He kneels and crosses himself, and mutters a brief prayer, without attracting notice from the passers-by, many of whom are parenthetically devout in a similar fashion. By this time the sculptor has drunk off his wine and water, and our two travellers resume their way, emerging from the opposite gate of the village. Before them again lies the broad valley, with a mist so thinly scattered over it as to be perceptible only in the distance, and most so in the nooks of the hills. Now that we have called it mist, it seems a mistake not rather to have called it sunshine, the glory of so much light being mingled with so little gloom in the airy material of that vapour. Be it mist or sunshine, it adds a touch of ideal beauty to the scene, almost persuading the spectator that this valley and those hills are visionary, because their visible atmosphere is so like the substance of a dream. Immediately about them, however, there were abundant tokens that the country was not really the paradise it looked to be at a casual glance. Neither the wretched cottages nor the dreary farmhouses seemed to partake of the prosperity with which so kindly a climate and so fertile a portion of Mother Earth's bosom should have filled them one and all. But possibly the peasant inhabitants do not exist in so grimy a poverty, and in homes so comfortless as a stranger with his native ideas of those matters would be likely to imagine. The Italians appear to possess none of that emulative pride which we see in our New England villages, where every householder, according to his taste and means, endeavors to make his homestead an ornament to the grassy and elm-shattered wayside. In Italy there are no neat doorsteps and thresholds, no pleasant vine-sheltered porches, none of those grass plots or smoothly shorn lawns, which hospitably invite the imagination into the sweet domestic interiors of English life. Everything, however sunny and luxuriant, may be the scene around, is especially disheartening in the immediate neighborhood of an Italian home. An artist, it is true, might often thank his stars for those old houses, so picturesquely time-stained and with the plaster falling in blotches from the ancient brickwork the prison-like iron-barred windows, and the wide-arched dismal entrance, admitting on one hand to the stable, on the other to the kitchen, might impress him as far better worth his pencil than the newly painted pine boxes, in which, if he be an American, his countrymen live and thrive. But there is reason to suspect that a people are waning to decay and ruin the moment that their life becomes fascinating, either in the poet's imagination or the painter's eye. As usual, on Italian waysides, the wanderers passed great black crosses, hung with all the instruments of the sacred agony and passion. There were the crown of thorns, the hammer and nails, the pinchers, the spear, the sponge, and perched over the hole, the cock that crowed to St. Peter's remorseful conscience. Thus, while the fertile scene showed the never-failing beneficence of the Creator towards man in his transitory state, these symbols reminded each wayfarer of the Saviour's infinitely greater love for him as an immortal spirit. Beholding these consecrated stations, the idea seemed to strike Donatello of converting the otherwise aimless journey into a penitential pilgrimage. At each of them he alighted to kneel and kiss the cross, and humbly press his forehead against its foot, and this so invariably that the sculptor soon learned to draw bridle of his own accord. 
it may be too heretic as he was that kenyon likewise put up a prayer rendered more fervent by the symbols before his eyes for the peace of his friend's conscience and the pardon of the sin that so oppressed him not only at the crosses did donatello kneel but at each of the many shrines where the blessed virgin in fresco faded with sunshine and half washed out with showers looked benignly at her worshipper or where she was represented in a wooden image or a bas relief of plaster or marble as accorded with the means of the devout person who built or restored from a medieval antiquity these places of wayside worship they were everywhere under arched niches or in little penthouses with a brick-tiled roof just large enough to shelter them or perhaps in some bit of old roman masonry the founders of which had died before the advent or in the wall of a country inn or farmhouse or at the midway point of a bridge or in the shallow cavity of a natural rock or high upward in the deep cuts of the road it appeared to the sculptor that donatello prayed the more earnestly and the more hopefully at these shrines because the mild face of the madonna promised him to intercede as a tender mother betwixt the poor culprit and the awfulness of judgment it was beautiful to observe indeed how tender was the soul of man and woman towards the virgin mother in recognition of the tenderness which as their faith taught them she immortally cherishes towards all human souls in the wire-work screen before each shrine hung offerings of roses or whatever flower was sweetest and most seasonable some already wilted and withered some fresh with that very morning's dewdrops flowers there were too that being artificial never bloomed on earth nor would ever fade the thought occurred to kenyon that flower-pots with living plants might be set within the niches or even that rose-trees and all kinds of flowering shrubs might be reared under the shrines and taught to twine and wreathe themselves around so that the virgin should dwell within a bower of verdure bloom and fragrant freshness symbolizing an homage perpetually new there are many things in the religious customs of these people that seem good many things at least that might be both good and beautiful if the soul of goodness and the sense of beauty were as much alive in the italians now as they must have been when those customs were first imagined and adopted but instead of blossoms on the shrub or freshly gathered with the dewdrops on their leaves their worship nowadays is best symbolized by the artificial flower the sculptor fancied moreover but perhaps it was his heresy that suggested the idea that it would be of happy influence to place a comfortable and shady seat beneath every wayside shrine then the wary and sun-scorched traveller while resting himself under her protecting shadow might thank the virgin for her hospitality nor perchance were he to regale himself even in such a consecrated spot with the fragrance of a pipe would it rise to heaven more offensively than the smoke of priestly incense we do ourselves wrong and too meanly estimate the holiness above us when we deem that any act or enjoyment good in itself is not good to do religiously whatever may be the inequities of the papal system it was a wise and lovely sentiment that set up the frequent shrine and cross along the roadside no wayfarer bent on whatever worldly errand can fail to be reminded at every mile or two that this is not the business which most concerns him the pleasure-seeker is silently admonished to look heavenward for a joy infinitely greater than he now possesses the wretch in temptation beholds the cross and is warned that if he yield the saviour's agony for his sake will have been endured in vain the stubborn criminal whose heart has long been like a stone feels it throb anew with dread and hope and our poor donatello as he went kneeling from shrine to cross and from cross to shrine doubtless found an efficacy and these symbols that helped him towards a higher penitence whether the young count of montebeni noticed the fact or no there was more than one incident of their journey that led kenyon to believe that they were attended or closely followed or preceded near at hand by some one who took an interest in their motions as it were the step the sweeping garment the faintly heard breath of an invisible companion was beside them as they went on their way it was like a dream that had strayed out of their slumber and was haunting them in the daytime when its shadowy substance could have neither density nor outline in the too obtrusive light after sunset it grew a little more distinct on the left of that last shrine asked the sculptor as they rode under the moon 
Did you observe the figure of a woman kneeling with her face hidden in her hands? I never looked that way, replied Donatello. I was saying my own prayer. It was some penitent, perchance. May the Blessed Virgin be the more gracious to the poor soul, because she is a woman. End of chapter 32 of volume 2《ボリューム2 Chapter 33 of the Marble Fawn。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2 Chapter 33 Pictured Windows. After wide wanderings through the valley, the two travelers directed their course towards its boundary of hills. Here, the natural scenery and men's modifications of it immediately took a different aspect from that of the fertile and smiling plain. Not unfrequently there was a convent on the hillside, or on some insulated promontory, a ruined castle, once the den of a robber chieftain, who was accustomed to dash down from his commanding height upon the road that wound below. For ages back the old fortress had been flinging down its crumbling ramparts stone by stone towards the grimy village at its foot. Their road wound onward, among the hills, which rose steep and lofty from the scanty level space that lay between them. They continually thrust their great bulks before the wayfarers, as if grimly resolute to forbid their passage, or closed abruptly behind them when they still dared to proceed. A gigantic hill would set its foot right down before them, and only at the last moment would grudgingly withdraw it, just far enough to let them creep towards another obstacle. Adown these rough heights were visible the dry tracks of many a mountain torrent that had lived a life too fierce and passionate to be a long one. Or perhaps a stream was yet hurrying shyly along the edge of a far wider bed of pebbles and shelving rock than it seemed to need, though not too wide for the swollen rage of which this shy rivulet was capable. A stone bridge bestrode it, the ponderous arches of which were upheld and rendered indestructible by the weight of the very stones that threatened to crush them down. Old Roman toil was perceptible in the foundations of that massive bridge. The first weight that it ever bore was that of an army of the Republic. Threading these defiles, they would arrive at some immemorial city, crowning the high summit of a hill with its cathedral, its many churches, and public edifices all of Gothic architecture. It was no more level ground than a single piazza in the mist. The ancient town, tumbled its crooked and narrow streets down the mountainside, through arched passages, and by steps of stone. The aspect of everything was awfully old, older indeed in its effect on the imagination than Rome itself, because history does not lay its finger on these forgotten edifices and tell us all about their origin. Etruscan princes may have dwelt in them. A thousand years, at all events, would seem but a middle age for these structures. They are built of such huge square stones that their appearance of ponderous durability distresses the beholder with the idea that they can never fall, never crumble away, never be less fit than now for human habitation. Many of them may once have been palaces, and still retain a squalid grandeur. But gazing at them, we recognize how undesirable it is to build the tabernacle of our brief lifetime out of permanent materials and with a view to their being occupied by future generations. All towns should be made capable of purification by fire, or of decay within each half-century. Otherwise they become the hereditary haunts of vermin, and noisomeness, besides standing apart from the possibility of such improvements as are constantly introduced into the rest of man's contrivances and accommodations. It is beautiful, no doubt, and exceedingly satisfactory to some of our natural instincts, to imagine our far posterity, dwelling under the same roof-tree as ourselves. Still, when people insist on building indestructible houses, they incur, or their children do, a misfortune analogous to that of the Sibyl, when she obtained the grievous boon of immortality. So we may build almost immortal habitations, it is true, but we cannot keep them from growing old, musty, unwholesome, dreary, full of death-scents, ghosts, and murder-stains. In short, such habitations as one sees everywhere in Italy be they hovels or palaces. "'You should go with me to my native country,' observed the sculptor to Donatello. "'In that fortunate land each generation has only its own sins and sorrows to bear. 
here it seems as if all the weary and dreary past were piled upon the back of the present if i were to lose my spirits in this country if i were to suffer any heavy misfortune here methinks it would be impossible to stand up against it under such adverse influences the sky itself is an old roof now answered the count and no doubt the sins of mankind have made it gloomier than it used to be oh my poor fawn thought kenyon to himself how art thou changed a city like this of which we speak seems a sort of stony growth out of the hillside or a fossilized town so ancient and strange it looks without enough of life and juiciness in it to be any longer susceptible of decay an earthquake would afford it the only chance of being ruined beyond its present ruin yet though dead to all the purposes for which we live to-day the place has its glorious recollections and not merely rude and warlike ones but those of brighter and milder triumphs the fruits of which we still enjoy italy can count several of these lifeless towns which four or five hundred years ago were each the birthplace of its own school of art nor have they yet forgotten to be proud of the dark old pictures and the faded frescoes the pristine beauty of which was a light and gladness to the world but now unless one happens to be a painter these famous works make us miserably desperate they are poor dim ghosts of what when giotto or cimabue first created them through a splendor along the stately aisles so far gone towards nothingness in our day that scarcely a hint of design or expression can glimmer through the dusk those early artists did well to paint their frescoes glowing on the church walls they might be looked upon as symbols of the living spirit that made catholicism a true religion and that glorified it as long as it retained a genuine life they filled the transepts with a radiant throng of saints and angels and threw around the high altar a faint reflection as much as mortals could see or bear of a diviner presence but now that the colors are so wretchedly bedimmed now that blotches of plastered wall dot the frescoes all over like a mean reality thrusting itself through life's brightest illusions the next best artist to cimabue or giotto or ghirlandaio or pintericchio will be he that shall reverently cover their ruined masterpieces with whitewash kenyon however being an earnest student and critic of art lingered long before these pathetic relics and donatello in his present phase of penitence thought no time spent amiss while he could be kneeling before an altar whenever they found a cathedral therefore or a gothic church the two travellers were of one mind to enter it in some of these holy edifices they saw pictures that time had not dimmed nor injured in the least though they perhaps belonged to as old a school of art as any that were perishing around them these were the painted windows and as often as he gazed at them the sculptor blessed the medieval time in its gorgeous contrivances of splendour for surely the skill of man has never accomplished nor his mind imagined any other beauty or glory worthy to be compared with these it is the special excellence of pictured glass that the light which falls merely on the outside of other pictures is here interfused throughout the work it illuminates the design and invests it with a living radiance and in requital the unfading colors transmute the common daylight into a miracle of richness and glory in its passage through the heavenly substance of the blessed and angelic shapes which throng the high arched window it is a woeful thing cried kenyon while one of these frail yet enduring and fadeless pictures threw its hues on his face and on the pavement of the church around him a sad necessity that any christian soul should pass from earth without once seeing an antique painted window with the bright italian sunshine glowing through it there is no other such true symbol of the glories of the better world where a celestial radiance will be inherent in all things and persons and render each continually transparent to the sight of all but what a horror it would be said donatello sadly if there were a soul among them through which the light could not be transfused yes and perhaps this is to be the punishment of sin replied the sculptor not that it shall be made evident to the universe which can profit nothing by such knowledge but that it shall insulate the sinner from all sweet society by rendering him impermeable to light and therefore unrecognizable in the abode of heavenly simplicity and truth then what remains for him but the dreariness of infinite and eternal solitude that would be a horrible destiny indeed said donatello his voice as he spoke the words had a hollow and dreary cadence 
as if he anticipated some such frozen solitude for himself. A figure in a dark robe was lurking in the obscurity of a side chapel close by, and made an impulsive movement forward, but hesitated as Donatello spoke again. "'But there might be a more miserable torture than to be solitary forever,' said he. "'Think of having a single companion in eternity, and instead of finding any consolation, or at all events variety of torture, to see your own weary, weary sin repeated in that inseparable soul. "'I think, my dear Count, you have never read Dante,' observed Kenyon. "'That idea is somewhat in his style, but I cannot help regretting that it came into your mind just then.' The dark-robed figure had shrunk back and was quite lost to sight among the shadows of the chapel. "'There was an English poet,' resumed Kenyon, turning again towards the window, "'who speaks of the dim religious light transmitted through painted glass. I always admired this richly descriptive phrase, but though he was once in Italy, I question whether Milton ever saw any but the dingy pictures in the dusty windows of English cathedrals, and perfectly shown by the grey English daylight. He would else have illuminated that word dim with some epithet that should not chase away the dimness, yet should make it glow like a million of rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and topazes. Is it not so with yonder window? The pictures are most brilliant in themselves, yet dim with tenderness and reverence, because God himself is shining through them. The pictures fill me with emotion, but not such as you seem to experience, said Donatello. I tremble at those awful saints, and most of all at the figure above them. He glows with divine wrath. My dear friend, said Kenyon, how strangely your eyes have transmuted the expression of the figure. It is divine love, not wrath. To my eyes, said Donatello stubbornly, it is wrath, not love. Each must interpret for himself. The friends left the church, and looking up from the exterior, at the window which they had just been contemplating within, Nothing was visible but the merest outline of dusky shapes. Neither the individual likeness of saint, angel, nor saviour, and far less the combined scheme and purport of the picture, could anywise be made out. That miracle of radiant art, thus viewed, was nothing better than an incomprehensible obscurity, without a gleam of beauty to induce the beholder to attempt unravelling it. All this, thought the sculptor, is a most forcible emblem of the different aspect of religious truth and sacred story, as viewed from the warm interior of belief, or from its cold and dreary outside. Christian faith is a grand cathedral, with divinely pictured windows. Standing without you see no glory, nor can possibly imagine any. Standing within, every ray of light reveals a harmony of unspeakable splendors. After Kenyon and Donatello emerged from the church, however, they had better opportunity for acts of charity and mercy than for religious contemplation, being immediately surrounded by a swarm of beggars, who are the present possessors of Italy, and share the spoil of the stranger, with the fleas and mosquitoes, their formidable allies. These pests, the human ones, had hunted the two travellers at every stage of their journey. From village to village, ragged boys and girls kept almost under the horses' feet. Hoary grandsires and granddames caught glimpses of their approach, and hobbled to intercept them at some point of vantage. Blind men stared them out of countenance with their slightless orbs, Women held up their unwashed babies. Cripples displayed their wooden legs, their grievous scars, their dangling, boneless arms, their broken backs, their burden of a hump, or whatever infirmity or deformity Providence had assigned them for an inheritance. On the highest mountain summit, in the most shadowy ravine, there was a beggar waiting for them. In one small village, Kenyon had the curiosity to count merely how many children were crying, whining, and bellowing all at once for alms. They proved to be more than forty, of as ragged and dirty little imps as any in the world, besides whom all the wrinkled matrons and most of the village maids, and not a few stalwart men, held out their hands grimly, piteously, or smiling in the forlorn hope of whatever trifle of coin might remain in pockets already so fearfully taxed. Had they been permitted, they would gladly have knelt down and worshipped the travellers, and have cursed them without rising from their knees if the expected boon failed to be awarded. Yet they were not so miserably poor, but that the grown people kept houses over their heads. In the way of food, they had, at least, vegetables in their little gardens, pigs and chickens to kill, eggs to fry into omelettes with oil, wine to drink, and many other things to make life comfortable. As for the children, when no more small coin appeared to be forthcoming, they began to laugh and play and turn heels over head. 
showing themselves jolly and vivacious brats, and evidently as well fed as needs be. The truth is, the Italian peasantry look upon strangers as the almoners of providence, and therefore feel no more shame in asking and receiving alms than in availing themselves of providential bounties in whatever other form. In accordance with his nature, Donatello was always exceedingly charitable to these ragged battalions, and appeared to derive a certain consolation from the prayers which many of them put up in his behalf. In Italy a copper coin of minute value will often make all the difference between a vindictive curse, death by apoplexy being the favorite one, mumbled in an old witch's toothless jaws, and a prayer from the same lips, so earnest that it would seem to reward the charitable soul with at least a puff of grateful breath to help him heavenward. Good wishes being so cheap, though possibly not very efficacious, and anathemas so exceedingly bitter, even if the greater portion of their poison remain in the mouth that utters them, it may be wise to expend some reasonable amount in the purchase of the former. Donatello invariably did so, and as he distributed his arms under the pictured window, of which we have been speaking, no less than seven ancient women lifted their hands and besought blessings on his head. Come, said the sculptor, rejoicing at the happier expression which he saw in his friend's face. I think your steed will not stumble with you to-day. Each of these old dames looks as much like Horace's Atracura as can well be conceived. But though there are seven of them, they will make your burden on horseback lighter instead of heavier. Are we to ride far? asked the Count. A tolerable journey, betwixt now and to-morrow noon, Kenyon replied, for at that hour— I purpose to be standing by the Pope's statue in the great square of Perugia. End of chapter 33 of volume 2volume 2 chapter 34 of the marble fawn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the marble fawn by nathaniel hawthorne volume 2 chapter 34 market day in perugia perugia on its lofty hilltop was reached by the two travellers before the sun had quite kissed away the early freshness of the morning since midnight there had been a heavy rain, bringing infinite refreshment to the scene of verdure and fertility, amid which this ancient civilization stands. Insomuch that Kenyon loitered, when they came to the grey city wall, and was loath to give up the prospect of the sunny wilderness that lay below. It was as green as England, and as bright as Italy alone. There was all the wide valley, sweeping down and spreading away on all sides, from the weed-grown ramparts, and bounded afar by mountains which lay asleep in the sun, with thin mists and silvery clouds floating about their heads by way of morning dreams. "'It lacks still two hours of noon,' said the sculptor to his friend, as they stood under the arch of the gateway, waiting for their passports to be examined. "'Will you come with me to see some admirable frescoes by Perugino? There is a hall in the exchange of no great magnitude, but covered with what must have been, at the time it was painted, such magnificence and beauty as the world had not elsewhere to show. "'It depresses me to look at old frescoes,' responded the Count. "'It is a pain, yet not enough of a pain to answer as a penance. "'Will you look at some pictures by Fra Angelico in the Church of San Domenico?' asked Kenyon. "'They are full of religious sincerity. "'When one studies them faithfully, it is like holding a conversation about heavenly things "'with a tender and devout-minded man.' "'You have shown me some of Fra Angelico's pictures, I remember,' answered Donatello. "'His angels look as if they had never taken a flight out of heaven, "'and his saints seem to have been born saints, and always to have lived so. "'Young maidens, and all innocent persons, I doubt not, "'may find great delight and profit in looking at such holy pictures. "'But they are not for me. "'Your criticism, I fancy, has great moral depth,' replied Kenyon and I see in it the reason why Hilda so highly appreciates Fra Angelico's pictures. Well, we will let all such matters pass for to-day, and stroll about this fine old city till noon. They wandered to and fro accordingly, and lost themselves among the strange precipitate passages, which in Perugia are called streets. Some of them are like caverns, being arched all over and plunging down abruptly towards an unknown darkness, which, when you have fathomed its depths, admits you to a daylight that you scarcely hoped to behold again here they met shabby men and the careworn wives and mothers of the people some of whom guided children in leading strings through those dim and antique thoroughfares 
where a hundred generations had passed before the little feet of to-day began to tread them. Thence they climbed upward again, and came to the level plateau, on the summit of the hill, where are situated the grand piazza and the principal public edifices. It happened to be market-day in Perugia. The great square, therefore, presented a far more vivacious spectacle than would have been witnessed in it at any other time of the week, though not so lively as to overcome the grey solemnity of the architectural portion of the scene. In the shadow of the cathedral and other old Gothic structures, seeking shelter from the sunshine that fell across the rest of the piazza, was a crowd of people engaged as buyers or sellers in the petty traffic of a country fair. Dealers had erected booths and stalls on the pavement, and overspread them with scanty awnings, beneath which they stood, vociferously crying their merchandise, such as shoes, hats and caps, yarn stockings, cheap jewellery and cutlery, books, chiefly little volumes of a religious character, and a few French novels, toys, tinware, old iron, cloth, rosaries of beads, crucifixes, cakes, biscuits, sugar-plums, and innumerable little odds and ends, which we see no object in advertising. Baskets of grapes, figs, and pears stood on the ground, donkeys bearing panniers, stuffed out with kitchen vegetables and requiring an ample roadway, roughly shouldered aside the throng. Crowded as the square was, a juggler found room to spread out a white cloth upon the pavement, and cover it with cups, plates, balls, cards, the whole material of his magic, in short. Wherewith he proceeded to work miracles under the noonday sun. An organ-grinder, at one point, and a clarion, and a flute at another, accomplished what they could towards filling the wide space with tuneful noise. Their small uproar, however, was nearly drowned by the multitudinous voices of the people, bargaining, quarrelling, laughing, and babbling copiously at random. For the briskness of the mountain atmosphere, or some other cause, made everybody so loquacious that more words were wasted in Perugia on this one market day than the noisiest piazza of Rome would utter in a month. Through all this petty tumult, which kept beguiling one's eyes and upper strata of thought, it was delightful to catch glimpses of the grand old architecture that stood around the square. The life of the flitting moment, existing in the antique shell of an age gone by, has a fascination which we do not find in either the past or present taken by themselves. It might seem irreverent to make the grey cathedral and the tall, time-worn palaces echo back the exuberant vociferation of the market. But they did so, and caused the sound to assume a kind of poetic rhythm, and themselves looked only the more majestic for their condescension. On one side there was an immense edifice devoted to public purposes, with an antique gallery, and a range of arched and stone-mullioned windows running along its front, and by way of entrance it had a central Gothic arch, elaborately wreathed around with sculptured semicircles, within which the spectator was aware of a stately and impressive gloom. Though merely the municipal council-house in exchange of a decayed country town, this structure was worthy to have held in one portion of it the Parliament Hall of a nation, and in the other the state apartments of its ruler, on another side of the square rose the medieval front of the cathedral, where the imagination of a Gothic architect had long ago flowered out indestructibly, in the first place a grand design, and then covering it with such abundant detail of ornament that the magnitude of the work seemed less a miracle than its minuteness. You would suppose that he must have softened the stone into wax until his most delicate fancies were modelled in the pliant material, and then had hardened it into stone again. The whole was a vast black-letter page of the richest and quaintest poetry, and fit keeping with all this old magnificence was a great marble fountain, where again the Gothic imagination showed its overflow and gratuity of device in the manifold sculptures which it lavished as freely as the water did its shifting shapes. Besides the two venerable structures which we have described, there were lofty palaces, perhaps of as old a date, rising story above story, and adorned with balconies, whence hundreds of years ago the princely occupants had been accustomed to gaze down at the sports, business, and popular assemblages of the piazza. And beyond all question, they thus witnessed the erection of a bronze statue, which three centuries since was placed on the pedestal that it still occupies. "'I never come to Perugia,' said Kenyon, 
without spending as much time as I can spare in studying yonder statue of Pope Julius the Third. Those sculptors of the Middle Age have fitter lessons for the professors of my art than we can find in the Grecian masterpieces. They belong to our Christian civilization, and being earnest works, they always express something which we do not get from the antique. Will you look at it? Willingly, replied the Count, for I see, even so far off, that the statue is bestowing a benediction, and there is a feeling in my heart that I may be permitted to share it. Remembering the similar idea which Miriam a short time before had expressed, the sculptor smiled hopefully at the coincidence. They made their way through the throng of the marketplace, and approached close to the iron railing that protected the pedestal of the statue. It was the figure of a pope, arrayed in his pontifical robes and crowned with a tiara. He sat in a bronze chair, elevated high above the pavement, and seemed to take kindly yet authoritative cognizance of the busy scene which was at that moment passing before his eye. His right hand was raised and spread abroad, as if in the act of shedding forth a benediction, which every man, so broad, so wise, and so serenely affectionate, was the bronze pope's regard, might hope to feel quietly descending upon the need or the distress that he had closest at his heart. The statue had life and observation in it, as well as patriarchal majesty. An imaginative spectator could not but be impressed with the idea that this benignly awful representative of divine and human authority might rise from his brazen chair, should any great public exigency demand his interposition, and encourage or restrain the people by his gesture, or even by prophetic utterances worthy of so grand a presence. And in the long calm intervals, amid the quiet lapse of ages, the pontiff watched the daily turmoil around his seat, listening with majestic patience to the market cries and all the petty uproar that awoke the echoes of the stately old piazza. He was the enduring friend of these men, and of their forefathers and children, the familiar face of generations. The Pope's blessing, methinks, has fallen upon you, observed the sculptor, looking at his friend. In truth, Donatello's countenance indicated a healthier spirit than while he was brooding in his melancholy tower. The change of scene, the breaking up of custom, the fresh flow of incidents, the sense of being homeless and therefore free, had done something for our poor fawn. These circumstances had at least promoted a reaction, which might else have been slower in its progress. Then, no doubt, the bright day, the gay spectacle of the marketplace, and the sympathetic exhilaration of so many people's cheerfulness, had each their suitable effect on a temper naturally prone to be glad. Perhaps, too, he was magnetically conscious of a presence that formerly sufficed to make him happy. Be the cause what it might, Donatello's eyes shone with a serene and hopeful expression, while looking upward at the bronze pope, to whose widely diffused blessing, it may be, he attributed all this good influence. "'Yes, my dear friend,' said he, in reply to the sculptor's remark, "'I feel the blessing upon my spirit.' "'It is wonderful,' said Kenyon, with a smile, "'wonderful and delightful to think how long a good man's beneficence may be potent, even after his death.' How great, then, must have been the efficacy of this excellent pontiff's blessing while he was alive! I have heard, remarked the Count, that there was a brazen image set up in the wilderness, the sight of which healed the Israelites of their poisonous and rankling wounds. If it be the Blessed Virgin's pleasure, why should not this holy image before us do me equal good? A wound has long been rankling in my soul and filling it with poison. I did wrong to smile, answered Kenyon. It is not for me to limit providence in its operations on man's spirit. While they stood talking, the clock in the neighboring cathedral told the hour, with twelve reverberating strokes, which it flung down upon the crowded marketplace, as if warning one and all to take advantage of the bronze pontiff's benediction, or of heaven's blessing, however proffered, before the opportunity were lost. High noon, said the sculptor, it is Miriam's hour. End of chapter 34 of Volume 2. Chapter 35 of Volume 2 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2. Chapter 35. The Bronze Pontiff's Benediction. 
When the last of the twelve strokes had fallen from the cathedral clock, Kenyon threw his eyes over the busy scene of the marketplace, expecting to discern Miriam somewhere in the crowd. He looked next towards the cathedral itself, where it was reasonable to imagine that she might have taken shelter while awaiting her appointed time. Seeing no trace of her, in either direction, his eyes came back from their quest somewhat disappointed, and rested on a figure which was leaning, like Donatello and himself, on the iron balustrade that surrounded the statue. Only a moment before, they too had been alone. It was the figure of a woman, with her head bowed on her hands, as if she deeply felt what we have been endeavouring to convey into our feeble description, the benign and awe-inspiring influence which the pontiff's statue exercises upon a sensitive spectator. No matter, though it were modelled for a Catholic chief priest, the desolate heart, whatever be its religion, recognises in that image the likeness of a father. "'Miriam,' said the sculptor, with a tremor in his voice, "'is it yourself?' "'It is I,' she replied. "'I am faithful to my engagement, though with many fears.' She lifted her head and revealed to Kenyon, revealed to Donatello likewise, the well-remembered features of Miriam. They were pale and worn, but distinguished even now, though less gorgeously, by a beauty that might be imagined bright enough to glimmer with its own light in a dim cathedral aisle, and had no need to shrink from the severer test of the midday sun. But she seemed tremulous and hardly able to go through with a scene which at a distance she had found courage to undertake. "'You are most welcome, Miriam,' said the sculptor, seeking to afford her the encouragement which he saw she so greatly required. "'I have a hopeful trust that the result of this interview will be propitious. Come, let me lead you to Donatello.' "'No, can you no,' whispered Miriam, shrinking back. "'Unless of his own accord he speaks my name, unless he bids me stay.' No word shall ever pass between him and me. It is not that I take upon me to be proud at this late hour. Among other feminine qualities, I threw away my pride when Hilda cast me off. If not pride, what else restrains you? Kenyon asked, a little angry at her unseasonable scruples, and also at this half-complaining reference to Hilda's just severity. After daring so much, it is no time for fear. If we let him part from you without a word— your opportunity of doing him inestimable good is lost forever. True, it will be lost forever, repeated Miriam sadly. But, dear friend, will it be my fault? I willingly fling my woman's pride at his feet. But do you not see? His heart must be left freely to its own decision whether to recognize me, because on his voluntary choice depends the whole question whether my devotion will do him good or harm. Except he feel an infinite need of me, I am a burden and fatal obstruction to him. Take your own course, then, Miriam, said Kenyon, and doubtless the crisis being what it is, your spirit is better instructed for its emergencies than mine. While the foregoing words passed between them, they had withdrawn a little from the immediate vicinity of the statue, so as to be out of Donatello's hearing. Still, however, they were beneath the pontiff's outstretched hand, and Miriam, with her beauty and her sorrow, looked up into his benignant face, as if she had come thither for his pardon and paternal affection, and despaired of so vast a boon. Meanwhile she had not stood thus long in the public square of Perugia, without attracting the observation of many eyes. With their quick sense of beauty these Italians had recognized her loveliness, and spared not to take their fill of gazing at it. Though their native gentleness and courtesy made their homage far less obtrusive, than that of Germans, French, or Anglo-Saxons might have been. It is not improbable that Miriam had planned this momentous interview, on so public a spot and at high noon, with an eye to the sort of protection that would be thrown over it, by a multitude of eyewitnesses. In circumstances of profound feeling and passion, there is often a sense that too great a seclusion cannot be endured. There is an infinite dread of being quite alone with the object of our deepest interest. The species of solitude that a crowd harbors within itself is felt to be preferable, in certain conditions of the heart, to the remoteness of a desert or the depths of an untrodden wood. Hatred, love, 
or whatever kind of too intense emotion, or even indifference, where emotion has once been, instinctively seeks to interpose some barrier between itself and the corresponding passion in another breast. This, we suspect, was what Miriam had thought of, in coming to the thronged piazza, partly this, and partly, as she said, her superstition that the benign statue held good influences in store. But Donatello remained leaning against the balustrade. She dared not glance towards him, to see whether he were pale and agitated, or calm as ice. Only she knew that the moments were fleetly lapsing away, and that his heart must call her soon, or the voice would never reach her. She turned quite away from him, and spoke again to the sculptor. "'I have wished to meet you,' said she, "'for more than one reason. News has come to me respecting a dear friend of ours. Nay, not of mine. I dare not call her a friend of mine, though once the dearest.' "'Do you speak of Hilda?' exclaimed Kenyon, with quick alarm. "'Has anything befallen her? When I last heard of her, she was still in Rome, and well.' "'Hilda remains in Rome,' replied Miriam. "'Nor is she ill as regards physical health, though much depressed in spirits. She lives quite alone in her dovecote. Not a friend near her, not one in Rome, which, you know, is deserted by all but its native inhabitants. I fear for her health. If she continue long in such solitude, with despondency preying on her mind. I tell you this, knowing the interest which the rare beauty of her character has awakened in you. I will go to Rome, said the sculptor, in great emotion. Hilda has never allowed me to manifest more than a friendly regard. But at least she cannot prevent my watching over her at a humble distance. I will set out this very hour. Do not leave us now, whispered Miriam, imploringly, and laying her hand on his arm. One moment more, Ah, he has no word for me. Miriam, said Donatello, though but a single word, and the first that he had spoken, its tone was a warrant of the sad and tender depth from which it came. It told Miriam things of infinite importance, and first of all, that he still loved her. The sense of their mutual crime had stunned, but not destroyed, the vitality of his affection. It was, therefore, indestructible. That tone, too, bespoke an altered and deepened character. It told of a vivified intellect, and of spiritual instruction, that had come through sorrow and remorse, so that instead of the wild boy, the thing of sportive, animal nature, the sylvan fawn, here was now the man of feeling and intelligence. She turned towards him, while his voice still reverberated in the depths of her soul. "'You have called me,' said she. "'Because my deepest heart has need of you,' he replied. Forgive me, Miriam, the coldness, the hardness with which I parted from you. I was bewildered with strange horror and gloom. Alas, and it was I that brought it on you, said she. What repentance, what self-sacrifice can atone for that infinite wrong? There was something so sacred in the innocent and joyous life which you were leading. A happy person is such an unaccustomed and holy creature in this sad world. And encountering so rare a being and gifted with the power of sympathy with his sunny life, it was my doom, mine, to bring him within the limits of sinful, sorrowful mortality. Bid me depart, Donatello, fling me off. No good through my agency can follow upon such a mighty evil. Miriam, said he, our lot lies together. Is it not so? Tell me in heaven's name, if it be otherwise. Donatello's conscience was evidently perplexed with doubt, whether the communion of a crime such as they two were jointly stained with ought not to stifle all the instinctive motions of their hearts, impelling them one towards the other. Miriam, on the other hand, remorsefully questioned with herself whether the misery already accruing from her influence should not warn her to withdraw from his path. In this momentous interview, therefore, two souls were groping for each other in the darkness of guilt and sorrow and hardly were bold enough to grasp the cold hands that they found. The sculptor stood watching the scene with earnest sympathy. "'It seems irreverent,' said he at length. "'Intrusive, if not irreverent, for a third person to thrust himself between the two solely concerned in a crisis like the present, yet possibly as a bystander, though a deeply interested one, I may discern somewhat of truth that is hidden from you both, nay, at least interpret.' or suggest some ideas which you might not so readily convey to each other. 
"Speak," said Miriam; "we confide in you." "Speak," said Donatello; "you are true and upright." "I well know," rejoined Kenyon, "that I shall not succeed in uttering the few deep words which, in this matter, as in all others, include the absolute truth. But here, Miriam, is one whom a terrible misfortune has begun to educate. It has taken him, and through your agency, out of a wild and happy state which within circumscribed limits gave him joys that he cannot elsewhere find on earth. On his behalf you have incurred a responsibility which you cannot fling aside. And here, Donatello, is one whom Providence marks out as intimately connected with your destiny. The mysterious process by which our earthly life instructs us for another state of being was begun for you by her. She has rich gifts of heart and mind, a suggestive power, a magnetic influence, a sympathetic knowledge, which wisely and religiously exercised are what your condition needs. She possesses what you require, and with utter self-devotion will use it for your good. The bond betwixt you, therefore, is a true one, and never, except by heaven's own act, should be rent asunder. Ah, he has spoken the truth, cried Donatello, grasping Miriam's hand. The very truth, dear friend, cried Miriam. But take heed, resumed the sculptor, anxious not to violate the integrity of his own conscience. Take heed, for you love one another, and yet your bond is twined with such black threads that you must never look upon it as identical with the ties that unite other loving souls. It is for mutual support. It is for one another's final good. It is for effort, for sacrifice, but not for earthly happiness. If such be your motive, believe me, friends, it were better to relinquish each other's hands at this sad moment. There would be no holy sanction on your wedded life. None, said Donatello, shuddering. We know it well. None, repeated Miriam, also shuddering. United, miserably entangled with me, rather. By a bond of guilt, our union might be for eternity indeed and most intimate, but through all that endless duration I should be conscious of his horror. Not for earthly bliss, therefore, said Kenyon, but for mutual elevation and encouragement towards a severe and painful life, you take each other's hands. And if out of toil, sacrifice, prayer, penitence, and earnest effort towards right things, there comes at length a somber and thoughtful happiness, taste it, and thank heaven. So that you will live not for it, so that it be a wayside flower springing along a path that leads to higher ends, it will be heaven's gracious gift and a token that it recognizes your union here below. "'Have you no more to say?' asked Miriam earnestly. "'There is matter of sorrow and lofty consolation strangely mingled in your words.' "'Only this, dear Miriam,' said the sculptor. "'If ever in your lives the highest duty should require from either of you the sacrifice of the other, meet the occasion without shrinking. This is all.' While Kenyon spoke, Donatello had evidently taken in the ideas which he propounded, and had ennobled them by the sincerity of his reception. His aspect, unconsciously, assumed a dignity, which, elevating his former beauty, accorded with the change that had long been taking place in his interior self. He was a man revolving grave and deep thoughts in his breast. He still held Miriam's hand, and there they stood, the beautiful man, the beautiful woman, united for ever as they felt in the presence of these thousand eyewitnesses who gazed so curiously at the unintelligible scene doubtless the crowd recognized them as lovers and fancied this a betrothal that was destined to result in lifelong happiness and possibly it might be so who can tell where happiness may come or where though an expected guest it may never show its face perhaps shy subtle thing it had crept into this sad marriage bond when the partners would have trembled at its presence as a crime. Farewell, said Kenyon. I go to Rome. Farewell, true friend, said Miriam. Farewell, said Donatello, too. May you be happy. You have no guilt to make you shrink from happiness. At this moment it so chanced that all the three friends, by one impulse, glanced upward at the statue of Pope Julius, and there was the majestic figure stretching out the hand of benediction over them, and bending down upon this guilty and repentant pair its visage of grand benignity. There is a singular effect oftentimes when out of the mist of engrossing thought and deep absorption 
we suddenly look up and catch a glimpse of external objects. We seem at such moments to look farther and deeper into them than by any premeditated observation. It is as if they met our eyes, alive, and with all their hidden meaning on the surface, but grew again inanimate and inscrutable the instant that they became aware of our glances. So now, at that unexpected glimpse, Miriam, Donatello, and the sculptor, all three imagined that they beheld the bronze pontiff endowed with spiritual life. A blessing was felt descending upon them from his outstretched hand. He approved by look and gesture the pledge of a deep union that had passed under his auspices. End of chapter 35 of volume 2《Volume Two, Chapter Thirty Six of the Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume Two, Chapter Thirty Six, Hilda's Tower. When we have once known Rome, and left her where she lies, like a long decaying corpse, retaining a trace of the noble shape it was but with accumulated dust and a fungus growth overspreading all its more admirable features. Left her in utter weariness, no doubt, of her narrow, crooked, intricate streets, so uncomfortably paved with little squares of lava that to tread over them is a penitential pilgrimage, so indescribably ugly, moreover, so cold, so alley-like, into which the sun never falls, and where a chill wind forces its deadly breath into our lungs left her, tired of the sight of those immense seven-storied, yellow-washed hovels, or call them palaces, where all that is dreary in domestic life seems magnified and multiplied, and weary of climbing those staircases, which ascend from a ground floor of cook-shops, cobblers' stalls, stables, and regiments of cavalry, to a middle region of princes, cardinals, and ambassadors, and an upper tier of artists, just beneath the unattainable sky, left her, worn out with shivering at the cheerless and smoky fireside by day, and feasting with our own substance the ravenous little populace of a Roman bed at night, left her, sick at heart, of Italian trickery, which has uprooted whatever faith in man's integrity had endured till now, and sick at stomach of sour bread, sour wine, rancid butter, and bad cookery, needlessly bestowed on evil meats, left her, disgusted with the pretense of holiness and the reality of nastiness, each equally omnipresent, left her, half lifeless from the languid atmosphere, the vital principle of which has been used up long ago, or corrupted by myriads of slaughters, left her, crushed down in spirit with the desolation of her ruin and the hopelessness of her future, left her, in short, hating her with all our might, and adding our individual curse to the infinite anathema which her old crimes have unmistakably brought down. When we have left Rome in such mood as this, we are astonished by the discovery, by and by, that our heart-strings have mysteriously attached themselves to the eternal city, and are drawing us thitherward again, as if it were more familiar, more intimately our home, than even the spot where we were born. It is with a kindred sentiment that we now follow the course of our story, back through the Flaminian Gate, and treading our way to the Via Portuguese, climb the staircase to the upper chamber of the tower where we last saw Hilda. Hilda all along intended to pass the summer in Rome, for she had laid out many high and delightful tasks, which she could the better complete, while her favorite haunts were deserted by the multitude that thronged them throughout the winter and early spring. Nor did she dread the summer atmosphere, although generally held to be so pestilential. She had already made trial of it two years before, and found no worse effect than a kind of dreamy languor, which was dissipated by the first cool breezes that came with autumn. The thickly populated centre of the city, indeed, is never affected by the feverish influence that lies in wait in the Campagna, like a besieging foe, and nightly haunts those beautiful lawns and woodlands around the suburban villas, just at the season when they most resemble paradise." What the flaming sword was to the first Eden, such is the malaria to these sweet gardens and groves. We may wander through them. Of an afternoon, it is true, 
but they cannot be made a home and a reality, and to sleep among them is death. They are but illusions, therefore, like the show of gleaming waters and shadowy foliage in a desert. But Rome, within the walls, at this dreaded season, enjoys its festal days, and makes itself merry, with characteristic and hereditary pastimes, for which its broad piazzas afford abundant room. It leads its own life with a freer spirit, now that the artists and foreign visitors are scattered abroad. No bloom, perhaps, would be visible in a cheek that should be unvisited throughout the summer by more invigorating winds than any within fifty miles of the city. No bloom, but yet, if the mind kept its healthy energy, a subdued and colorless well-being. There was, consequently, little risk in Hilda's purpose to pass the summer days in the galleries of Roman palaces, and her nights in that aerial chamber, whither the heavy breath of the city and its suburbs could not aspire. It would probably harm her no more than it did the white doves, who sought the same high atmosphere at sunset, and when morning came, flew down into the narrow streets, about their daily business, as Hilda likewise did. With the Virgin's aid and blessing, which might be hoped for even by a heretic, who so religiously lit the lamp before her shrine, the New England girl would sleep securely in her old Roman tower, and go forth on her pictorial pilgrimages without dread or peril. In view of such a summer, Hilda had anticipated many months of lonely but unalloyed enjoyment. Not that she had a churlish disinclination to society, or needed to be told that we taste one intellectual pleasure twice, and with double the result when we taste it with a friend. But keeping a maiden heart within her bosom, she rejoiced in the freedom that enabled her still to choose her own sphere, and dwell in it, if she pleased, without another inmate. Her expectation, however, of a delightful summer was woefully disappointed. Even had she formed no previous plan of remaining there, it is improbable that Hilda would have gathered energy to stir from Rome. A torpor, heretofore unknown to her vivacious though quiet temperament, had possessed itself of the poor girl, like a half-dead serpent, knotting its cold, inextricable wreaths about her limbs. It was that peculiar despair, that chill and heavy misery, which only the innocent can experience, although it possesses many of the gloomy characteristics that mark a sense of guilt. It was that heart-sickness, which it is to be hoped we may all of us have been pure enough to feel once in our lives, but the capacity for which is usually exhausted early, and perhaps with a single agony. It was that dismal certainty of the existence of evil in the world, which, though we may fancy ourselves fully assured of the sad mystery long before, never becomes a portion of our practical belief until it takes substance in reality from the sin of some guide, whom we have deeply trusted and revered, or some friend whom we have dearly loved. When that knowledge comes, it is as if a cloud had suddenly gathered over the morning light, so dark a cloud, that there seems to be no longer any sunshine, behind it or above it. The character of our individual beloved one, having invested itself with all the attributes of right, that one friend being to us the symbol and representative of whatever is good and true, when he falls, the effect is almost as if the sky fell with him, bringing down in chaotic ruin the columns that upheld our faith. We struggle forth again, no doubt, bruised and bewildered. We stare wildly about us and discover, or it may be we never make the discovery, that it was not actually the sky that has tumbled down, but merely a frail structure of our own rearing, which never rose higher than the housetops, and has fallen because we founded it on nothing." but the crash and the affright and trouble are as overwhelming for the time, as if the catastrophe involved the whole moral world. Remembering these things, let them suggest one generous motive for walking heedfully amid the defilement of earthly ways. Let us reflect that the highest path is pointed out by the pure ideal of those who look up to us, and who, if we tread less loftily, may never look so high again. Hilda's situation was made infinitely more wretched by the necessity of confining all her trouble within her own consciousness. To this innocent girl, holding the knowledge of Miriam's crime within her tender and delicate soul, the effect was almost the same as if she herself had participated in the guilt. Indeed, partaking the human nature of those who could perpetrate such deeds, she felt her own spotlessness impugned. 
had there been but a single friend, or not a friend, since friends were no longer to be confided in, after Miriam had betrayed her trust, but had there been any calm, wise mind, any sympathizing intelligence, or if not these, any dull, half-listening ear, into which she might have flung the dreadful secret, as into an echoless cavern, what a relief would have ensued. But this awful loneliness, it enveloped her whithersoever she went. It was a shadow in the sunshine of festal days, a mist between her eyes and the pictures at which she strove to look, a chill dungeon which kept her in its grey twilight and fed her with its unwholesome air, fit only for a criminal to breathe and pine in. She could not escape from it. In the effort to do so, straying farther into the intricate passages of our nature, she stumbled ever and again over this deadly idea of mortal guilt. Poor sufferer for another's sin! Poor wellspring of a virgin's heart, into which a murdered corpse had casually fallen, and whence it could not be drawn forth again, but lay there, day after day, night after night, tainting its sweet atmosphere with the scent of crime and ugly death. The strange sorrow that had befallen Hilda did not fail to impress its mysterious seal upon her face, and to make itself perceptible to sensitive observers in her manner and carriage. A young Italian artist, who frequented the same galleries which Hilda haunted, grew deeply interested in her expression. One day, while she stood before Leonardo da Vinci's picture of Joanna of Aragon, but evidently without seeing it, for though it had attracted her eyes, a fancied resemblance to Miriam had immediately drawn away her thoughts. This artist drew a hasty sketch, which he afterwards elaborated into a finished portrait. It represented Hilda as gazing with sad and earnest horror at a blood-spot which she seemed just then to have discovered on her white robe. The picture attracted considerable notice. Copies of an engraving from it may still be found in the print-shops along the Corso. By many connoisseurs, the idea of the face was supposed to have been suggested by the portrait of Beatrice Cenci, and in fact there was a look somewhat similar to poor Beatrice's forlorn gaze out of the dreary isolation and remoteness in which a terrible doom had involved a tender soul. But the modern artist strenuously upheld the originality of his own picture, as well as the stainless purity of its subject, and chose to call it, and was laughed at for his pains, innocence dying of a blood-stain. "'Your picture, Signore Panini, does you credit,' remarked the picture-dealer, who had bought it of the young man for fifteen scudi, and afterwards sold it for ten times the sum. "'But it would be worth a better price if you had given it a more intelligible title. Looking at the face and expression of this fair signorina, we seem to comprehend readily enough that she is undergoing one or another of those troubles of the heart to which young ladies are but too liable.' But what is this blood-stain? And what has innocence to do with it? Has she stabbed her perfidious lover with a bodkin? She, she committed a crime, cried the young artist. Can you look at the innocent anguish in her face and ask that question? No, but as I read the mystery, a man has been slain in her presence, and the blood, spurting accidentally on her white robe, has made a stain which eats into her life. Then in the name of her patron saint, exclaimed the picture-dealer, why don't she get the robe made white again at the expense of a few biochi to her washerwoman? No, no, my dear Panini. The picture being now my property, I shall call it the Signorina's Vengeance. She has stabbed her lover overnight, and is repenting it betimes the next morning. So interpreted, the picture becomes an intelligible and very natural representation of a not uncommon fact. Thus coarsely does the world translate all finer griefs that meet its eye. It is more a coarse world than an unkind one. But Hilda sought nothing either from the world's delicacy or its pity, and never dreamed of its misinterpretations. Her doves often flew in through the windows of the tower, winged messengers, bringing her what sympathy they could, and uttering soft, tender, and complaining sounds deep in their bosoms, which soothed the girl more than a distincter utterance might. And sometimes Hilda moaned quietly among the doves, teaching her voice to accord with theirs, and thus finding a temporary relief from the burden of her incommunicable sorrow. As if a little portion of it, at least, had been told to these innocent friends, and been understood and pitied. When she trimmed the lamp before the virgin's shrine, Hilda gazed at the sacred image, and rude as was the workmanship, 
beheld or fancied, expressed with the quaint, powerful simplicity which sculptors sometimes had five hundred years ago, a woman's tenderness responding to her gaze. If she knelt, if she prayed, if her oppressed heart besought the sympathy of divine womanhood, afar in bliss, but not remote, because forever humanized by the memory of mortal griefs, was Hilda to be blamed? It was not a Catholic kneeling, at an idolatrous shrine, but a child lifting its tear-stained face to seek comfort from a mother. End of chapter 36 of volume 2